two, one. Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight for the July, not July 9th, 2020 Northampton School Committee. I'm Lonnie Kaufman. I'm the School Committee Vice Chair, and I'll be chairing tonight's meeting as Mayor Narkowitz is attending the City Council meeting. Uh, pursuant to Governor Baker's emergency order modifying the state's open meeting law issued on March 12th, 2020, tonight's meeting of the School Committee will be held using remote participation. I'm calling the meeting to order. Um, I would ask um, everyone to please mute your phones and Zoom audio simply by clicking on the lower on the button on the lower left corner if you're in the video and star six, I believe, would handle your mobile phones. Um, one quick announcement before we take the roll. Uh, based on feedback we've received and in following the procedures of other local committees, uh, the Zoom chat function for this meeting um, is in the process of being turned off. Um, and if um, we heard from many people that that's just inappropriate, distracting, and not uh, consistent with the rules that we've set up for school committee meetings. However, we are leaving the chat open for school committee clerk Annie Thompson and myself so we can receive messages sent via chat. But I would ask that you reserve those strictly for technical questions or issues relating to your participation. Um, I want to ask the clerk to call the roll, please. Member Busansky. Present. Member Fallon. Present. Member Seraphie Cox. Present. Member Condon. Present. Member Levy. Present. Member Kaufman? Present. Member Goldman? Present. Member Voss? Present. And Member Gold? Present. Mr. Vice Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you. Um, so first part of our agenda is public comment period. Um, if you would like to speak during public comment, please um, let us know that you would like to do so by clicking on the participants tab on the bottom of your Zoom screen, at which point you should be able to see a raise hand button on the bottom of that and just click on that and I will call on you um, in the order that Zoom tells me that you registered. Um, I will also call on people in order that they raise their hands if you're not doing this. I, I, um, we'll get to that later, but I just bear with us. I think so far the Zoom function for this is working out. So no worries, I think we have it well under control and everybody that wants to participate will. Um, I just wanted to ask from a show of hands or from your participation, um, how many folks would like to participate tonight through public session? If you can sign up now, that would be great. Okay. No problem. Um, public sessions last for three minutes. And again, I will call people um, based on the order in which they just registered. And we'll begin with Linda Dell. You have the floor, Linda. Uh, thank you. Oops. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Linda Dell. I live in Ward two, I have a student that's in the high school. Um, by training, I'm an epidemiologist and I actually want to talk about the school reopening model. And um, I'd like to discuss a population-based public health perspective on this. But first of all, I wanna really express gratitude to all of you. I'm so impressed with all the work that everyone is doing to try and get our schools reopened under the COVID the pandemic. Um, I would give you way more kudos, but I don't have time, but thank you. Um, I want to say that I, I am an epidemiologist. I have reviewed guidance from the CDC, from the American Academy of Pediatrics, from the Harvard School of Public Health on their report on risk reduction strategies for reopening schools. And I've also looked at the DESE guidance. I want to say, I want to start by saying that safe 
is subjective. I acknowledge that what I feel is safe for my family and my child may feel unnecessarily risky to one of my child's teachers or to another caregiver. My other comment about safe is that some may interpret it as that we can eliminate risk. We can't. What we can do is mitigate or reduce risk. So I'm going to try and avoid the use of the word safe. My goal here is really to provide a public health perspective. Part of this perspective is admitting that we're trading off risks. And in the case of schools reopening, we're trading off the potential harms of COVID infection with potential harms, other potential harms, specifically harms that can occur that are related to mental health, depression, substance abuse, physical or sexual abuse, food insecurity, as well as risk of learning loss. So uh, about the models for reopening, um, I see utility in each of these models during a pandemic, especially in relation to what I think of as a traffic light that describes COVID related indicators in the community. So under this model, a green light means that COVID transmission is low and the vast majority of healthy students are physically present in the school every day. And um, there may be other indicators that feed into that that we would consider from medical and health professionals. But as I said, under this green light scenario, kids are in school and they're physically present. And what does this mean? It's not business as usual. There are many administrative physical and engineering controls employed to mitigate the COVID risks. This includes physical distancing, but it's maximized to the extent feasible. This means desks are placed as far apart to get most students back in school. Yes, this means students are gonna be sitting at desks that are within the three to six feet range. Six feet's not a bright line and none of the guidance suggests that it is. Physical distancing works in conjunction with other physical engineering and administrative um, Linda, that's your uh, three minutes. Can you just uh, try and summarize quickly? And you could yeah. also take advantage of sending us the information that you wanted to via email. Yeah, okay. So summarizing quickly in a green light scenario, everyone's in school. We can do this with various risk management measures. In a yellow light scenario, we're using a hybrid model. It's deployed very um, uh, specifically and for short periods of time when we have to possibly pivot to another scenario. I'm happy to share the details. The remote learning, of course, is the red light scenario, and I will send in comments to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next is uh, Jose Adastra. Jose? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. I hope you're all in good health. Um, I come from acute poverty, um, and I'm going to speak to two things. One, uh, I'm actually one of the uh, groups that uh, everyone is advocating for right now. I was born into a drug cartel family, which all the men were in prison before I was born. And I was born into a very poor family. Now, let me tell you how COVID is impacting people from my area. I'm from Puerto Rico. Um, and the poor are really suffering. There's actually a drought. We don't even have enough water to wash our hands right now. Um, let alone soap. Um, so um, I, I think that we all know that we shouldn't be following the federal government's guidelines right now, especially because the federal government is so far away from every Ivy League and advanced institution in our state and in the world. Every advanced institution in the world has done much better than us. We are an, we are an international embarrassment. It is, it, it's an embarrassment that we're talking about letting kids back into school online right now. We're having a meeting online about letting our children come face to face. It's it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing that that that, that it's gotten this far. Let, let's not embarrass ourselves any further. I'm a father, I have two children. I would spend all my money. I would go into debt to prevent my children from meeting with other kids right now, okay? As you should be willing to do. Um, and if you can't do that, I'm sorry, it's because the country is a capitalist uh, swine. Hey, Mr. None Scott, of, I think we've reached out three minutes. None of us should be letting our kids back into school and there should certainly be no cops. Invest your money into therapy and activities outdoors, music, art, things like that. Don't let the children of the prison system be monitored by police in schools and do not let the children go back to school yet. Don't be ridiculous, okay? Don't be ridiculous. God bless you, good health to you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, next on our list is Elizabeth Skelly. Elizabeth? Hello. Hi. My name is Liz Skelly. I'm a teacher at Northampton High School, and I also have three children at Bridge Street School. So I felt compelled to speak up about what I'm needing, both as an educator and as a parent, to feel safe sending my kids back or going back as a worker. And I think the basic thing I need to understand is the criteria that are being used to determine whether or not we should be doing this or how we should be doing this. I feel really confused. I think a lot of people do. I need to understand how we figure out if it's safe in our region or our community. And I need to understand how we're figuring out if it's safe in individual school buildings and in individual hybrid models. I got a little concerned when I listened to the last school committee meeting because suddenly we were talking about expanding one of the hybrid models to get more middle and high school kids face to face time. But unless I'm misunderstanding, I thought that research that showed that kids are less likely to transmit it was specifically talking about elementary age kids. And I could be wrong on that. And this is what I'm saying, I need to understand better. The other thing I really need is some professional development if we are doing these hybrid models. I heard 20 to 30 hours to make remote learning better and I welcome professional development for that, but I really don't know how to teach without using proximity. Honestly, I use it for everything. A kid is just talking too much in class, what do you do? You go up, you stand next to them, you put your hand on their desk. It works most of the time. A kid is upset, they come in they put their head down. What do you do? You go over to them. You can crouch next to them and you whisper so that no one else can hear. I don't know how to do my job under the conditions that are required for safety in the hybrid models. And I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm saying I want a robust dialogue with my fellow educators to figure out how we do this without feeling so scared ourselves and without scaring children. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liz. Um, next up is Tadia. Martin Gonzalez. Um, hi everyone, uh, today, uh, uh, Martin Gonzalez. Today? It's fine, <laughs> um, Ward 6. Um, I am a uh, recent graduate, um, just about a month ago, of the Northampton Public Schools. Um, and I'm here to really speak on um, school resource officer. <clears throat> um, so over the course of my time at NHS, I you know, witnessed the, this insane discrepancy in discipline. And I think this was really, really highlighted um, by an experience I had um, one, of my, one of my first um, actually weeks at NHS um, when I was a freshman, when um, two white students um, got into a fist fight in one of my English classes. Now, as, <laughs> as, as they should have been treated, um, they, were, they were brought into a conversation and um, neither I believe ended up getting suspended um it was just more of a restorative restorative focus um that has not been the response that I see in the statistics for students of color um specifically black students and I think that that is so detrimental when we already see um other aspects of the school to prison pipeline in like discrepancies in who's in different classes um so I just want to speak to how um, I really see the, the position of the SRO playing into that um, because again, um, punishment is not, I, I just got out of high school. I, I know how we work. Um, punishing kids really doesn't lead them to grow. And so I don't understand why an armed individual is who um, we are sending in to further perpetuate these discrepancies. Um, so thank you and I yield my time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next up is Devin Grayson. Devin. Hello, yes, can you hear me? Yes, okay. thank you. I am Devin Grayson. I'm from Ward 5A, and uh, I'm also the parent of a very recent 2020 Northampton High School graduate. I listened to the discussion about the school resource officer at the last school committee meeting. Um, and I'm, I would like to strongly urge the school committee to pass a resolution banning the use of SROs in Northampton public schools. Our experience and observations are, um, are that the school resource officer does not make students feel safer and further that the presence of a, a police officer, particularly an armed police officer on the school grounds detracts from an environment that's conducive to learning. 
Um, I also agree with the idea that was brought up of um, supporting a repeal of the Massachusetts state law requiring SROs. And uh, further, I would encourage the school committee to um, explore robust restorative justice programs um, in the future in the Northampton public schools. Thank you. Thank you very much, Devin. Uh, next up is Annie, I think it's Selsich. Yeah. Hi, my name is Annie. I live here in Northampton. My son attends Bridge Street and I'm a member of REAL, a group of caregivers, students, teachers, and staff in NPS committed to developing an anti-racist culture in our schools. I want to comment on a topic that's on the agenda for this evening, police and schools. Before I do though, I want to thank you all profusely for the hard work that is going into figuring out what the fall will mean for all our students and teachers. And I understand that for good reason, that is priority num number one for this evening. That said, I work in social justice, specifically youth justice issues nationally. And I know how often matters relating to police in schools and race equity in schools get lost in the shuffle of daily operations. These issues have never been adequately attended to really anywhere in this country. So in a moment when there is more and more awareness or white awareness, of why these topics matter, we would be remiss to place them on the back burner. I strongly encourage the school committee to pass a resolution keeping SROs out of the schools. If Amherst can do it, and if much larger cities like Denver, Oakland, and Portland, Oregon, to name only a few, can pass such resolutions, many of which were unanimous and all of which were based on research showing the negative racial impact of police in schools, Northampton certainly can as well. We do not need, nor should we have an armed officer posted in our schools, regardless of the status of the NPD budget. However, the conversation about police in schools should extend beyond the SRO position. We need to better understand and talk about when and why police of any kind are called into our schools. According to local data, there were 259 calls to the police across all NPS schools in the last three years. Nearly half of those went to other officers only, so not an SRO. Roughly one in three calls were from the elementary schools. Two out of the 259 calls. I can just ask you to finish up, please. We appreciate it. It's only been a minute and a half, just to, to note. I have my timer going, and I noticed that for another individual. So just want to point that out. If I made a mistake, I apologize. Go ahead. I made a mistake. Take another minute and a half, please. Thank you. I appreciate it. No problem. Um, Two out of the 259 calls were marked as related to weapons and firearms. These are the what people often think of as the main reasons police are needed or called into school. And as with the national data, this shows that police are relied upon almost exclusively for other reasons, reasons that we should want to know more about. Once the reopening plan is settled, I encourage the committee to explore the data more and to reach more some clarity about one, when and why police should ever be called into schools, reserving that for the most extreme dangerous situations. Two, what is needed to better support our teachers, administrators, and school staff in tough situations. And most importantly, three, what is needed to support our staff in more our students in more developmentally appropriate ways. I truly appreciate your time. Good luck with the decision making tonight and thank you. Thank you and apologize again if I cut you off early. I'm getting used to this. <laughs> No worries. Thank it's you. not working. Okay, thank you again. Uh, Camille Kamek is next. Sorry if I got your hand, okay. name wrong. Hi, uh, my name is Camille Kamek. I live in Northampton and I have two black sons that both attend Northampton High School next year. And I want to speak tonight a little bit on their behalf. Lots of people have been talking about safety and about sending their children back to school in this time when we are worried about the safety from the COVID-19. Uh, COVID I want to talk about another kind of safety and that is the safety and concern I have as a parent when I send my black sons out anywhere, anytime on their own. And I want you to know that from the time they were little, uh, they've been preparing to be on their own as black men and they have to take certain kinds of precautions and engage in certain kinds of behavior that other children don't have to think about as black men in our society. I think it's particularly important that uh, the school committee is considering discontinuing police in schools. And I think this is a, a, specific, a very important issue specifically for our black children. 
Uh, there are many, many police officers in the Northampton area, and our kids encounter police officers all the time when they're in the downtown. Every time my child gets into a car to drive, he can, he's has concern about encountering police officers. I don't think it's fair that they also encounter an armed police officer in their school, a place that should be a place of safety and learning for them. And so I would hope that uh, those of you that are making this decision would think about what it would be like to be a young black man attending school in Northampton and encountering a police officer on a regular basis, regardless of who that particular police officer is. Thank you and thank you for the time you've taken to make these hard decisions this year. Thank you, Camille. Uh, next up is Kate Fontaine. Kate, are Good you evening. Back? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Kate Fontaine. I am a teacher at Northampton High School, and I am also the Unit A Chapter Coordinator for NAES. And I wanted to speak tonight about some of the discussions that are going on within our union. I want to start by saying that as a union, of course, we desperately want to be back in school with our kids. I also want to acknowledge that this is a time of tremendous uncertainty and um, people are feeling afraid and they're feeling unsure. And we all, because of this pandemic that's going on, we have all lost control over a lot of aspects of our life. And so we want, as a union want to make sure that you understand that we, we know that people want answers and we want to provide them with answers and we want to provide people with a plan. But it's important moving forward that we consider that the safety of our staff and our students and their families is incredibly important. But the other thing that is going to be incredibly important is flexibility because a pandemic is unpredictable and we are living in unprecedented times and we have to be prepared to have multiple plans that meet the needs of students, families, and staff members, and we have to be prepared for those plans to change. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next up is EJ Hodges Plant, I believe. EJ. Can you hear? We can, thank you, yeah. So I'm BJ Hodges Plant. I'm here with Mona Singler. And we, um, I have a daughter who just graduated from Northampton High School and a son that graduated last year. And Mona has a son that is in going to be a senior. And I want to speak to the SRO. And I'm not reading from a piece of paper. I'm not like reading from notes in, in a canned conversation. I'm speaking from my heart because I have complete experience with this particular um, school resource officer, Officer Wallace, and his um, comfort dog, Douglas. And I think that the anti-police rhetoric in this meeting has no place in making a decision about whether or not there should be a, a, a school resource officer. If you don't want them armed, don't arm them but you can't play both sides of the fence. You want the police, you want your kids to be safe, you want the, them to have a safe and, and, and confident learning environment, but you know what happens when there are school shootings, when there's bullying issues, when there's all kinds of, people bring all kinds of weapons. I mean, speaking that there's 250 plus calls to the school says that we need a police resource officer there with that many calls. And, you know, and, and, and just saying what Devin Grayson said, that it detracts having an officer there, detracts from the learning environment. How? He provides a safe learning environment for everybody. And we really got to distinguish between anti-police and whether we need a, a resource officer. Now, my daughter had a huge trauma this year. I um, was put on life support, wasn't expected to come off of it. And who was there for her? Officer Wallace and, and Douglas the comfort dog. He checked in on her every day. He made sure she needed what she had to get through the day. He made sure that if she needed to be out of the classroom, she had someone that could make her feel safe, make her feel like her needs were being met. And yes, my daughter also had a school um, counselor that is a completely different thing. I mean, we're talking safety here. 
this all grows out of the rise of school shootings and, and bullying. And, and so what have we done that has cured that? Nothing. So how can anybody say we don't need a, an SRO in our schools when the same things that made us put one there are still happening all over the country, all over the world? They've escalated. So I'm really at a loss to understand all these comments about this anti-police rhetoric. You don't like the police, fine, but I hope that when you need them and you call them because you know somebody is either robbing you or breaking into your house or beating you up, I hope that rhetoric isn't still there. They, oh, the police aren't good for anything. I mean, this has got to stop and we've got to focus on what the role of the, the SRO is. I don't even think half of you know what the role of a, a resource officer is. No I one... have to ask you to, to summarize, but um, are we all done? We are voting citizens and we did a petition on this and we got over 1300 signatures to keep officer wallace and douglas in the school system as an sro and i guarantee you if you cross check them those 1300 plus um signatures are all voting citizens of northampton so you really should pay attention to them thank you i need to move on but thank you for your time bj next up is suzanne strauss Suzanne, are you available? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello. Anyway, I'm just calling to weigh in on this experience of being a teacher during the COVID at Northampton High School. And, you know, I'm 29 years into teaching, and I would have to say, and I, I'm a citizen, I, I live in Florence, and I, my kids went to Northampton High School. You know, it is very, very taxing. I don't know the experience of the students. I can just say that whatever gets put in place, Kate Fontaine, I think, said it well, which is we really need to make sure people are safe, period. We can't go, we can't even trust what the federal government says anymore. The vaccines, you know, we don't know how long it's going to be. It didn't, to me, it felt like sort of holding on to people. It didn't really feel like, it didn't feel that much like teaching. When we had virtual classes. I had really good attendance on virtual classes. Getting people to do their work was a nightmare. And, um, you know, it really begs the question, what are schools for? And why are we rushing? It I know it doesn't feel like rushing, but to me, it feels like we're rushing, trying to figure out what to do for August 28th or whatever. I just don't know that we're going to really be there. It was probably the most taxing experience of my teaching career in the sense that when you got off the virtual, there was so much follow-up. If we were to have classes that were just rolling as we were, um, I think one class a day is probably almost all you can do because the follow-up, there was often I was on the phone and calling people and contacting people for you know hours, six hours after usually. The other thing that I just want to mention is I know that the there's been really a great effort to try to talk and try to get the most vulnerable first back into school. And I think that's a great idea, but I also think those people then also become the most vulnerable to, to get COVID. And I think that there's been so much now about we, the way that who's getting it and how people are being treated, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I don't know what to say. I just know it's really hard and I feel like None of the plans that were put in place seem that great. I hate remote learning, but in some ways, I feel like it's the only safe way to go at this point. So I don't have anything to offer except to say it was a really tough experience. It's exhausting for everybody who is um, offering education to students. So anyway, that's all I want to say. Okay. Thank you, Suzanne. Next up is July Seibecker. Hi there. Um, I'm July Seebecker. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. I live at 41 Indian Hill on Florence, 46. And first, I want to just briefly voice my extremely strong support that any um, in-person um, learning plan uh, goes by the CDC guidelines and does six feet of distance and not an inch less. Um, I also want to talk about support and training for remote learning, since I think we're going that way. Um, and I'm glad that there's going to be support and training for the teachers for remote learning, 
But I just want to point out that they are only one third of the remote learning team. The parents or caregivers basically had to function like paraeducators without any training or education in how to do it. And speaking personally, it was not so pretty because of that. Um, the students themselves, though, have skills in learning how to learn in a school setting, but not for remote learning. The skills I'm talking about are the kind of pre-literacy and school readiness skills that children start learning in preschool and in kindergarten and from story times in the public library. I'm speaking as a youth service librarian who runs story times like that for preschoolers to, to and up. And they start that young because there is a lot to learn to be ready to learn in a school setting. It takes a long time. It needs a lot of practice. And just about every school readiness skill that I teach would be different for a remote learning set, uh, setting. I'll, I'll give some quick examples. I teach tracking, which is how to understand and follow the flow of visual information in a book while it's being held up. If it's on a computer and it's a split screen of 50% teacher's face and 50% a close-up of a book page or illustration, it's usually using totally different synaptic pathways than watching a live person with an entire body's worth of body language hold a proportionally small object. I also teach social pragmatics, things like taking turns, how to express your thoughts and opinions, what is considered appropriate and respectful in a group setting, using body language to pick up on social cues. So, okay, so like taking turns in person, that involves physically raising your hand and making eye contact. This is really different than if raising your hand is a technical skill rather than physical, and you don't even really make eye contact because the camera's in a different place than where you're looking at on the screen. Also really different, appropriate behavior in a group setting. Oh boy, the difference between a morning uh, circle and a class discussion and that like Brady brunch, brunch grid on your laptop, it is big. We could probably all use to take Zoom courtesy 101, but here are some of the questions um, that would be different if I was teaching it. Is it okay to lie in your bed or be in your pajamas? Can you play with your pets or toys or play Minecraft on the side like my kid? Is it appropriate to change how your voice sounds or change the virtual background? Should you be writing in that chat box, chat box while other people are speaking, even though that means that you won't be paying attention? How can you possibly use body language to pick up on social cues when all you can see is someone's head in a box and maybe not even that if your kid has learned how to put up an avatar of themselves like mine did? So I hope some school time can be devoted to teaching our students how to learn remotely. And for the parents and caregivers, please, could there be like a webinar or a booklet or at least like a nice, clear, specific list from the school system on do's and don'ts for how I can assist my child in learning remotely? Thank you, and I yield the rest of my time. Thank you, Jalak. Um, next up, Timothy Sosa. Hi, um, I'm Jill Johnson, and uh, this is my husband, Tim. Um, and we recently moved to Florence, and we have an ingoing fifth grader who will be starting at Ryan Road in the fall. Um, I'll just start by saying that um, this past year, we were both teachers. Um, I taught pre-K in Vermont, and Tim taught ninth grade in Springfield, Mass. Um, and so we were working remotely from home, um, also while um, providing remote instruction for, uh, for our daughter. And um, I just want to take a moment to appreciate everything that teachers have done because it is incredibly challenging. Um, and also just take a minute to empathize with those of you who are making decisions about reopening because I would not want to be in your position. <laughs> um, I don't think there is a great answer. Um, and also, I just wanted to say that as a new parent to Northampton Public Schools, I really appreciated that um, there was the there was the parent survey online about reopening plans um, to take into consideration the needs of families. Um, that was really nice. So thank you. Um, and like I said, I don't I don't know what what the best route is here, but I do know that um, next year we will both be working in schools and. Um, we also are an immunocompromised household, and so we have some concerns that I don't think are unique to us. Um, and one, one concern is in the event of a hybrid model, um, where does that leave um, people working in the, in the education system if they are required to be at school five days a week, but their children are home um, either for a few days a week or every other week? Um, it will make it very challenging. Um, and also, um, I do worry about staff who are immunocompromised and also children who are immunocompromised. 
Um, and even if there is, if there is in-person instruction going on and there is the option to opt out, I'm concerned that um, the families that will have the ability to opt out are those who are able to work from home or have the financial security to do so. Um, and some families with immunocompromised children might have to send them to school because um, they don't, do, don't have another option. Um, and I just hope that, and I, I, I trust that all of those considerations, including the, um, the health of staff members um, have been taken into consideration. And I think one concern is that um, if the CDC does roll back some of the policies and requirements for continuing in person, I hope that Northampton would stick to the more strict policies um, to ensure the safety. Um, and that's all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Jill and Tim. Um, next up is Sherilyn Strider. Uh, hi, I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, my name is Sherilyn Strader. I use she, her pronouns, and I live in Ward 6. Um, I first want to address some comments made before me. Um, as a uh, Northampton High School uh, alum uh, who has been uh, there while uh, a school resource officer uh, was at the high school, I uh, and had a school resource officer enter my classrooms, uh, the learning community changes when the officer enters the classroom. We're no longer able to learn because the environment changes from being a room where you are there with your fellow students and your teacher to a room where there is someone there whose role is to arrest people. And that changes the way you think to a place of fear. So I strongly urge the school committee to uh, vote yes on the resolution presented tonight. Um, I um, also a comment was, what do we do about the dog? Uh, there's a school social worker who I'm sure would love to have the dog. Um, the dog was very cute and I'm sure students would love to keep it. Um, I also want to bring forward a situation that I had specifically with Officer Wallace. Um, a, about a year ago, um, I did call the police department because I heard a huge bang outside my house. A student crashed their car into uh, a tree in my yard and I feared for their lives. Um, and the officer that responded was Officer Wallace. Um, and uh, nothing was done to help the student. The student happened to be white um, and there were no resources given um, and they were just sent home with no help. Um, and I really fear that there is a big uh, difference in discipline given to white students and discipline given to students of color. And we really see it in the numbers. Um, and I just, there is no reason to have an officer in our schools because it changes everything. And it's so unfair to our students uh, because we are just enforcing the school to prison pipeline and the institution that is policing, it was brought into our country to enforce slavery and we do not need it. We do not need it. So I yield the rest of my time. Thank you, Charlene. Um, next up, we have um, Bo. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, I hope you can see my graph. I wanted to put it up here. Uh, this is the discipline data. Uh, so I invite you all to look at it in case you haven't been able to see it. Um, but my name is Bo Clark. I live in Hadley. Um, I am also a Northampton High School alumni. I graduated class of 2010. Um, I'm a caregiver for a number of kids in the Northampton public schools as well. And I plan on having kids here um, and having them in the Northampton public school system. So I'm really invested in this. Um, I am also speaking from emotion. And I would like to um, like reply to some comments from people who have spoken before me. Um, this has nothing to do with Officer Wallace. Um, Officer Wallace is no longer in the school system. This is about police in schools. This is about the SRO. Um, and data has shown clearly that SROs do not keep students safer from school shootings. Um, they do not prevent school shootings and they do not stop them from happening once they have started to occur. Um, when I was in high school, students of color were always treated and disciplined very differently than white students. Um, one time I watched a staff member chase a black student who was I think a 16 year old boy down the hallways and into a computer lab that I was in 
and aggressively slam him up against the wall and drag him out of the room. Um, I also had, I knew white students that, you know, like often were doing drugs and even like selling drugs in school. And I remember one student um, getting caught with cocaine and pills um, and that student escaped with a suspension. So I think I, I, I was hoping that it would have gotten a little bit better, but looking at the data that I have here, um, it shows that black students are disciplined at uh, about three times the rate of white students. Um, it's from Desi, it's publicly available on the internet. It says we have a lot of work to do. And I just wanna remind you all that this discipline, even though SROs are not formally or legally allowed to be involved in discipline, isn't happening in a vacuum. Um, it's not, and uh, children also can't tell the difference between uh, a police officer that's there to discipline them or one that's just there uh, to, you know, support in other ways. It, it breeds an environment of fear uh, and I know children and some families are afraid of going to school because of that. Um, so I guess I just wanna say that uh, Black Lives Matter is you know, like really big around here. I see a lot of signs. Um, Black Lives Matter has been formally asking us, one concrete ask has been to remove police officers from school. It enforces the school to prison pipeline. So as a white person, I don't think we get to have the signs in our yard and then get hung up on policy and get hung up on not having read the data enough yet ourselves when Black activists have been telling us about this for decades. Um, white supremacy is getting hung up on policy and getting hung up because you haven't seen the data and trying to figure out uh, the best oh my God. way that is amenable to you to get it done. Um, Amy says, can you come down so she can grab the book job? Okay, so that's it. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next up is Noah Cassis. Hi, um, my name is Noah Cassis. Uh, I use he, him pronouns. I am 17 years old. I am a rising senior at Northampton High School. I'm here to speak out strongly for the um, for the a permanent end to the position of SRO at the, the uh, at Northampton High School. Um, I just wanted to first of all voice my complete agreement with um, what Sharlin said, uh, which is that um, it's not it's not in any way ludicrous or unreasonable to say that having a police officer in a school changes the dynamic. Um, a police officer being in the school is, uh, you know, the only employee who's not actually of the school district, right? And so becomes this person who's from the outside and we know what police officers' jobs are. Um, and, you know, regardless of whether, what we think the role for police officers in general will be, um, like, I'm sorry, I forget whose name was just speaking, like somebody just said, um, you know, the data shows very clearly that uh, SROs do not help with, um, do not help preventing school shootings. They do not help, um, you know, with the establishment of what we want to do, which is a reformative, uh, a transformative justice system, a restorative justice system. Um, and you know, even more importantly, I want to go back to what somebody else said earlier, which is that this is all uh, quote unquote anti-police rhetoric. I want to, you know, say that I think that's really kind of belittling to the experiences of people who are who are speaking about about out about real life effects of the existence of the SRO. It's not about anti-police rhetoric. It's about how do we keep our schools healthy, safe, uh, and real communities? And how do we reimagine safety to not just be punitive, but to be really interactive? You know, like, uh, like Sherilyn said, we can have a dog in the school. It doesn't have to be attached to somebody who's working for the police department. We can have counselors. We can have people who listen to you. It doesn't have to have a gun with them. Um, and so, so yeah, I'll, I'll yield the rest of my time at that. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Noah. And um, the next person is the last person who's raised their hand. After this, I'll go to folks that are calling in uh, and not part of Zoom. And that is Ace Taylor. Good evening, my name is Ace Taylor. I live in Ward 3 of Northampton. I would like to ditto support of the resolution to ban SROs in school in the Northampton schools. Uh, I believe several very good points have been raised. This decision can't be made based on the current school resource officer. It's irresponsible to say one man has done good things for some students, therefore we should keep this position. With all the evidence of the harm that police do, and specifically this officer has done in schools, I think it is best to end the position. Uh, having a therapy dog is something that is great in high schools, and I wish I had it when I was in high school, but 
that does not require there being a police officer in schools. Thank you. Thank you, Gillian. Um, I'm sorry, thank you, Ace. We have another person that's signed up here on Zoom and that's Gillian Love. Hi, it's Gillian Love um, from Ward 4. Yep. I am speaking in support of the permanent re removal of school resource officers from Northampton Public Schools. I want to share that despite what any member of a predominantly wealthy white community believes, school resource officers or feel good name for police officers are not needed nor helpful. There's plenty of information out there that supports the fact that the presence of police in schools cause direct harm to students of color. The school to prison pipeline is something that every white person should educate themselves on. I also wanna say that um, when we give money for SROs, it means that there's less money for other resources that are needed in, in schools, such as money that could be used for counseling or any other form of strategies and support. Um, a lot of a lot of the youth uh, struggle with mental health issues, and there's a lot of support that could be used for that instead of supporting the presence of an armed police officer, or even if they aren't armed, still just the presence of a police officer who still was formed and their position came out of white supremacy. That is a history that cannot be denied, no matter how much a single white person wants to have faith in uh, the police officer as being someone who protects them. They do not serve as protectors for people of color. And I say this as a person of color who has also been assaulted and harmed by police. Um, I think many people would also understand that the way we treat others often can result in the way that they, it, it impacts the ways that they view themselves. There is a lot of information out there that supports the fact that the presence of police officers makes children feel like criminals, especially children of color who are also often targeted by, um, by the police, by the school resource officers and by the teachers and administration of the schools who then use them to enact harm and violence and suppression against their, their uh, the students of color. I also, um, want to say that I know someone else argued earlier that police officers in schools were really needed. Like what about the chance of a school shooting? So I want to bring up the, the fact that this Sandy Hook uh, school officer, officer not only failed to do his job and protect the people that he was, the children that he was supposedly there to serve and protect, children died as a result of his inaction. And not only was, not only like the police union offered so much support to him that now that, that town has to pay him for his inaction and for trauma that was caused to him. And yet there's nothing being done or there isn't anything said about the trauma of the children and what they endured. So I just wanna share like with that, that police officers aren't doing the job that's expected of them. They aren't helpful in the ways that a lot of white people think that they are. And they're just, they're simply not needed. And they're gonna cost the towns far much more money than is necessary and money that could be put into genuine supports that aren't forms of oppression. I really do wanna, and I wanna bring it back to the school to prison to pipeline because that's something that anyone here who's speaking in support of officer Wallace um, continuing to be in the school is failing to recognize that it's not about Officer Wallace as an individual. It's the fact that he is a police officer. He's a part of a system. Like I said before, Gillian, I'm going to have to ask you to finish up, please. That's really it. Uh, there's no need for police uh, officers, SROs in the public school systems. It's harmful to students of color and it's harmful to everyone. Thank you much, Gillian. Um, next up, uh, I can apologize up front. I'm not going to get this right. It looks like Esther with a hyphenated last name. Yeah, hi. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, fill me in. What's your last name? Uh, my name's Esther Dowby Valois. Okay, thank you. Um, and I graduated from Northampton High in 2019. Uh, I personally have never had a negative experience with our school resource officer, um, and I believe that's because I'm white. I am not conditioned to be scared of every cop because they could discriminate against me or even kill me. I'm not sure how many people are aware of this, but uh, a few years ago at the high school, a group of friends was punished because the administration believed they were in a gang. Uh, they believed this because the students were wearing red. That's it, they were just wearing red. 
Coincidentally, this entire friend group was made up of people of color. And this is just one experience. This is just an experience that was publicized around the school by other students who believe this was wrong. We did not see every instance of discrimination um, behind closed doors. Uh, Northampton is not immune to racist cops and racism in school. And I urge you to please permanently ban the SRO from the Northampton Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you very much, Esther. Um, okay, what we wanna do now is I just wanna ask if there's anybody that uh, else wants to speak that is not part of Zoom, I, I think just speak up and um, try to acknowledge you in order if there is anybody that's calling in via, via audio only. Okay. Well, thank you everybody. And I just wanna speak on behalf of the of all my colleagues on the school committee that we have received not only tonight, but several public sessions, as well as a whole host of emails and other forms of communication regarding all the issues that have been discussed tonight. And again, I just wanna share my appreciation for not only sharing your thoughts, but it's the respect in which people are sharing them, the depth of your thoughts and comments and your respect for people who may uh, or may not share your viewpoints. So thank you for that. And um, we're always available to be contacted outside of this particular way through our uh, respective emails. Um, next up is uh, item three on our agenda is announcements. And I'm wondering if any school committee members have any announcements to make. Okay. Um, Member Fallon. Thank you. I actually have a few. I apologize, but I, I do feel like um, they're important. Um, first, I did want to follow up. We passed a resolution last month um, at our last meeting, sorry, on um, June 29th, um, that um, it was the one related to COVID-19 expenses, to, um, asking that um, full school districts being reimbursed, reimbursed in full for any expenses that were um, incurred in order to meet the state mandates. And I just wanted to acknowledge that um, on Monday, um, Senator Comerford and Representative Dom organized with regional colleagues to send a letter in support of the resolution. Um, there were, including us, 127 school committees that had um, signed that resolution. Um, and they sent a letter um, in support of our resolution to uh, the governor, um, the secretary, uh, James Pizer, and the commissioner of education, um, and also um, CC'd the speaker of the house, the Senate president, and the ch uh, two chairs of the joint committee on education. So I do appreciate um, their advocacy. I sent them um, thank you letters, both to um, representative Sabadosa and to, um, to Senator Comerford's office um, on our behalf, thanking them for their uh, support and their advocacy. So I just wanted to let you know that that happened. Um, I also wanted to let the committee, remind the committee um, that they are required to chart the course for our new members um, and that the registration okay. is available. It's going to be offered virtually. I want to it's, back here. I know that my it's available online um, and those start July 27th. But you just um, and you I want also to wanted to remind people that um, school committee members, it's one of our responsibilities also for those of us beyond charting the course um, to do professional development ourselves. And um, since the pandemic started, I wanted to tell you that Panorama Education has been offering some pretty fantastic um, free um, professional development that school committee members and educators um, can access. I was able to take part in um, a session last uh, month that was, um, there are about 800 of us online. It's not uh, participatory really, um, but um, for a panel on com combating systemic racism and implicit bias in schools, it was uh, led by Dr. Tracy Benson, who's an academic activist and author of the book, Unconscious Bias in Schools. So if any of you have the time, you can go to panoramaed.com. Um, and the beauty of it is, is if you register for a session, even if it's a at a time when you can't attend, they'll send you the link to watch the recording whenever you do have time. So I just thought you should know that that's a great resource for us. Um, and finally, um, I don't know if this is something that everyone else has been stressed about, but I think it's really relevant for our conversation tonight about re reopening scenarios. 
um, as a member of the Massachusetts Board of Directors and a member of the Federal Relations Network. Um, I received an email today from the Chief Advocacy Officer, Chip, uh, Chip Slavin, uh, for the National School Boards Association regarding um, President Trump and Secretary DeVos's um, statements and demands that schools reopen in the fall with five time um, day a week learning. Um, they both have made statements that federal funding can be withheld from schools that don't reopen. Um, and he just wanted to reassure school districts that on its own, the administration doesn't have the power to simply cut funding designate, designated for public schools that's been appropriated by Congress. But they could theoretically try and put rules in place around some of the COVID-19 emergency funding through the CARES Act that could restrict them through an interim final rule. Um, it would most likely lead to a court challenge and obviously some pretty significant negative public reaction. Um, but he just wanted to let everyone know that the, the National School Boards Associations, their legal advocacy team is exploring all the options around the rule, potential legal challenges. They're following the situation closely. Um, putting out feelers for the potential for legislation and moves the administration may try to make on its own. Um, so I just thought that it was a little, for at least for me, that it's reassuring to know that someone is in fact on this um, and that it's not something that we should be actively fearing about, you know, being forced to reopen schools or not have access to federal funding. Thank you. Thank you much, uh, Member Fallon. Are there any other school committee members that have any announcements? Okay, um, I just want to say I'm also looking at participants and there are some community members that have their hand raised. I just want to make it clear that um, once public session is over, we have no opportunity to engage with the public, nor can we call on the public unless there's a special um, reason for doing that. Um, so if you wouldn't mind lowering your hands and please feel free to share any other thoughts or comments you have through other means. Um, moving on to Item number four on our agenda tonight is recommended actions. I'm going to turn this back over to Member Fallon and, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, um, take that back. That's just me. You're next, Member Fallon. <laughs> recommended actions, we, we I believe, um, only have one item, which is the approval of the June 2nd minutes. And um, I would ask for someone to make a motion to approve those minutes. So moved. Uh, thank you, Member Fallon. Thank Anybody you. second? Second. That was Miss uh, Member De uh, Levy, I believe. And um, any comments or discussion? Okay. Can uh, the clerk take a vote on that, please? Motion to approve the June second, twenty twenty minutes. Member Fallon. Yes. Member Seraphie Cox. Um, I saw member Levy's hand raised. Uh, I don't see that member. Sure. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, member Levy, did you have a comment before we vote? Thank you. Sorry, I hit the wrong button, so I couldn't get it up in time. Okay. Uh, I, um, it's very tiny, but my name is misspelled at the very beginning. Oh, I will fix that. <laughs> uh, with that, I vote yes. Member Condon? Yes. Member Levy? Member Kaufman? Yes. Member Goldman? Yes. Member Voss? Yes. Member Gold? Yes. And Member Busansky? Yes. The vote is nine in favor. Thank you. Okay, so moving along, we're now on item five, which is reports and recommendations. And we will begin with some updates, discussions and votes from the rules and policy subcommittee. So I'm happy to turn this uh, over to member Fallon. You have the floor. Thank you. Um, so the rules and policy subcommittee has met at least twice since um, we last reported. Um, just to let you know, we will, um, we've decided not to meet over the summer. Um, we're going to give the school committee clerk the chance to um, get the policies that we have passed with second readings updated online while we all um, 
have decided the best way for us to approach our work is you've referred to us, I don't know how many months ago, all of section A and all of section B, I'll be sending out um, a division of section A and everybody's gonna work on individual policies and then we'll come back together um, in September to um, start addressing those. We also agreed to um, each be spending our summer investigating um, equity and anti-racism policies to bring back with us uh, when we meet again. And um, the student handbook, which was referred to us at the meeting on May 14th, 2020, um, I actually had prepared a lot of that in advance um, because it had been mentioned at a prior meeting as being something that the committee desired um, us to begin work on. And so I contacted the Chelmsford School Committee and they gave us their blessing to use their um, handbook as sort of a starting point. And I was able to get that um, largely adapted uh, for our use in time for the rules and policies subcommittee on subcommittee meeting on May 18th. Um, and we have only gotten to take a cursory look at it. And that's um, the third thing that the committee will be working on individually um, over the summer. Um, so that when we come back um, to meet again, we'll be able to start really going through all the recommended changes that we'd like to see in that. Um, we've essentially flagged policies that are mentioned in the handbook to make sure that they can be updated continually. Um, and we're gonna try and make it a little bit more readable. Um, so that's where we are as far as a report. Um, the subcommittee had also um, in January been referred to the question of whether uh, a student liaison position um, was something that um, we should create. Um, I met with um, the student union initially in February to just um, talk to them about what was being proposed um, and answer any questions they had. And then um, uh, student union representative um, Eleanor Hardin um, met with the student, student union in February to discuss the suggestion. Um, and they decided that while they appreciated the offer of the liaison, um, they would prefer to participate with the school committee in a different way. Um, that the school committee policy does allow for student participation in all committee meetings. Um, so theoretically, we could have students sit on uh, subcommittees as well. Um, and so they would, um, they asked that we would um, allow them to be able to participate by students having uh, students attending subcommittee meetings rather than having information filtered to them through one school committee member. Um, so we agreed at the subcommittee meeting, they attended our subcommittee meeting uh, when we had this discussion. Um, we agreed that we would recommend that the chair of each subcommittee uh, reach out to the student union to let them know when the meetings are taking place and to make sure the link to the Zoom meeting for each subcommittee meeting was posted with the meeting um, posting on the Northampton Public School website. Um, and so we as a subcommittee voted um, to decline to create a school committee liaison position to the school committee um, and that passed unanimously. Um, Sorry, I Member Fallon, I see some hands up. Can we, can we, um, can I call on folks now to address what you've discussed so far? Just so sure. we can. Okay, thank you. Um, member Serafie Cox. Yes, I just wanted uh, to clarify that uh, I believe Member Fallon was referring to the school committee handbook, not the student handbook, that we will be looking at the school committee handbook, not the student handbook. I'm sorry, did I misspeak? No. Yeah. Minor detail. <laughs> <laughs> no, kind of an important one. Thank you so much. And um, Member Buzanski. There we go. I'm unmuted. Um, just on the having a student union participation on the subcommittees, I think that's a great idea. I'm just wondering if there's kind of one general email they have or a contact that Annie might be able to just include when she's sending out subcommittee um, dates and Zoom information and all that, rather than having each chair figure out who to invite or something of that. That's all. Yeah, I think that that's actually um, what they had hoped for. We didn't iron out the details because I think it'll be some new leadership for the student union, obviously. Um, 
but their hope was that this would actually be the opportunity for a lot of their newer members to engage so it might not be the same student at every meeting. Um, they just wanted to have someone sort of alert them when meetings were happening. So if there was something that was of interest to them, they would know to show up um, at the subcommittee, subcommittee meeting before it came to the level of the school committee so they could be more involved before it came for a vote. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, I don't see any other hands up. I just want to call on myself here. Um, I, I, since I brought up the idea to have a have a um, school committee liaison to the students, I know I didn't bring it up regarding having the students having a liaison to the student union. That was never my goal. My goal was to kind of allow the whole student body to have more interaction with with what's happening with. Um, the school committee itself. So I was wondering, well, I guess I, I, I don't mind it being focused on the union. Maybe that was how things came to be, but I'm wondering in your work, did you or anybody, uh, Member Fallon, have an opportunity to see what other sort of, what other sort of similar positions might exist in other districts around the state? Well, so I will tell you, it was, they were so respectful, the students that we did meet with, um, and it was, it was probably about 20 students the first time I spoke with them. Um, and they were really worried about um, offending us because they understood where this with desire was coming from to create the position. Um, but they, they don't want us um, being like, there is the, the, the discussion was awkward because there is the potential that if we are reaching out to them, like it puts them in an awkward position of um, being potentially manipulated by uh, school committee members who have an agenda item that they wanna rally the students behind. And um, I think it was really um, interesting that they were aware of that potential. Um, and I know that that is an issue that's actually been raised in other districts. It was in fact raised at the board of directors meeting last night yeah. Um, by a school committee member, um, and so from Beverly, Mass. And so, uh, so that was, I think that it's a, it's a question that everyone has of how do you get students involved without putting them in a position where um, they could be potentially manipulated by the adults in their life to support their, their agenda. And so I respected that they wanted sort of a sense of agency and they sort of said, we appreciate it, but we were elected by the students to represent them. Would you maybe be insulted if we said, you're not representing your board well enough, you're not reaching all of your constituents, we'd like to assign a liaison to Ward 2. And so I really respect their decision-making and I, 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 would, I completely back them up. Yeah, so um, have you been able to find any other uh, policies from other districts or any other similar positions from other districts when you were working on this? policies as far as liaisons, other. Yeah, I'm sorry, not policies, but any other similar positions of student liaisons with any other districts. Did you have a chance to see whether that exists that maybe had a description of what that person would do? You know, I didn't find anything looking, but it seems like, you know, the law requires to have a student representative and that um, some students, um, do sit that was where the subcommittee idea sort of came in was that yeah. some you know districts have students on their subcommittees okay thank you um does anybody so I, have any, sorry so i was gonna say i don't know because you referred it to us we gave we're giving you our recommendation i don't know if it has to be voted on on a, on a future agenda well i wouldn't think so unless there's a, a motion made to establish it um, I think this was an exploratory endeavor that we sent over to you and your colleagues, and I much appreciate what you found out. So unless somebody wants to make a motion to um, bring forth a new position for school committee liaison to students and vice versa. Otherwise, I think we can move on if you're okay with that, Member Fallon, to um, talk yeah. about two issues. Yeah, I am. Um, thank you. Um, so next up, we have a first reading. Um, it's policy BEDH, public participation at school committee meetings. Um, I will tell you this one is unusual in that um, we're bringing it to you 
because it is, um, it's a policy that we have had, uh, the, it was adopted in 2003. Um, it was originally from our policy manual from 1978. Um, it's exceptionally problematic because um, two years ago, the ACLU um, along with um, uh, Todd and Weld uh, law, law, uh, what do you, law firm, um, filed a lawsuit on behalf of two Natick public school uh, students, the parents of two Natick public school students. So essentially the Natick public school system was sued um, because of this policy um, and their policy around public comment portion of their school committees. And, um, and the Natick public school committee lost um, because their policy was found to be unconstitutional um, and unfortunately, um, upon reviewing our policy, we have the same unconstitutional language. Hmm. Um, and so the part that's really problematic, um, I'll tell you, is that we have within our policy, um, it says defamatory or abusive remarks are always out of order. If a speaker persists in improper conduct remarks, the chairperson may terminate that individual's privilege of address. Um, and so, obviously, um, seeing as how the um, <laughs> the court has ruled that the, the policy uh, in this case, Spalding uh, versus Natick School Committee, um, was in fact a violation of the Massachusetts Constitution, um, I think that we need to make changes. I was a little bit reluctant uh, along with my colleagues on the Rules and Policy Committee to stray too far in this particular policy from what the MASC recommended policy was. They released um, changes in January of 2020 uh, that had been thoroughly vetted by their legal team. And so in this case, um, because of how much time went into and legal uh, essentially legal review went into the MASC policy. We are presenting this to you for first reading with only um, with the MASC policy that we're recommending for adoption with the only section being changed. We're recommending that their policy that said the public comment segment shall not exceed 15 minutes. And we would recommend changing that to 15 minutes are allotted for the public comment segment, which may be exceeded at the discretion of the chair. And that's in line with our um, rules of procedure and um, and then obviously changing, um, adding in the word Northampton for Northampton School Committee. But we would feel most comfortable in adopting the policy that has been reviewed by their legal team. So that's a first reading. If, um, I don't know if anyone has any questions, but that'll be brought to you next month for a second reading. Okay, um, Member Fallon, would it be helpful if we posted um, or shared the screen on this and then there's another one coming up? Would that be helpful for you or not? Um, I have, um, the reason my camera's off is I have like 13 pages spread out around me and four screens. Um, it, so I don't need it, but if it would be helpful for the public or for the fellow committee members, that would be great. Uh, would any committee members like to do that? I think it makes sense, but I also know it could be a distraction. Okay. Um, any comments on uh, the first reading of BEDH uh, presented by Member Fallon? Ms. Bozanski, member Bozanski, sorry. Thanks, um, I'll, I will bring this up the next time because I know we have an issue with um, debating these things twice, the first reading and second time, but just the sentence towards the end about not necessarily reflecting the views or positions of the Northampton School Committee, it seems just, um, uh, I seem sort of awkwardly phrased. Anyway, so I'll try and come up with an alternative uh, to see if that, what the rest of the committee thinks of it. That's all. Okay. Superintendent Provost, did you have your hands up? Your hand up? I did not. Okay. I do. Um, 
No problem, Mend uh, Member Voss. Thanks, and I, I'll just make the comment quickly. Um, I'm concerned, and we can talk more about it next time, the 15 minute limit. I think when there's big issues, for example, tonight, we had close to an hour and um, 15 minutes seems like a little bit too small time to me, but we can talk about it next time. Okay, uh, Member Fallon, are you ready to move on to the next uh, agenda item on the second reading of BEDB? I am. I was just, um, sorry, I was just pulling up. I was fairly certain that we had kept the 15 minutes because it actually aligned with um, our rules of procedure. And that was all. Um, I've got it up now. Um, yeah, so we didn't. So that was that was all I was gonna say. Um, as yeah, if some if if before you yeah actually nope. So that's what it says. Our rules of procedure section fourteen point three says during the public session of the meeting, discussion by the public will be limited to uh, three minutes per person per issue at the discretion of the chair. Uh, 15, oh, sorry, 14.2, 15 minutes will be allowed for the public to address the committee at the discretion of the chair. So it was deliberate that we made it align with the rules of procedure, because if we change this, then we need to also go back and change our rules of procedure. So we thought it was best that they align. The rules of procedure have read that for years. We've obviously never limited it to 15 minutes. Um, I'm fine with doing it, but I just wanted to be clear that if you suggest it at the next meeting, please be prepared to refer the rules of procedure back to us to, uh, to change those because you know how I feel about it when it's there's they don't they don't align um, because then you know we have no idea what we're doing. Okay, um, moving on. I sorry, um, I Member Levy now has her hand up. If we can just oh, turn her, sorry. Thanks. I just will really quickly say that we talked about this at length in our subcommittee meeting and the um, the the piece about the chair, the, the discretion of the chair, it's 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 not meant to say that we will. And this is for the public to understand as well. We're not saying that public comment should should be limited to 15 minutes at nights like this. Obviously, we want to hear from everybody. So that's where the discretion of the chair is. We're not trying to really limit it to 15 minutes. Understood. Thank you. Okay. Now back uh, to Member Fallon on the second reading and uh, vote on BEDB. Okay, I'm really excited about this, you guys. This was first referred to us in November for a first reading. So if we could actually get this done tonight, I would be really excited. Um, so when it was initially referred to um, this, the Rules and Policy Committee, it was merely because um, our agenda format policy um, that we have on file from 2003. Um, says that um, the superintendent conferring with the vice chair of the school committee will arrange the orders uh, order of items on meeting agendas. And that's not the practice that we have um, used over the years. And so it was initially just referred to us so that it reflected the fact that the superintendent conferring with the chair and vice chair of the school committee arranges the orders of items on the meeting agendas. It took on a life of its own this is the most current iteration. This is the second reading. I know that there were some questions during the first reading, which was quite a few months ago, um, but I will tell you that um, the primary changes are that we said, um, I'm gonna read this for the public, that um, the superintendent conferring with the chair and vice chair of the school committee will arrange the order of items on meetings, meeting agendas so that the committees can accomplish its business as expeditiously as possible. The particular order may vary from meetings meeting in keeping with the business at hand. The committee will follow the order of business established by the agenda, except as it votes to rearrange the order for the convenience of visitors, individuals appearing before the committee or to expedite committee business. Any school committee member, staff member, or citizen may suggest item of the items of business. The inclusion of such items, however, will be at the discretion of the chair of the committee. A staff member who wishes to have his topic scheduled on the agenda should submit the request through the superintendent. The agenda will also provide for time when any citizen who wishes may speak briefly before the school committee. 
All efforts will be made to ensure school committee members receive the agenda and all relevant documents no later than six days before the meeting. If documents are not made available by that time, the related agenda items may be pushed to the subsequent meeting, understanding that sometimes extenuating circumstances may require an agenda item to be discussed more expediently. This is the key. For each major agenda, agenda item, a specific time may be indicated for presentations and comments from the superintendent to be followed by committee discussion and committee action, if any, on the agenda item. Agenda items will be posted in accordance with Massachusetts open meeting law. And so what we were proposing was that we try to be a little bit more um, efficient. And I think that that would be best for us. I think that that would be fair to the public, to our administrators, to the teachers, to everyone who would like to participate in democracy. I don't think six hour meetings are fair to anyone. I can tell you sitting on the board at the Collaborative of Educational Services with 36 other school committee members, we have never, we use this system. We've never gone more than two and a half hours. We're talking about a substantially larger budget with more employees. We're having just as rich of a conversation with just as long of an agenda and we get through it. So I would love it if we could um, approve at least giving this a try. So I would move to approve policy BEDB as amended so that we can have a discussion on it. Second. Okay, that was um, Member Fallon's motion, Member Levy's second, and um, we can open up this for discussion. Seeing no hands, um, I did want to present something that um, myself and Superintendent Provost and Mayor Narkowitz had discussed, um, which is that there have been times um, that we have inadvertently and mistakenly left things off the agenda. And I've, you know, we've attempted to go back, you know, and it's, it's definitely human error. And so in an attempt to figure out how to ensure that doesn't happen, we discussed the current process and we found out that um, that um, clerk, school committee clerk Annie Thompson needs to be copied on any request for an agenda item. That's something that uh, Superintendent Provost felt was necessary. It's not, a, it's more than a second set of eyes. Um, so I would, I would like to um, share that with the committee, as well as what we also felt was that it was appropriate for all three members of the agenda setting committee to receive requests. Um, again, it probably on a personal level, I would say that it's helpful to give some thought to th some things, to know that some things are happening um, that may be discussed, but more so um, without getting into specifics, there's a real strong likelihood for miscommunication and um, difficulties and challenges if we all are not informed. So we felt it was a win-win to include, to ask folks to uh, make requests sent to, at a minimum, all three members of the uh, planning committee, of the um, school committee agenda committee, I'm sorry, and, and clearly um, copying uh, the school committee clerk at the same time we thought would be a winning formula. I don't think that's much different than what you said, Member Fallon, but there was a particular piece. I just wanted to raise that. Um, Member Buzanski? Sorry, does Member Fallon want to speak to that first? I see her hand. Well, I was just going to say, I think you might have raised this question at the last meeting, uh, Member Buzanski. I think that because I have in my notes from the last meeting the question submit to whom. And so I'm just wondering if you're would like to make an amendment that that third paragraph read any school committee member staff member citizen may suggest suggest items of business by submitting a request in uh, by email to the superintendent uh, chair and vice chair uh with you know of the of the school committee i don't know how you'd like to phrase that or if you would if conversely if it's more important to have it submitted to annie who then would would di disseminate it to the three of you so that, that would be easier for the public and for the school committee members like which is the way to have it better would it be better to have it her direct it to the three of you any request that comes in or to have 
per cc and now we're asking people to remember four people. Um, Ms. Brzezowski, member Brzezowski, sorry. Uh, I guess we discussed this so long ago that I don't remember that being my point. That's not why I was raising my hand. So let me try and take a look at it, but I'm not sure I'm the one who needs to make the motion. Member Kaufman, do you have, maybe you have a clearer sense of what you as part of the agenda setting committee is looking sure. for? Sure. I mean, we, we discussed it in the spirit of how could we not have any hiccups and, and ensure that things operate efficiently. So that was our major goal. I. Um, this is what we came up with. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, we should switch it. But for the three of us and, um, and Annie Thompson all felt like this would be the way to go to ensure that um, things would happen without any glitches of things being inadvertently left off or people getting some information rather than others. So that was our recommendation. So did you wanna make an amendment? Yeah, so could I could I amend it then to say any school committee member, staff member or citizen may suggest items of business by submitting them in writing to the school committee clerk. The inclusion of such items, however, will be at the discretion of the agenda setting team. Is that what you guys were hoping for it to sound like? I think it was not through the clerk, but to copy the clerk and um, sent to the three agenda setting members, the superintendent, the mayor, and the vice chair with a CC to the clerk is what we had thought would make the most sense. But it's also the not the, the easiest or most efficient, but okay. <laughs> um, all right, I will withdraw that. Um, I mean, does anyone else want to weigh in on this? Dr. Provost, I see you're nodding your head. Do you feel strongly that? Yeah, so I just wanted to speak in support of what Member Kaufman said. That was the, the feeling of the group because essentially there are requests for agenda items coming in throughout the month and it's very easy for an item to slip by one of us. But if, if, it, if the request goes out to all four of us, then there's more of an opportunity for us to um, have someone to, to back us up. Um, in terms of in terms of the feasi uh, feasibility or, or ease of having his, his mail go to all four individuals, we could easily set up a group, uh, a Gmail group for agenda requests that just automatically sends the email to the four of us. That would be great. And Dr. Provost, since this is online now, our policy manual is online, we haven't done this with any of our other policies, I don't believe, but could we just insert a link to that within the policy so that if people were in fact researching it, is that what you're saying? Or are you saying at a different place on the Northampton Public Schools website? Well, it would be, it would be a Google, it would be a Gmail group. We could, we could name the Gmail group and we could put that in the policy. Um, I'm not sure if you can send a link from a document to a, an email. I'd have to get some technical support to answer that question. Okay. Um, Member Goldman? Okay. Thank you. Um, are, we, are we focusing on um, policy BEDB or are we also looking at the, the agenda format. So BEDB is the policy agenda right. format. However, as part of the policy, we may choose to add um, an example. A lot, of, right. a lot of committees do that. And so that would just be filed with it as policy BEDB-E. And so it would sort of be a sample um, framework that we yeah. could put on file so that people knew in general what to expect. Um, and so that that's something that is also open for discussion, but there's no point, and I don't think discussing that if we don't agree to the actual policy first. Okay, understood, thank you. So um, I see people's hands up. I, I 
I might need a little help here, but I believe I, it would it be appropriate for me at this point to make an amendment to what we just discussed. I don't think my motion ever got seconded, so it does, and we never took a vote on it. So there, it so seconded you can, by Member Levy. But just to discuss the actual, none of none of the motions I made ever were seconded or took, or there was no vote. So I think that he's clear to make a motion on anything. Yeah. Well, I think the I, on item B D B just to close the loop on this, I'd like to amend that to say that. Um, Requests made for items to be part of the agenda will go through the three members of the agenda setting committee and the school committee clerk. And I wonder if there's a second on that motion. I'm sorry, can you tell us where you want that sentence inserted? Yeah, I'm, I don't have the document in front of me. I'm also having situations, but there was a sentence that, I'm sorry, that sentence that you had said that request. Okay, so any <laughs> school committee member, staff member, citizen may suggest item of this, items of business, and then you would want it requests. Is that where you would like your sentence? Yeah, there wasn't there a spot member found that said that request would be made through the superintendent? Well, so that is a staff member who wishes to have a topic scheduled on the agenda should submit the request through the superintendent. Okay. We can we can take that out and we can help however you want to amend. Um, I would I guess I would say let's unless there's a reason not to just to simplify it to take that out and to say any any member any staff member man, member of the public or school committee member who requests an item who would who would like to request an item to be put on the agenda send their request to the three members of the uh, agenda setting committee and copying the school committee clerk. So anyone who wishes to have a topic scheduled on the agenda should submit the request through the superintendent, chair, and vice chair. Yes. You can put a link in for an email address. And I do think it would simplify things by being able to, sorry, I'm jumping in, but to be able to do that here as well. Okay, I'm not sure that's policy though. I mean, I think we can do that, right? We can just do that by practice. Um, but we'll, let's just finish the wording and then we'll get back to you, member Levy. So, and then so, and copying the school committee clerk, member Fallon, I'm sorry, did you get that? Uh-huh. Okay. And then member Levy. Well, is there a second to that motion? Second. Who was that? That well, was Member oh. Fallon can just take it as a friendly amendment and then we don't have to vote on it. Okay, w uh, good idea. Thank you. Would you accept that as a friendly amendment? Yes. Thank you. Well, can it? And that's let's keep. Uh, what if members want to discuss it though? Yeah, it is a part of the current motion and can be discussed. Thank you. Member Go. Um, I was just going to, and this isn't what I have my hand up for, but regarding this, I mean, can we just say uh, using an online form and then we'll develop one and put one on the school committee's website that says, click here to submit a request for the agenda and then everybody who's on it can see the results. You know what I mean? Like, it just seems like it'll simplify it rather than making the public send an email to four different people. There should just be a button that says, submit a request for the agenda. So I would, I would like to amend it rather than saying uh, uh, where it says any school committee member, staff member, or citizen may suggest items of business by submitting a request using in the committee's online agenda setting form. How's that? And is there a second on that? Second. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Yes. I'm not trying to be difficult, but I try to think of these policies from every angle. And so that assumes that it, that everyone has access to a computer. Should we provide for an alternate means? I mean, that, that then only allows people to submit it in that manner. Or should we say, or by contacting the school committee clerk? Like, I'm just, I'm just trying to, I don't, 
we go through these policies once every 20 to 30 years. I want to be sure that we don't make yeah. mistakes. Yeah. So then maybe to add on to that, if that's all right, so just because that was just, am I allowed to keep talking? I don't even know now. Um, but so then adding a line then, um, or by contacting your school committee member who will submit the request on your behalf. I like that. I don't remember what you said, but if you could say it all again. Um, um, just add or by contacting your school committee uh, member who will submit a request using the form on your behalf. That, that's what I said. And is that a friendly amendment or are you looking for a vote? friendly amendment? If that's whatever's the easiest, what's the most friendliest? Okay. Do you accept that, Member Fallon, as a friendly amendment? Sure, yes. Okay, Dr. Provost? I just wanted to point out that the issue of the actual process of submitting something comes up frequently in the context of contract negotiations. And in order to not have um, let a lot of language around a process that could change as new technology changes, we often use sort of a stock phrase like using the system developed by the district. Um, and we've already talked about two forms we could use within this within this discussion. We could put a, G, a Gmail group link within the policy, and we could put a button on the district website. I mean, we could do it multiple ways. It might be um, it might provide more flexibility just to describe that there will be a process provided by the district and try to set out in policy what the process is going to be. Member Goldman? Yes, um, can someone state what the revision is at this point? I have a suggestion, but I, is it to request a topic be scheduled on the agenda? A request for a topic to be scheduled on the agenda should be submitted to the agenda submitting committee, the chair, vice chair, superintendent, and clerk by email, and then you're including a link to make the email or by contacting, and then you're having people contact a school committee member. Shouldn't, I mean, I wonder if it would be better just to call an office or something. Yeah, but that would mean that over these last few months, nobody would have been able to get an item on the agenda because nobody was answering the phones at the office, were they? I think they were. Yes, we were answering everything, yeah. phone, email. Oh, you were? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I stopped calling. Uh, <laughs> um, Member Buzowski has her hand raised. Thanks. Uh, I, I want to bring something else up, but on this topic, I don't, I, I think we should just, in the policy, need to make it as simple as possible, whether it should be just one point of contact or what Dr. Provo said, technologies change, systems change. We don't need people contacting four people. That seems like a really big hurdle to get over. Maybe we'll have an online form. Maybe we'll change it to something else. So I think something as just general as possible. I think if they were to contact anyone, the chair, vice chair, superintendent, or clerk in any way, phone call, email, in writing, um, carrier pigeon, I think that... Um, that maybe the those members could that uh, that committee could then agenda setting committee could then forward it to the rest of you. I just think we should make it just a very simple point of contact for the public. So just something general. It's a policy. It's not. Um, I think we're getting a little too stuck in the weeds. So I'm not sure what that says about language um, for it though. So uh, the other thing I just wanted to bring up, which I've been waiting for months for is um, I'd like to offer up a friendly amendment or it can be its own separate motion, but to include um, uh, in one, two, paragraph number four, to include getting materials in advance for executive session. I think we run into this over and over again, this issue of, uh, and it's a little bit less so now that we're on Zoom, I guess, but um, before pre-pandemic where we would receive documents as we sit down at the table at 9, 10, or 11 o'clock at night. We're given a couple minutes to read it while everybody's talking over us. And um, I just don't think it's really conducive to processing information. So I'd like to ask that we include after the words, 
uh, and all, all efforts, I'll just read the sentence. All efforts will be made to ensure school committee members receive the agenda and all relevant documents, including all documents pertaining to executive session items to be discussed at said meeting. Sorry, don't mean to, I know we're still on the topic of. Um, I'll second that. Will you I, will, mm -hmm. I will tell you, I did have that note and now it's all coming back to me because it's like Groundhog Day. Um, I questioned <laughs> the last time and I'm still questioning, are, are we able to do that safely and legally? I, uh, I have to, I think there is a, I think there's a way I transmit secure documents all the time in my work. And um, there's lots of different systems. There's encrypted systems. There's, uh, and so I think uh, knowing our um, smart as a whip tech team, I have a feeling we could figure it out. We've received documents. We've received shared Google docs already um, pertaining to executive sessions, so. I think we could do it as a, I, I've, had, I've had many ideas. I've been in contact with Dr. Provost about this uh, for months, pre-pandemic. Um, we could even have each have a manila folder in the office if we ever get back to that day with our name on it, where we could come in and read it if we needed to. But I think that the way secure documents, there's lots of systems for secure documents these days. And I'm gonna call on Dr. Provost who might have an update on that, but is, uh, Ms. Pazanski, is that a friendly amendment or a mm -hmm. Okay. And it sounds like since that was seconded by member Fallon, is that something you're accepting? I am, yeah. Okay. And Dr. Provost, do you have something to share on this, an update specifically regarding this issue? Yes. I just want to say that our chief information officer has identified a technology that could be used to confidentially share executive session documents. Thank you. Thank so you. I I just want to recap and not get lost here. So we had one friendly, we had two friendly amendments so far accepted by um, the motioner, member Fallon. One was to ensure that um, a member of the public, I'm sorry, had, had to do with the requests that would be made through the three members of the agenda setting committee and copied to, um, copy to our um, clerk. And then the second friendly amendment that was accepted was the language that um, we just introduced regarding ensuring that the executive session uh, materials and minutes are also provided to school committee members ahead of time. I am obviously not using the exact words, but I just wanna keep, keep the order here that those are two friendly amendments and therefore we're not taking a vote on them. Um, but when we vote on the full amendment, on the full motion, I'm sorry, those would be included unless there's um, further development in this area. And with that said, let me call on, um, I will call on, I think this is in order first, Member Voss and then Member Gold. Not, Member Gold, is that right? Is that the order okay? That would be. Okay. okay. Um, I wanted to comment on both of the amendments. Um, first, Member Busansky's amendment for the executive session agenda to be shared, I find highly attractive, especially as a member of a subcommittee that often has items in the executive session. It's not something we can talk about outside of that and not knowing what's on the agenda um, can be problematic in case I think, you know, if I want to suggest something should be on it. So this seems really important to figure out how to do that. And I strongly, strongly support it. Then what I heard in this discussion was some members suggesting that we require CCing up to four people for an agenda item ask. And I know it was a friendly item, a friendly amendment, but I also agree with member Buskansky that that's a lot to ask people to do. And I, I hear the reason you don't wanna lose track of anything, but I think writing into a policy, a procedure to not lose track of anything is not necessarily the best idea. So. I right now I'm not in favor of that amendment. If if anyone who participates in this process wanted to say just send it to the clerk, um, that would make sense. But I think I support send it to anyone and make sure that you all have a mechanism where you share it with each other if you're worried about it getting lost. But it's too much to ex expect a member of the public to know the four people to send it to, I think. 
Uh, member Gold, are you? Yes, Member Gold, your hand is up. Okay. Um, to follow up on really quickly on what Member Voss said, um, I don't know if Member Fallon has the language, but I tried to incorporate uh, Dr. Provost Gray's suggestion. What if it just says, uh, I don't know if you're ready for this, Member Fallon, or I can email it to you. It says, any school committee member, staff member, or citizen may suggest items of business by submitting a request using the district online system or by contacting a school committee member who will then enter the request using this system. So there's a one-stop shop for us you near know, on the email for people. People can call their school committee member or see them in big Y and the school committee person will say, okay, I'll enter that for you. But I think that seems to cover everything and take in the suggestion of not stipulating the specific online tool. So I loved it, but could I, could you repeat it? I'm sorry that by submitting a request using the district. Um, I wrote, unless Dr. Provost has a better way of saying it, I said using the district's online system or by contacting a school committee member who will then enter the request using this system. I think that's great. Okay. Um, and then the other friendly amendment I'd like to make is in paragraph five, um, where it says for each major agenda item, a specific time may be indicated for presentations and comments from the superintendent to be followed by com committee discussion and committee action. Um, I think that we should also have it say each major agenda item, uh, for each major agenda item, a specific time may be indicated for presentations and comments from the superintendent and committee discussion and committee action. I feel like we need to give ourselves as well, if we're gonna ask presenters to um, be held to a time limit, I think we need to figure out a way to meaningfully hold ourselves to a time limit. Okay, so I just wanna make sure, Member Fallon, did you accept uh, Member Gold's amendment, uh, friendly amendment? Yes. Thank you. And uh, Member Buzaski? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I guess I would just, I, could we move away in reference to Member Gold's uh, friendly amendment? Can we move away from the online system Do that school committee members have to then put the request into the online form? It just seems like, couldn't we just email our agenda setting committee plus our clerk? I mean, that's kind of been our procedure, uh, but that's our practice, let's say. It seems like sort of I, again, it just seems like overkill to rely on this online uh, form that uh, doesn't exist yet and just might change. So um, I, I think I just was wondering if we could make it more general. And then I also was one in that amendment. I wish I had it in writing. Maybe we could put it in. Oh, we can't put it in the chat. Okay. Um, and then also, does it conflict with the sentence number three, the third sentence in that paragraph, a staff member who wishes to have a topic scheduled on the agenda should submit the request through the superintendent. So the staff member in the first sentence has to use the online form or contact a school committee member. And then in the third sentence said staff member has to contact the superintendent. So I just want to try to figure out a way to resolve that. That was number one. Um, and then number two, I agree with uh, member Gold that we need to make a uh, paragraph five. We need to hold, it, it'd be good to have uh, time commitments for everyone, not just the superintendent. I'm a little confused by the sentence and not just the superintendent, but also guests. We often have other staff members um, presenting. So, um, and if I look at the example that's with it, we actually just have a uh, we have a time period for every item on the agenda. So why not just say for each major agenda item, a specific time may be indicated um, for uh, to, I don't know, to cover, to discuss said agenda item. I mean, that's really what the point is, is that we're trying to put a time commitment to every, a time limit or at least an intent for a time limit on every item. So just trying to figure out how to change that language if others agree. Um, so I can I address yeah. the one point that she, that she raised? Please. Um, the, so this was actually, 
and please, I hope that my colleagues on the subcommittee will remind me, this was actually the subject of um, a lot of discussion. Uh, the, the part of the policy that says that a staff member who wishes to have a topic scheduled on the agenda should submit the request through the superintendent, that was deliberate um, because uh, the super, it, it was part of the sample recommended policy by the MASD, but the rationale behind it was that um, that would allow for the opportunity for discussion of why the, you know, what exactly they wanted um, out of that agenda item, and whether it was a presentation or whatever, when might be a better time to have that agenda item addressed, et cetera. And so I think that that was why there was a specific um, no, mo, uh, sentence that that should go through the superintendent. I'm happy to, to let my colleagues tell me if my memory serves me correctly. Or Dr. Provost, can you remember? Uh, I, I believe that your memory is accurate, but it's, it's, I'm thinking through the, the discussion tonight. I don't think that there's anything with the current proposed language that would foreclose the opportunity for the superintendent to have a discussion with a, with a faculty member after receiving the request. It's, nothing in the policy says that sending in a request guarantees that an item is going to go on the agenda. Um, so it, it may be a situation where if we receive a request from either an employee, I might be reaching out to them to, to have conversations and decide whether or not it really was a subject that falls within the purview of the school committee. And likewise, if it's a member of the public, it might be a member of the committee or myself who reaches out to the, the, the requester to say why or why not the item um, is appropriate for the school committee agenda. Okay, so then I would be fine with striking that sentence entirely and having it say any school committee member, staff member, citizen may suggest items of business um, by submitting a request using the district's online system or by contacting your school committee member who will submit the request uh, on their behalf. Does that work for you, Member Busanski? It eliminates the the school committee members having to go through this the online system they can just then send that email knowing it needs to go to the three agenda setting members and to annie yep that sounds great thank you thank you member Fallon. i had a quick question because I, I think i know where this conversation is taking us now um did you want to as part of this you 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 just mentioned kind of that i think it was bed maybe um addendum a or no there was an attachment that had sort of a typical um a typical school committee agenda and yes was that part of this discussion or not so it, it was prior to this it didn't get sent out again um it is it is an example that actually we used to use in the past back when meetings were shorter yeah um and so it essentially had the the agenda as roll call public comment announcements rec the consent agenda and then reports and recommendations and then it's the same order but there was a time next to it so yeah. 645 646 655 7 etc um with adjourn written as 9 30. yeah um so and thank you so it's okay for us in this conversation we're having with you it's okay for us to reference that you don't have a problem with it yeah absolutely okay and then i in that point i would ask if if um our uh, clerk could share the screen on that. I think it's pretty important if you have that document. Um, I do, Get, I'll share it, give me a minute. Okay, thank you. So I, I heard us moving into that direction, which I know is pretty critical just from off the, you know, off the record, um, off school committee conversations we've had. I think um, Member Fallon represented it us well. There's several people on the committee I think that would um, feel like we're moving too far into the evening. We certainly have cut off debate on items that were on the agenda over the past couple of meetings. So if there's things that we can do to kind of streamline, I, I generally get the feeling that there would be a lot of enthusiasm. So um, one of the ideas that I had was um, complementary to, I think, some of the ideas we've just discussed. Thank you for that. So on the screen here is a typical um, agenda that I think we typically follow. Um, but I was thinking if 
um, and this this is part of the this is part of the policy. What if we what if we said uh, every agenda item, uh, no agenda item will last no more than, and I'm just going to throw this out hypothetically, 20 minutes, with exceptions that are made by the full committee or the chair. Like for example, we're discussing uh, school reopening. I don't think we should limit that or big items like that. But in general, if we said that items are uh, can last up to 20 minutes and that members who want to request um, an item on the agenda should also put in their requested amount of time, um, thereby leaving the position of the person who wants it to make that, uh, make that um, call about how much time they need. I would imagine many people need less than 20 minutes, but as a standard to begin somewhere, whether it's 20, 30 or 40, I don't care, but just with something that pushes us in the direction of actually limiting how much time, which might in effect help people in preparing for their item, as well as allowing the, the agenda setting committee to order things in such a way that we might be able to front load some items that are um, potentially take on minimal time. So, especially from outside groups. So that was an idea I wanted to float and um, see if there's any enthusiasm for something along those lines. Member Levy. Thanks, I, I like that idea. I think um, there was a hope when we, when we discussed this as a subcommittee that even 20 minutes would, is a lot. And that, and that it could be up to the um, agenda setting team to put those time limits on. And, and to say that it's, it's time recommendations that if there are robust discussions that need to take place, that that's taken into account. I also just wanted to point out what I think is an important piece of, of a switch here, which is that we, um, we decided to put the reports and recommendations from the subcommittees before new business um, because this and this meeting is a really good example. These things that we're talking about right now have been historically at the end of the agenda and we never get to them. And that means that our subcommittee and other subcommittees are on hold while we're waiting and waiting and waiting to finally get to things. And so I thought it was just important to point that out that that is an actual change to at least how we've been doing things since I've been on the school committee where, where new business has actually come before the reports. Member Fallon? Yeah, I, I thank you for bringing that point up. And if you'll notice that discussion topics that require no action, this is a business meeting that occurs in public. Almost all of the most important things that require a vote or an action should occur in the beginning. Any discussions we want to have should happen afterwards. So that's why discussion topics on the agenda were at 845. As far as that 20 minute limit, there are 14 items on, you know, for example, the agenda from last month. Um, tw at 20 minutes each, we're at, I think, five hours, which is probably a little bit less than our average. So I don't know saying nothing can go over 20 minutes is really going to help us. Um, I think that it would be useful when submitting an agenda item from a member of the committee if we were to give an estimate. I think I need five minutes for this. Um, but I just, I think that this is a start that we can fine tune um, to just, you know, start having those times there and being a little bit more conscientious about it. Um, that's, those are my thoughts. But we also never finished with um, modifying that last, the second to last sentence of the, um, of the policy, just so you don't let me forget. Thank you. <laughs> Member Goldman, did you have your hand raised? I don't see it anymore. I learned it. Thank you. In the okay. In so yeah. Um, personally, my twenty minutes was a hypothetical. Um, I would certainly support less than that. I think I just, I think I'm, I'm supporting what's been said. It's just the idea of putting on putting on a time limit, uh, being open to seeing how that works. And personally, I very much enjoy the thought you put into this, especially the idea of getting um, subcommittee updates. We we chair updates. We may or may not have an update, but. Um, it's important and Tommy that we do. So having it there um, and then the agenda setting committee will take it off if it's not appropriate, but at least having it there as a standard expectation up front makes sense. Thank you. Any other thoughts on this topic? So 
-hmm. So for that last sentence, did I hear that it, you wanted to read for each major major agenda item a specific time may be indicated period? Is that what I'm hearing? Uh, no, no. Uh. <laughs> That's what I heard. Oh, I thought we. Uh... Uh, go ahead, member. Go. All right. Sorry. Um, I thought it was that unless wait, what came after the period member Fallon? I guess that's Th nothing as nothing. far as I can tell. Um, so I thought it was so the friendly amendment I made was for each major major agenda item a specific time may be indicated for presentations and comments from the superintendent as well as for committee discussion and action so that we're as limiting as well as for committee. discussion and committee action, if any, on the agenda item, is that? Yeah, that's what I was, so I just, to, along the lines, I think if I heard member Bisansky correctly, um, that we wanna make sure that school committee members are also cognizant and limited in how much time we talk, like I've been overdoing it. Okay, so if everyone is supported, supportive of those changes, I, I'm not personally in favor of putting any sort of limits on it. I think that that's the point where we need leadership to say, hey, we put this agenda item on for uh, 9 to 9.20. It's now 10.15. We need to either take a vote or move on to the next agenda item or postpone this to continue this conversation next month um, and move us along. I would rather do that than, than put an arbitrary number or a time limit, to be honest. Yeah, I'll just speak on behalf of the agenda setting committee. Um, we wouldn't know how much time somebody wanted. So if somebody wanted five minutes, then, and we allocated 20, that might be a mistake. Um, if somebody wanted an hour, then we would have a right to say, that sounds like a lot. Is there a way we can work with you to bring it down to 20? But um, I think it would help. I think it would help um, setting an efficient agenda if we knew how much time a, a uh, requester, if you will, need it. Uh, no more, no more than X amount of minutes. That's the way I envision it. So, um, Member Buzanski. Um, thank you. So, I just going back to that sentence in paragraph five. I think maybe it's just a matter of a missing comma, and it should read: for each major agenda item, a specific time may be indicated for presentations, comma, comments from the superintendent comma, committee discussion and committee action, if any, on the agenda item. I guess I was just trying to allow for presentations that aren't by the superintendent. That was all. And any other thoughts? Uh, I think we seem to have a, um, a number of different opinions on whether we should allocate time or have the school committee, uh, agenda setting committee allocate time or uh, have the individual allocate time or not even have a time. So I'm not sure where we can go with this until we get some bit of consensus. Uh, but I also realize we're spending a lot of time on this motion and we're, um, we're reinforcing <laughs> our issues here. So um, Member Fallon, do you have enough to repeat your motion and we can take a vote or does someone else have something to say before we do that? Okay, I'll ask member, I don't see any other hands up. Member Fallon, I know that a lot of it has been said. Is there a way that you or um, the clerk can review with us what we'll be voting on in a moment? Um, I guess it's more important that the clerk has it correctly if she's okay with reading it, otherwise I can. Uh, I'm happy to. The, uh, I didn't quite get the last one in the, uh, I think that's paragraph five for each major agenda item. I, I wasn't sure if that was agreed on. What I do have is in paragraph three, any school committee member, staff member, or citizen may suggest items of business period. No, not period, get rid of the period. By submitting a request using the district's online system or by contacting a school committee member who will submit the request on their behalf. Um, and in paragraph five, um, 
All efforts will be made to ensure school committee members receive the agenda and all relative documents, including executive session materials is included in that. And then um, perhaps member Fallon, you can help me with the language for the left, the paragraph that begins for each major agenda item. Um, for each major agenda item, a specific time may be indicated for presentations, comma, comments from the superintendent, comma, committee discussion, comma, and committee action, if any, on the agenda item. And um, I think just to add to that, I think the spirit of this conversation is let's see how this goes. It's, moving, it's a move in one direction. And um, if we need to revisit it, we should do so after we experience it. So thank you for that discussion, Member Fallon. And I could ask the uh, clerk to take a vote, please, on this. Uh, motion to on member Fallon's motion on uh, agenda on item on policy BEDB as amended. Uh, member Serafi Cox. Sorry, I was on mute. Yes. Member Condon. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. Member Kaufman. <clears throat> yes. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Voss. Yes. Member Gold. Yes. Member Busansky. Yes. And Member Fallon. Yes. The vote is nine in favor. Thank you. Um, next on the agenda um, is a vote to approve um, the proposal put forth by Lander Grinspoon Academy. Um, and I'm happy to introduce Ellen Frank, if she's still with us, <laughs> to yes, uh, I am. take the floor. Thank you. Yes, all. I am. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Ellen Frank. I'm executive director at Lander Grinspoon Academy, and I'm joined here this, this evening by our principal, Deborah Bromberg Seltzer, and Pam Hanna, who is our current board president. Um, Lander Grinspoon Academy um, is a Jewish day school. We currently serve kindergarten through sixth grade. Uh, we are entering our 25th year and we have a really strong track record um, academically, socially, um, and graduating kids who go on to take leadership roles at the high school. In fact, you heard from one of them um, this evening. Uh, we want to be mindful of your time. The school committee members are in possession of our um, request or application to add on a combined seventh, eighth grade, starting with next school year. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have or to speak a little more about it if you would like. Okay, uh, any questions from school committee members or any information folks would like to share? Okay, um, do I have a motion to pass, um, to approve the private school um, proposal put forth by the Lander Grinspoon Academy? So moved. Member Levy? Second. Motion, I think that was Member Fallon who- Yes. Had a second, thank you. Uh, can I ask the clerk to make a roll call vote please? Member Condon? Yes. Member Levy? Yes. Member Kaufman? Yes. Member Goldman? Yes. Member Voss? Yes. Member Gold? Yes. Member Busansky? Yes. Member Fallon? Yes. And Member Serafi Cox? Yes. Uh, the vote is nine in favor. Thank you all very much. Thank you for coming and joining us and congratulations. Thank you. Um, next up, item C is a discussion and vote on reopening models. And I'm gonna turn the floor over to Superintendent Provost. And um, if you would like anything shared on the screen, please let us know. Thank you. Annie, Annie knows uh, what to share while she's getting that up. I'll just say that uh, based on prior experiences, I'm joining by three forms of um, technology today. So I've got two computers and a phone going. So there is a picture of me somewhere up here for those of you who want to um, have a face to put with the voice. Um, so 
as soon as Annie starts, um, I will start. Thank you. So I, I'd just like to start by acknowledging Kate Fontaine's comments on behalf of NACE that flexibility is, is what will be needed as we enter the phase of, of reopening. I, I, one of our parent commenters also discussed the need for flexibility and the, the um, ability to be able to move between models nimbly as we move forward. So what we have here is a plan that I believe will allow us to do that, hopefully within confines of um, parameters that have been put forward by the school committee and hopefully in a way that is acceptable to the school committee. So as we discussed two weeks ago, we are required to prepare three reopening plans for the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, a fully remote plan, a hybrid plan, and a fully in-person plan. You are pleased with the components of the fully remote plan, so I won't be discussing it tonight other than to give an update on the steps that we have taken to move forward with that plan. We've prepared orders for the 600 additional students' devices that will be needed for a fully remote plan. We've also prepared orders for subscriptions to the additional online learning platforms that we would use in the remote learning environment. So please watch for purchase contracts in your email inboxes over the course of the next days and weeks. Um, we're hoping to move forward with that very quickly so that we'll have the subscriptions and the devices we need um, if the decision is made to go fully remote. Additionally, we've begun negotiating personal service contracts with the professional development providers that I presented two weeks ago that would support our fully remote plan. And so I'd say the, the large task that remains to be done will be to negotiate additional professional development times, time and the terms, of terms and conditions of work in a remote environment. And for context of the models that we'll be discussing next, I just want to remind you that our estimated cost for the fully remote plan is approximately a half a million dollars. So, Annie, if you could move forward. So, Next, I want to talk about constraints that are built into this plan based on the conversations we had last week, or two weeks ago, I should say. Uh, so in your responses to the models brought forward, we developed the new hybrid and in-person models with the following constraints, and these are the reasons why. So although DESE guidelines allow students to be placed three feet apart. You expressed discomfort with models that had been developed for four feet and five foot spacing. So we designed these models with six foot social distancing. Uh, the models present, and that's our first constraint. The models presented at the last meeting provided for two days of weekly instruction for students in grades seven and eight and four days of weekly in-person instruction for high school students. And there was disappointment that our plans didn't provide for more in-person instruction for secondary students. So we sought to build models that provided more than two days of weekly in-person instruction for students in grades seven and eight, and more than five days of weekly instruction for students in nine through 12. As you'll see, the models we developed provide these students with five days a week of in-person instruction in both the hybrid and the fully in-person scenarios. So um, first we'll talk about the hybrid model, and that's a good place to stop. In our new hybrid model, middle and high school students attend in-person instruction every day. Middle school students have an earlier dismissal time, and high school students are split into two sessions. Elementary students will have in-person instruction four days a week and remote instruction one day a week. Kindergarten is offered as a half-day program. We'll provide more detail on the slides that follow. Just um, before moving on, I wanted to discuss what the half-day half kindergarten would look like at the, two, at the four schools. We have two different start and end times for elementary programs. Um, that's really driven by transportation constraints, as I'll discuss in a minute. So at Bridge Street and Jackson Street, 
the AM kindergarten session would be approximately 8.30 to 11.30, and the PM session would be approximately 12.15 to 2.45. At Leeds and Ryan Road, the AM kindergarten session would be 9.15 to 12.30. The afternoon session would be approximately 1.15 to 3.20. Okay, so moving on to the next slide. Um, the middle school would run on a, in a pod, um, a pod setup. So each pod would have four core teachers, one special education teacher, and two special teachers. One of those special teachers would have a large classroom provided via a tent. Um, so in this model, we need seven tents, one for each pod. And we would also need an additional ESP, one for each pod. That would allow us to provide social distancing of six feet throughout the day and also provide uh, supervision for all of the students. Moving on to the next slide. This is an example hybrid schedule for an elementary student. In our model, we we started just at the beginning of the year with the um, first grade being remote on the second day of the week. So you can see the time differential and you can also see where the remote learning would take place. So in order to facilitate transportation with reduced bus capacity, start and end times at Jackson Street and Bridge Street would be 15 minutes earlier. Start and end times at Leeds and Ryan Road would be 20 minutes later. Each day, one grade, one elementary grade would be remote, and the other elementary grades would be in person. This example shows a first grade schedule. The remote day for first grade is Tuesday. The student would have in-person instruction the other four days of the week and be remote on Tuesday. The rotation would continue with every fifth day being remote due to holidays and short weeks. The actual day of remote instruction would migrate over time, but it would always be five days after the last remote day. The next um, slide shows how the schedule would look from a staff perspective. So staff would follow the same schedule as their students so that no teacher is required to teach in-person classes and remote classes during the same day. ESPs could work remotely or remain in school and assist with other duties during their student's remote day. Start and end times would be adjusted to earlier or later in the day to match the student's schedule. So you can see that um, we would be starting teachers and ESPs at Jackson Street and Bridge Street 15 minutes earlier than they currently do, starting and ending teachers and ESPs at Leeds and Ryan Road 20 minutes later than we normally do. Moving on, probably the most complicated um, part of the model is the high school double session. In order to accomplish this, the high school would be divided into two student bodies and three staff groups. Students in group A would attend school from 7.35 to 1.30, at which time they would be served a bagged lunch and dismissed. Students in group B would begin the day at 10 a.m. with a socially distanced lunch. They would then take classes until 4.45. During the overlapping period from 10.30 to 2.30, students from the two groups would make use of large non-classroom spaces such as the auditorium, the little theater, the community room, and tents. In this model, we would need approximately 10 tents for the high school to get through that um, that time when both groups of students would be there. Uh, moving, so, so you can see what that, this shows the, the schedule from a student perspective. Moving on, we'll look at what the schedule looks like from a staff perspective. So faculty could be assigned either solely to group A, solely to group B, or combined between group A and group B. The reason why that's necessary is there are some courses right now that are only taught by one educator. And so in order to provide students from both group A and group B, they would um, 
those teachers who are the sole providers of a course would have to be assigned as Group A, B faculty. So group um, faculty assigned solely to Group A or to both Group A and Group B would be required to be on campus starting at 7.30. They'd have their duty-free prep. Um, th th those in Group A would have their duty-free prep at the end of the day. Staff assigned solely to Group B would be required to be on campus from 11.54 to 4.26. And then the staff who are assigned to both Group A and Group B would be following a schedule that's more similar to Group A, with the exception that their prep might take place, uh, or their prep would take place either first or second period, and they would be teaching the fourth block. So they would, they would be on site from 7.30 to 1.30. Um, so in, in all, for all six schools, this model would require 29 tenths and approximately 30 additional ESPs between tents, rentals, personnel costs, and additional transportation. This model would cost an additional $45,000 to $50,000 per week. Um, it also creates an array of new logistical and supervisory challenges, such as supervising ten, students in 10 tents in, in back of the high school or supervising students in seven tents in back of the, the middle school, um, getting power out to the tents, getting Wi-Fi out to the tents. Um, so there are many challenges with it in addition to the cost, but it does satisfy the constraints of, prov of prov keeping students six feet apart, providing more than two days a week for seventh and eighth grade, and providing more than four days a week for students in nine through 12. So then looking at the fully in-person model, um, because the, the hybrid model really is a full, fully in-person model for students in grades six through 12, um, our fully in-person model is very similar. The main challenge of going from the hybrid model to the fully in-person model is finding a way to accommodate all the elementary students every day. Um, the, in fact, the only change would be required would be additional tents for the elementary schools. Um, so the cost here would be slightly more due to the additional tent rentals. It would also have, I believe, um, I, I don't believe it will have any difference from the hybrid model in terms of personnel costs or transportation costs, but may run more towards the higher end uh, of the $50,000 per week estimate based on the cost of additional tent rentals. So there are additional tables here just to quickly run through them. Um, next, you can see what the in-person elementary grades pre -K to, it should say pre-K to five schedule, so I'll fix that. Um, really, it's still just maintaining the 15 minute earlier start time at Jackson Street and Bridge Street and the 20 minute later start time at Leeds and Ryan Road. The middle school would still use the pod model and the high school would still be on split schedule. And so then the last thing I want to draw your attention to are potential staffing models for both scenarios. Um, these come from Wisconsin's reopening, which there are two models, one of which is, is actually embedded within the pod concept. Danny, if you could keep going forward, please. So station rotation model allows students to fix through stations on a fixed schedule. So one of the ways of providing the additional spacing for students is to move them through different settings throughout the day, keeping the students together. Um, notice that not all of these settings would necessarily be with a teacher. It's very important to understand that in both the hybrid and the in-person model, although students would be in person and in school for the required time on learning, they would not necessarily be with a teacher 
for the same amount of time that they are now. Um, and if you could move to the, the next one, Annie, this is the individual rotation model, and this is essentially what the middle school has come up with in the pod model. Here, students are staying together and teachers are rotating through the different pods of students within their teams. Um, and so that, that really is, is where we've gotten with the hybrid and the in-person. Um, at this point, I think it's important for us to have some direction from the school committee on where you would like us to go because it's, it's going to be time to open schools soon. It's going to be time to, to set up transportation routes almost immediately. Um, and having some, having some clarity from the, from the school committee on which models it wants us to work on will allow us to, to have things in place for the start of school. Thank you, Dr. Provost. Um, just to clarify your last remark, are you asking, you, are, you, are you telling us that you need us to, to vote on one model? Is that what you're asking us to do if we can? Because we have given you direction. Clearly we've gone from 10 to two and we made some twists and turns, but um, just to clarify, what, what do you need from us if you can help out there? It's not essential that I know that uh, which model we're, we're using for the start of school because I can work on developing everything we need for three models. But I have to know whether these are the three models you want me to work on or whether you want to send me back to the drawing board to do something different. Okay. Um, and I also, I want to say that this is, uh, from my perspective, more complicated than the last models we had. And um, what I'd like to do now is open up questions strictly for clarification not for comments. I think it's important that we're well grounded in what exactly Dr. Provost is proposing. So if you can, at this point, just limit, if you wanna raise your hand, just make sure that it's to ask a clarifying question. Um, and if there are none of those, I will move on to comments, suggestions, feedback. Okay, so if you have your hand raised, that's for a clarifying question um, and I would, Call on Member Libby. Thank you. I have a, a, a few questions, but I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I, I think I'll keep my questions right now to, to kindergarten. Um, super, I, I, you're asking for questions, so I'm gonna keep all my thanks to myself. I know we're trying to move fast. I appreciate all the time and effort that went into to putting this very um, complex model together in a short amount of time. Um, Superintendent, can you please repeat the hours of the half day kindergarten schedule again? So at Bridge Street and Jackson Street, which are the early schools, the AM kindergarten would be 8.30 to 11.30 about. The, the afternoon kindergarten would be 12.15 to 2.45. And then at the late schools, which are Leeds and Ryan Road, the morning kindergarten would be approximately 8.15 to 12.30, and the afternoon would be approximately 1.15 to 3.20. The only reason I say approximate at this time is we really have to actually map out the transportation routes to make sure those times work. It might be five minutes one, one direction or the other, but, but essentially that's what they would be. Sure. Okay, thank you. I think you said 8.15 for Lee's Ryan Road, but you probably meant 9.15 for the start time for the morning. Um, okay, so I'm doing the fast math. And first, my question is, the seems like the students who attend in the morning are getting more kindergarten than the students attending in the afternoon. My second question is, either way, let's, let's go with the afternoon students who are getting roughly two hours of kindergarten. There's a lot of data on the, um, on, on the strong evidence that full day kindergarten improves academic achievement, um, sustains uh, a whole host of educational benefits, um, specifically for low income and minority communities. Uh, I wouldn't have said minority, sorry, I was reading from the internet there. Um, the, 
I, I guess I would like to hear from you, A, like how are you ensuring that the morning students and the afternoon students are, are receiving equal time? B, um, tell me why you think two hours of kindergarten a day is okay. Three, tell me about your thinking given the host of information out, out there about the benefits of full day kindergarten, especially on, on uh, low income and, and historically marginalized students. So I agree completely on the benefits of full day kindergarten. This is not a choice that I like. Essentially what's happened is the model is flipped. When we were first discussing this, um, we wanted to prioritize elementary students and the, the, the feedback from the community was not enough time for secondary students. So we tried to put more time in for secondary students and that was judged to not be enough. And so now what's happening is secondary students are being maximized and elementary students are having less time, um, which uh, I don't necessarily think is, is the best um, decision but I think it's in line with the direction that I got um, last time. In terms of reducing at the elementary school, kindergarten is the only place where we have space because although it is probably, other than preschool, the most impactful grade, it's not required. Member Levy, okay. are you all set? Or I don't know that I'm, all, I don't, I'm not sure that all three of my questions got answered there, but I guess I will. Um, Wait, what did I? Well, sorry, sorry. The like, so so you all had a conversation and and deemed that two hours a day is okay, of kindergarten. Given that you just said that it's the second most important grade. Oh, so I would say that it's I'd say that it's legally okay. It's not educationally ideal. What, what I would like to do to, to speak from what I think is most educationally sound is I would like to tilt back to where we were two weeks ago where we were still providing more time for the secondary students but not having them in every single day. That would free up some space for elementary students and, and let us, let us um, move to or, or retain a full day kindergarten. Yeah, I guess I would, I know that I'm supposed to just have questions and not comments, but I, because I have the floor, I'll simply say my, my comment two weeks ago was exactly what you just said, superintendent, that I want to maximize face time for our secondary students, but I also recognize that there's a capability to do online learning in, for them in a way that there isn't for elementary school students. And so if what we're looking at is equity, I think we do need to maximize our elementary school students in classroom time and get as much classroom time as we can for the secondary students without jeopardizing that for the elementary school students, if that's, if, if that's clear. It is. Um, and that, you know, I guess what I would ask in response to that was I felt, I felt like there was disappointment when I said four days a week for high school and two days a week for seventh and eighth. Um, in high school, the only thing more than four days a week is five days. So I felt like that was a clear direction to move in that direction, you know, to, to move to a full day or a full week. And in seventh and eighth, um, you know, I, it just became, when, once you started adding a third day, it became easier to add just the other two days as well. Because once you set up the pods and you set up the tent, you hire the staff, there's a way to do that. Um, so. One thing that I would ask from the committee is whether you'd like me to move back to something that, or whether it would be acceptable to move back to something more along the lines of what was being presented two weeks ago in order to get full day kindergarten and or uh, full week instruction for the elementary students. I'll, I'll speak for myself and say that I like a lot of what you've done in this model and I wonder if there's a way, a way to, to sort of meet in the middle where we're still getting tense, we are still thinking creatively and we are not, we, and we do have a little bit more. I, I, I personally was okay with four days a week for high school if one day was, was hybrid, um, but I'll, I'll yield to my colleagues because I've, I've taken up time and, and I'd be curious to hear their thoughts. Thank you, Member Levy. Um, <clears throat> next person's hands up is uh, Member Voss. 
Okay. Uh, thank you. And thank you for this new plan. I'll try to do what you asked, Member Kaufman, and ask questions, but I will come back later because I have I have other concerns that don't fit in what you asked us to talk about. Um, I'll just briefly say a lot has changed, um, and that's part of this flexibility we've been talking about. Our knowledge of this disease is still growing. There's a lot we don't know, and there's a lot that's been going on worldwide since we last met. So I have some pretty major concerns about this many students going back to school all at the same time. But in the spirit of what member Kaufman asked, I will save that. I'll put my hand up again for that. Um, I do have some specific questions. Um, I'm curious, well, well, I guess I also just wanna say, I didn't leave last meeting thinking that we asked for high school students to have that much more time. I would say high school students, um, I, what I remember saying and hearing from many was need some face-to-face -face time middle school students need some face-to-face -face time, but I don't think I heard four or five days, and maybe I'm remembering it wrong, but I, I don't see how we can safely do this much face time. And I do think the younger kids um, will struggle more with the remote learning. So moving back to a different balance, I would support. But my specific questions are, um, especially for the high school, who made these models? Were there teachers involved or um, how did we get to this two tier, like A and B with that much time every day for students? Was that a teacher supported model? So the, this was developed with, count, with guidance staff and with administrators. I did have a conversation with Nate about um, double sessions at the high school. And at the time we were thinking that um, the, double, the second session would be much later. And I can say, um, essentially, we thought we would run the, the group A and then run them completely through the day and then start the second group, which would have them ending the day sometime around 7 or 8 o'clock. And that was not well supported by NACE. I think, I think it was 80 or I think it was 80 percent against that. So this revised model um, pushed up the second um, part of the day. So and what we, our goal here was to try to get everybody home before five o'clock. Um, so that, that was a way of trying to be responsive to that. Uh, in terms of, and, and it, also, um, it also really looked at the data saying that maybe there's only 20% of teachers who were favorable even when it was going to uh, a much later time. In this model, you really only need to have less than less than 50%, you probably need to have 40% of your teachers willing to make a switch to the second time. And it's a, it's not as late of a time as it was prior to that. So, um, so in, this, in this model, how many high school students would be in the hallway in the middle of the day changing classes at once? So we have had a lot of discussions about how to do passing time. In fact, one of the ways we shrunk um, the, both of the days was by reducing the passing time because we think we're gonna have students moving less um, and um, probably moving at different times during the day. So we don't, have the exact, we don't have the exact model on how students are gonna change classes at the high school yet, but we do anticipate that it's going to be much quicker and um, much shorter distances than we were doing when students were moving all over the building. Okay, I, I mean, my reaction to that is I would say you would almost need more passing time so that fewer people are in the hallway at once if your goal is to keep a six foot distance between people and at least a distance between people. And I, I wanna keep going because I have a lot of questions, but my reaction to this high school plan is that I really would like to see teacher feedback on how this is gonna work. As a parent, my, my feeling is to expect kids to go that long a day wearing a mask under a circumstance where they're probably pretty uncomfortable in a learning situation. Um, I'm not sure that that really works. And I would almost rather see a tweak to the plan. I'm not saying throw it out, but a tweak where if you have these double sessions, they're much shorter, you don't have as many people there. So maybe the first group gets out before the second group arrives and you have lunch. I mean, asking kids to go 7.30 to 1.30 without eating, I think could be challenging for a lot of kids too. And I also think given 
everything we've already talked about, about high school start time and the fact that kids have been sleeping in until probably nine o'clock ever since March, um, to ask kids to get back at 7.30 and then not eat till 1.30 and be in this environment, masks are hot. I, I don't think it works well. And I, as I would rather have a much shorter learning period, um, take advantage of the face-to-face -face time to interact with each other um, and have more remote work expected. And, and I'll leave it at that. Um, my next question is, in terms of designing all these rooms through all the grade levels, how are we going about deciding how many people can fit in a room? So what makes it viable? You've talked about six feet of space, but one of the things that's come out in the last few weeks really strongly is how important ventilation is. So how are we making sure, are we ordering box fans? Are we making sure windows open? And how is that going into the decision of how many people can be in each of these rooms? So at the, at the middle school, we've been working on windows basically since, um, since we started working on reopening models. I think I've shared before, there's essentially a design flaw with the, the windows at the middle school that causes many rooms or, or, or caused many rooms to not have functional windows. So our, our rule of thumb was that we're going to have windows that work in every room or we're not going to use them. I got an update from our director of maintenance earlier this week. He said that we're on track to have op windows that open in all of the middle school classrooms. So that, that's that piece. Um, to my knowledge, there are no issues with windows that don't open at the high school. There, is, there are a few windows at Leeds that also need work because they're not, um, they're not functional at this point, but those are also going to be repaired over the course of the summer. And then with respect to um, airflow, we are talking to commissioning agents. Um, I think we have three different commissioning agents we're talking to right now to come in and test airflow within the building. So I appreciate that. And I saw some data today. I'm not an expert on this. And I, it seemed reasonable to suggest that just a window open and a door open isn't going to do as much as you need it to do. And um, people are starting to talk about strong fans to move air around. So in some of the rooms that are smaller, um, we might want to start thinking about that. But really, I can't vote ultimately to send kids back. And I, I'm not saying tonight, but it, I will not vote to send kids back and teachers back unless I'm convinced that the ventilation in the rooms they're going to meets what, what people have told us, you know, like 10 air changes an hour, unless I'm, you know, we're told that there's, it's safe, whatever it is, we need to make sure it's safe, the room, the air changes per hour. And then my next question is, how are we dealing with bathrooms with this number of students and the concerns about bathrooms? Can you say more about the question? I'm, I'm not sure what, what the bathroom question is. Um, well, bathroom, how many bathrooms are available? So um, if we're sending this many students back into buildings all at once in the proposal, um, have we modeled how many kids can be in a bathroom at once, what the time is between them? Are we paying attention to the ventilation in the bathrooms? There's been a lot of um, discussion about flushing toilets and um, causing the virus, the virus is airborne and uh, lots of institutions are talking about limiting the number of people per bathroom. Oh, thank you. So yeah, we, we have not had a discussion about bathroom limitation protocol, but we can certainly put that on the list. Uh, I think it's a pretty important thing to talk about if you're going to have the entire high school population back in the building. Um, I know bathrooms are an issue even in normal times, so I'm concerned about about that. Um, my next question is with, you know, this idea that we need to be flexible, and I fully support that. Um, in fact, I would advocate and support being flexible in terms of starting really slowly, like a quarter of not half of the kids back in some of the buildings at once and then growing if things stay safe. Um, but at what point, how do we make this decision about needing to go remote? And, and really the question is about in that timeline, when do we spend the half million dollars to train teachers to remote learning? Because, um, you know, they're gonna have classes going on. Well, 
what, I, what I've been saying all along is that we need to follow the behavior of the virus, and we can't tell when there's going to be a spike. There's a lot of, there's a lot of people who say no matter what we do, there's going to be a second spike um, because many viruses behave that way. So I think we need to do the training for fully, oh, ideally before school starts again. So that if that first spike happens to coincide with our first week of school, we're ready to switch to all remote. Okay, so just to clarify, you're planning on doing the remote training no matter what? Yes. Okay, that wasn't clear. And then um, I'm getting to the end of these kind of questions and I'll let the next person go. Um, what, what are we, you didn't talk about um, families and staff who opt out. So a lot of districts are giving numbers on the order of 15%, but, other, and you know, roughly, and we have some surveys, but I've seen some districts in Massachusetts now actually asking families to commit soon to saying, we are not gonna send our child and how are we planning for that? And that might affect some of these scenarios if we know how many kids actually want to be in school. And I guess the same question goes for the teachers. How are we supporting teachers who for whatever reason feel they need to stay remote and health reasons? So we have, have had a question in our parent survey about return to school as, um, as I think I reported last time we got together, it's less than 10% who we think are, are at this point not thinking about sending their students back. So that isn't enough to really affect our models. It's not, it doesn't take enough students out of the mix, let's say, to, to allow us to do anything different than we would with a full cohort of students. Um, what the second part of the question really comes down to the model. Like, if you were to approve the models you have in front of you. I know we've already talked about maybe going back to an older version, but if you were to approve this, we'd know that we'd need 20% uh, of our elementary students remote. Um, those would be taught by their own teachers because the teachers would be cycling with them. So we wouldn't need additional remote teachers to them. But in the high school, um, they're, they're, and we wouldn't need any for elementary because elementary is all, I mean, for, for middle school, because middle school is all in. But in the high school, I think one of the things that I forgot to mention is the flex block would be online. So we'd need to have a certain number of teachers at the high school who could provide the online flex block. Um, so it would really come down to just a calculation of the number of teachers needed to, for those positions. And then we would post them and prioritize teachers who um, we're motivated to do that type of work instead of doing in-person learning, either because of their interest and, and really just wanting to do it because they prefer teaching that way, or because of health issues that make it um, more reasonable for them to teach fully remote. Um, and that brings up another constraint that I didn't mention, but is also related to this. The other thing we're trying to work within is the time and learning requirements of the state, which will still apply. So we're trying to get 900 hours in for elementary and we're trying to get 990 hours in for secondary. So so just a quick follow up to that. I, I mean, I think the really great thing about the flex block is the interaction and getting to know the, an adult in the school. So I actually that really worries me if that's the part that's going to go online. There's aspects of high school learning that can be done online, but it seems to me like I would really like more collaboration with the teachers to figure out um, if they agree with that and how they would best use the limited potential face-to-face -face time they have to connect with the students and enable the students to connect with each other, talk to them about how they're going to take charge of their learning and what they do when they're at home as part of their, their learning time. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm done with those kind of questions. Thanks. Okay, um, my... My intention was to clarify the model that uh, Dr. Provost posed and get clarifying questions on that. I think that has not worked successfully. So I'll open this up to any types of comments or questions that folks have. Member Condon. Thank you, Member Kaufman. Uh, Dr. Provost, uh, I have a, a couple of questions. Um, first off, you mentioned discussions with NACE uh, and in particular, 
the uh, high school schedule where you have group A, B teachers. Uh, looking at the schedule you posted, it seems like they are in the building longer than either of the other groups, either group A teachers or group B teachers. Uh, has, have you talked to Nace about that, about that, that group of teachers? Not only having an extended time during the day, but also contact with more students, which health-wise poses some problems. No, I, I haven't talked specifically about that, that aspect of this. What, what I've been trying to do is make sure that everybody gets their con contractual prep. The, the reason that that happens to the AB faculty is the group A faculty is taking their prep at the end of the day and the group B is taking their prep at the beginning of the day. So, and since, since they can take that off site, it means that they could, they could take their prep off site. The AB faculty could actually leave the campus for their prep as well. It's just that they would have to then return for the other, the other block. Okay, uh, another question on staffing. Uh, when you were talking about the staffing models, the last couple slides there, uh, you, you I dropped in something uh, about how students in person will not necessarily be with a teacher. Who will they be with if they're not with a teacher? And will those be, you know, class periods? Like, will they be, have math class without a teacher? So, what I, just to clarify, what I said was that they wouldn't be with a teacher for all of their their instructional time. We talked about the need for 30 additional paraprofessionals because as we have, um, if you have, let's say, a, a class of 24 math students that you need to split for social distancing into two groups, you may have to have a teacher floating between the two groups and a paraprofessional with the, the same two groups as well, sort of having opposite schedules to each other. That's where the additional paraprofessionals come in. But it doesn't mean that um, students would not have access to a teacher for their core or special classes. It just means that the entire time of the instructional block wouldn't be with the teacher. So the teacher might be floating between a couple rooms for that Correct. class. Correct. Uh, great. Uh, next up, uh, a lot of these models incorporate tents. Uh, you know, in, in recent years, you know, as an educator, I know a lot of importance has been placed on kind of uh, the safety of the building and making sure all the doors are locked and, you know, you have to get buzzed into the building. How is that going to kind of play out with tents scattered around? Uh, and kind of a, a, an additional question, where are those kids in the tents going to go to the bathroom? So, uh we have had discussions about both of those issues. Um, they are the main drawbacks to the tents. We are, we are concerned about that ourselves. Um, so uh, the, in the high school and, and JFK, we're able to put the tents in the back so that they're at least um, somewhat shielded and partially fenced off from the rest of the area. Um, the, we had some discussion, although I don't think it, it really would, would be advisable to, to bring in porta potties to support the tents. I think probably we would designate buildings, uh, we would designate bathrooms specifically for students for the tents where they are. Although we, it might need to be a, uh, an option for the high school because the place we're thinking about putting the tents is quite a bit back. It's actually on the opposite side of the football field. Um, so you would lose a lot of time walking back and forth to the building. Um, the the issue of security, to me, is not as, as much of an issue as, as the concern about supervision. Um, in some ways, it's um, you could say there's you could argue that there's a benefit to security because students are not as concentrated and they're already outside. So in the event of a problem, they could disperse more easily. Um, but supervising that number of students outside is is, is a huge issue. I think you would probably need to have one administrator just just dedicated to the tent area, both at JFK and the high school because of the large numbers of tents. Um, other, other logistical problems that come up with that are providing power um, because even though we're not gonna do 
a lot that, that involves power to the tenth. Kids are going to have laptops that, that run out of energy. Teachers are going to um, teachers are going to want to make sure that their laptops stay charged for the whole day. Um, so that figuring that out is a problem. And then um, Wi-Fi access, because we you know the Wi-Fi we have is sufficient to, to handle all the devices we want to put on it, but it isn't designed to to broadcast over. Um, the acreage that would be needed for the, the tenting. So we, so we're, so all of those problems um, definitely arise under the tent uh, scenario. The other problem we have is, is that Bridge Street doesn't really have a good place to put a tent. Um, we have reached out to the city to see if we could use Lampern Park. The initial responses have been positive, so I think we would be able to use that space. But then that creates its own set of issues. Um, because that's very close to the road. Um, and, and talking about young kids creates a safety issue, not in terms of any, um, anyone who, who has malicious intent, but just that kids could stray out into a, a dangerous decision so, or a dangerous situation. So one of the things that we're also looking at um, with respect to Bridge Street is if we could put one of the tents, uh, maybe for younger students or more, um, behaviorally at-risk students in a more sheltered area farther away from the road. Um, so, so there are lots of issues that come up with tents. They solve a lot of problems, but they also create a lot of new problems. Thank you. And, and just one more question, and I'll let uh, my fellow members ask some. Circling back to something that uh, Member Voss asked about, and maybe, maybe you explained this, I just didn't understand, but you know, you mentioned uh, in polling, uh, surveying families, 10% of students or families not wanting to send their kids in. So do we have staff allocated to do fully remote classes with that 10% of the student body? I've been, I've been telling the team I have to, to let that be in the, on the back burner until we get this issue figured out um, because this is such, such a larger nut to crack. When, when we're fixed on models, um, and we're not no longer making adjustments or, or major adjustments anyways to the model, then we can go back and try to, um, as I believe it was Member Voss said, get firm commitments from families on whether they're coming in or whether they're staying remote and more, more thoughtfully plan that situation. But the logistics are simpler. Um, there's so many things that are simpler about that. I, it just has, isn't as much of a priority for me to figure out at this moment. Okay, thank you, Dr. Provost. You're welcome. Okay, um, I'm going to call in successive order. First, Member Fallon, Member Gold, Member Serafi Cox, and then Member Buzanski. Member Fallon. Thank you. Um, Dr. Provost, I, I feel like I must have misheard you. Did you say that the cost of the tents per week would be 50, <laughs> approximately $50,000? I said the, the tents, the personnel, and the transportation cost would be about Forty-five to fifty thousand dollars per week. The tenth is probably sixty percent of that additional cost. And that was for the whole district. Yes. And that, and so it would be. I'm just, I like honestly, I feel like I understand that we've been focusing on safety and education, rightfully so. But when we talk about fifty thousand dollars a week plus almost a half a million dollars in Chromebooks for K through second licenses um, and pro computer programs, and then also the expenses for um, professional development. I and we still don't have a state budget. I I am concerned. I mean, do you like? Can we afford this? It all depends on on what happens with state funding. It, it it's a, a really huge question mark. Um, well, so I guess, yeah, so I guess that I, I am uncomfortable committing to a model, not like I don't want us to have to let go of staff because of decisions we make not knowing the true financial cost and, and how much state aid we're going to get. But also I know that that decision is not going to be made for a while. And so it's, I feel like this, this is an untenable situation. Um, yeah, is there, do we have just a ballpark total 
I mean, it's close to nine hundred thousand dollars. What what is the price for? I guess the pro the question is is how long are we planning to be in one of these hybrid scenarios? Well, that's why I've done a weekly cost estimate, and and I. If you want me to, to try to put a finer point on it, I, I certainly will. But I think I've got it down to within $5,000 per week. Um, so I, I don't think it's the true cost that's a uh, question mark here as much as what the available resources to pay for it is. Um, the reason I've been going with weekly cost averages is because I think these models can change at any moment. And we certainly aren't going to commit to to um, renting tents for an entire year. We've been able to um, arrange for six week commitments and I think we should do it six weeks by six weeks uh, in terms of tents if that's the way we go. Uh, the, other, the other issue that comes into all of this is it, despite the enthusiasm for tents, I think there's gonna come a point where people say it's just too cold to be outside. Yeah, so I only have one more question before I'll let my um, colleagues get asked theirs regarding the tents the more we talk about them so are we going to have to carry are there additional hidden costs are we going to have to carry additional insurance to cover those tents um, have we already checked I know the fire department's got all sorts of regulations about their extension cords and their tents and you know what else we need have we already checked on those to make sure that they're going to even be um, allowed and that they'll pass inspection um, and so I guess I'm just wondering, are, you know, before we commit to the tent scenario, I'm assuming you guys have checked that there's nothing else that's going to be problematic about using them. So I, I don't think that there's, there's an additional liability related to tents around insurance. Um, we're going to be using a statewide vendor for tents and they'll be carrying the insurance on their, their equipment. Um, I do think there's going to be a cost and, a, and an issue related to electricity, which is why I keep coming up to it. it it's not a matter of where I think we're going to be allowed to just run extension cords out there. Um, so I do think there will be some electrical work that needs to be done. I know there will be additional hot spots that need to be purchased. Um, I have been, I have been uh, discussing the concept on my calls with um, my three times a week calls with all of the city department heads, which include fire chief and police chief and, and the director of the health department. And they have not raised any red flags about, you know, just the placing of students under tents per se. And can I just ask you as far as a, from a weather perspective, is that going to have to be preemptive where if they're calling for bad storms, you're going to have to call off school for anyone in tents? Because if we don't have space inside to move everyone safely, I don't know what our plan is. I think it will. We were actually discussing it on, with, as an administrative team this afternoon, and the example I gave was if it was a day like yesterday with 40 mile an hour gales coming through, we would probably have to cancel school because the, the tent situation wouldn't really be very safe. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Member Gold. Um, I mean, at this point, I, I just I share everybody's concerns, um, and I um, I wonder how can we move on from this because you know this plan is um, while incredibly creative and seems like it does a lot of what was asked, it just doesn't seem tenable. And so, how can we what what can we do to move on from this if that's appropriate or not? Because um, we can continue to discuss a plan that that is untenable, but I don't see the, the point in that. Well, if that, if that questions to me, what I would say is if, if these plans aren't supportable, the way to, to move on would be, I think, to try to scale back some of the asks. Um, so then we could move back to some of the prior plans that have been put forward, knowing that we we did it right we gave our best good faith effort at saying what it would cost to get everybody in to keep everyone six feet apart and we didn't like the result or i'm not saying that that's the committee's opinion but if that is the committee's opinion the way to move back would be i think to to loosen some of some of the constraints that were built into this model 
Dr. Provost, um, has has the alt has the, the team that you work with? I think it's beyond the alt team, but the groups, the working groups, and everybody that's been involved in planning this, do they have a recommended plan at this point? They were very. Um, I think there was a lot of enthusiasm for the plan that was presented two weeks ago, where elementary students were in every day, where seventh and eighth graders were in two days a week, and where um, the high school students were in four days a week. Okay. Member uh, Sarah Cox. Thank you. Um, I also want to echo what uh, previous members have said that I I don't remember saying um, that we needed more than four days a week. So I apologize if, if I at all contributed to uh, misunderstanding. Uh, I think perhaps the, the um, co community concern that I heard was uh, for high school students who were attending only one day a week, which was one of the scenarios, but there have been so many scenarios that I think it can get confusing. Um, so I, I have some questions. Um, uh, I'm, I'll, I'll just list my questions and then you can answer them in order and then uh, I can remind you if you forget any. Um, I'm wondering, uh, in previous conversations, we've talked about uh, the potential to start early, start the school year early. I'm wondering if that is still in your thinking or if you have rejected it. Um, I, last time uh, we spoke, you, what I understood from what you said was that the state wanted us to put forward these three plans and then they would tell us which one we were supposed to implement and we would not have a whole lot of, potentially we would not have a whole lot of power over making a different decision than what the state was mandating. I wonder if you could give an update on that because you did say that things were changing quickly. Um, I would also, um, um, I think that one was answered and that one was answered. Uh, and then I, uh, I heard that Amherst is, or I think I saw in the paper that Amherst is doing an online uh, feedback session with parents and caregivers. It sounded like it was feedback and just Q and A. So um, I would encourage you to consider doing that as well because there's gonna be a whole lot of confusion, a whole lot of just folks not knowing what to do. Um, there also, I received a communication from a constituent uh, encouraging web, or maybe that was uh, a speaker tonight, um, encouraging webinars for parents and caregivers on how to support students learning remotely. So I think that that's, um, <laughs> speaking as a parent myself, I would love to know like what, what are the things that I need to do? Where do I access the information? Because to, to um, rely entirely on my child's classroom teacher to communicate that information, I think is um, difficult to, to put that on, uh, on the teacher. Uh, so my main questions were about the opening early and this like state directive issue. Sure. Uh, on opening early, that was an, an idea that I was initially attracted to, but then I was reminded of some of the experiences we had um, even in September. You know, I think when we had warm days in September and um, the, the response from the community and from staff was not positive. You know, we would have the benefit of having some more students under 10th, but it wouldn't be 100%. We'd still have some um, students in non-climate controlled areas. And there are, there are a few in the district that are notorious. Um, the second floor at Jackson Street, the second floor at Leeds, um, the second floor at um, JFK and the south side of the high school, basically the whole thing on those hot days get really, really hot. So I think that, you know, we might be, if I ended up putting it earlier, I'd end up canceling a lot of those days because of heat anyway. So I think that one is, is, doesn't really work for me. In terms of who has the authority, that is the million dollar question that I have been Trying, I've been trying to get a direct answer to for weeks and have not been able to get. Um, I've asked the chair or the president of our local um, roundtable in the next meeting with the commissioner to directly ask so 
who's it going to be? Um, is, it, is this a school committee decision or is this a uh, Department of Ed commission? So as soon as I get an answer to that, I will email the whole school committee. Um, that's what I learned. Um, in terms of uh, the feedback sessions, I, I think that that's a good idea. And I think I probably would structure it differently. Um, we did have a, a round of feedback with all of the staff um, on different models. Of course, they've all evolved quite a bit. But I think that it would be better to have um, better to have feedback session with parents separately. And that's just learning a little bit from the Amherst experience that, that actually happened this afternoon. I, I understand that there were some um, things that came up having teachers and, and parents in, in the same session. And so it might be better to do that separately. In terms of uh, professional development for parents, um, I do think that's a, a great idea. And I can bring that back to the tech team that developed the professional development for teachers and ask what, what we would be ideal or what we could do for parents. Great, thank you. And I guess I would just encourage in whatever ways through your uh, superintendents association or in whatever ways that can be communicated to the state legislature. Um, I will also communicate to our state legislators that I think that um, the idea that the state is gonna tell the, the town of Northampton what, what it should do with its children um, is, I mean, I understand that in many ways they already do. They, there are many education laws, but I, I guess I'm worried that they're going to uh, tell us that we should uh, go back more than the city of Northampton is comfortable with. Thank you. Um, Member Bozanski. Thanks. And uh, thank you for this, you know, uh, for the plan you presented tonight and all and all the work that you put into it and um, everyone has put into it. It really feels like this just absolute impossible situation. So thank you for keep uh, moving ahead with it. Um, so I just wanted to um, understand uh, in the last um, scenarios that you presented um, there, we could only at six feet distance, we could only fit pre-K through four into each elementary school. And that's why fifth was gonna be moved up to JFK. But this model, it seems like pre-K through five, everybody's in their back in their own school, still at six feet apart. I'm a little confused. Yes. As, as we looked at it um, more closely and added tenth to the model, we were able to we were able to fit them at one point earlier this afternoon. We still had the fifth graders from Bridge Street going to JFK, but that didn't seem very fair to them. So that's where um, that's where an additional tent came in, and and why we're looking now for sheltered space for that tent because we're we're worried if we put too many in Lampern Park, we're going to get too close to the road. Got it. And um, I just want to echo what a couple other members have said. I kind of missed the part where we asked for more than um, four days for grades nine through 12, even more than two days for grades seven through eight. The last set of models that we looked at, scenario, scenario five, well, scenario two had, um, had uh, seven through 12 going completely remote and scenario five had a four day rotation for elementary students and a one day rotation for secondary students. So I, I kind of feel like we've swung too far in the other direction. And I also agree with what others have said is that 45 to 50,000 a week, just I, I can't imagine how we're ever gonna, it, it's just, it's untenable, it's, it's, uh, it's unrealistic. And it sounds like you at some, you think it is too. And I, I really do appreciate all that effort. I know you're not, um, uh, anyway, I just appreciate, I do appreciate all that effort, but I would like to suggest, um, and, and I think I'm, I've heard it from a couple other members. Yeah, that we go back to some sort of middle ground and we try and figure out what's financially reasonable and also um, just what's more, re what's health and safety wise, more reasonable to have fewer students in the building, um, fewer teachers, you know, the whole, the whole, uh, the whole package. And I'd also like to echo what uh, member Levy um, asked about earlier. And I'd like to try to figure out a way to go back to full day kindergarten. I feel like that is really important. And um, 
And so maybe if it maybe if we scale back on the six through 12, not having to be in four or five days a week, and we maybe there's a way to kind of juggle that and uh, make some of this other stuff easier too. So I would imagine I would imagine costs would reduce if we had uh, seven through 12 in or six through 12 coming in two days a week, or maybe three days, one week, two days, the next week, each student, you know, gets a three day week or a two day week or something like that. I could just, so I just, um, yeah, I just wanted to put in my two cents about all of that. And I, I and, and let me just add one more thing. Like what I do, rem what I, where I did think we left off last week, I remember, I think it was member gold who presented, uh, said, why don't we look at what it would mean to um, do double sessions. But um, I didn't realize that that therefore knocked out scenario uh, five or trying to get a little more face time for middle and high school. And so I don't think double sessions are really realistic is what I'm coming to in looking at this. And I appreciate you're giving us such an in-depth look at it. Um, and uh, lastly, I'll just put out there, and I know I emailed you about this earlier, but just trying to create some frequently answered question page on the website that we could sort of promote and put on social media, et cetera, the sooner the better, because I think while we don't have some answers, um, you, there's a lot of areas where we don't have any answers. We do clearly, you, you know, I keep hearing over and over again, like we're not going to put kids and teachers in classrooms where the windows don't open up. Like that's just something we could just put out there. And so we're not... Um, and we can point parents in the direction of, and it could build and, you know, grow. So I'd like to just put another plug in for that. I like the town hall meeting idea as well. So thank you very much. You're welcome. So I guess last week or two weeks ago when we were presenting it, each one of the models had several iterations within it. And I was presenting very quickly in the interest of time. So I think the feedback I'm getting now is people might not have realized that more time was actually on the table for secondary students. And when I heard you say more time for secondary students, I think I thought, well, they, might, they must want more than I've already put out there. <laughs> so maybe going back to that model, which actually was the alt team's preferred model, would be a good place to go to next for the, for the, hybrid, for the hybrid model anyways. Uh, do you mean, just to, since I still have the floor, per uh, do you mean to go back to go back to scenario five from the last? Right, because you were right. It started out with five days a week for elementary and one day a week for secondary, but we had we had made adjustments um, prior to presenting it because we had also heard feedback from secondary parents that they wanted more days. Um, so that was embedded as one of the options last time, um, but maybe didn't get discussed fully enough, or, or maybe just got too quickly presented. Okay. Got it. Thank you. And that would be uh, four, five days for element for pre-K through five is what you're saying? Five full days, pre-K through five? Actually, through grade six. And then seven and eight, get two days of in-person a week. And then the high school we were able to get, um, we were able to get four days a week. Yeah, I'm not seeing that. I, that's where you're losing me, I guess. How does the high school have four days a week in scenario, that scenario five? That's where I'm totally, what I'm seeing is that uh, at six feet, NHS Tuesdays. Oh, sorry, la, la, la. Yeah, I'm not, I guess I just. It was, well, it was, it was kind of a confusing model as well. So it was a, I described it as a four group drop one model where you split the high school into four groups and then you drop one of the groups each day. Right, uh, but that was four at four, that's at four feet distance. I don't see that at six feet. You're right, that was at four, that was at four. But I, I think with some additional space through tenting, we could probably get pretty close to that again. Why don't, if it's, if it's a, a desirable model, we can work on trying to replicate that as closely as we can with six feet. So that would be high schoolers in four days a week. Is that what you? I just want to be really clear because I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, waste any more time on this. I know we need to make decisions. So that would be high schoolers at four days a week. Yes. All, all I can say is I haven't built it out at six feet. Yeah. So that's why as close to that as possible at six feet. Yep. No, I'm not gonna. Yeah. And then the seventh and eighth grade would be. Two days a week? Yes. 
that that I feel more confident about because I, we've just proved we could get them all in every day. With, yeah. um, you know, I'd like to do it with fewer tents if possible. And get going to two days a week, I think, can really reduce the tent demand. Okay. I'll, and then that would still keep pre-K through five in their own schools because we figured out we can do that. Uh, well, the only way to keep pre-K through five in their own schools is if you have at least three tents at each school. I see. In, in that other model, we were moving the fifth grade up. Yep. To JFK. All right, I see a lot of hands are up, so I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, let others uh, speak, ask questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, funny, I don't see anybody's hand up. I think we'll just move forward at this point. Joking, joking, joking. Sorry. Um, it's because everybody else is a repeat, I'm gonna call on myself because I haven't had a chance to speak yet. Um, I think, Dr. Provost, what what I seem to be hearing is that folks are not particularly, um, that, that, that this newer model doesn't really resonate as much as maybe some of the past ones. We almost seem to have moved away from the momentum we, I think we might have had towards coming to agreement. And I think it sounds like you're not even happy with this move and there was some confusion as to some of the elements of it. So that's what I'm hearing. So what I would like to propose is um, at this point, you have heard from various members of the school committee um, for many hours. We haven't even voted on anything. I don't know how much, I haven't had the foggiest, I don't have the foggiest idea how much we even agree on this stuff. We might be too far away from giving you what you need. Um, and I think what you need is a plan. So then, then you can, you can um, communicate it, you could tweak it, you could answer questions that are based on that plan. Um, I just think we're, like member Fallon said earlier, we're in an untenable situation. I don't think we're doing you any favors by asking you to go back and rework something when in fact you have this as well as many other responsibilities over the summer. So my proposal would be that you take everything that we have shared, that you share this with your group, um, of your work, various working group mem members, and you come back to us, which, um, Andy, when is our next meeting? Do you know our fan? Is it not till August? It's August 13th yeah, for so, now. Yeah, so it sounds like that's gonna be way too late, I would think, but I think that we're gonna need another special meeting and I am concerned about going through this uh, process again. I totally understand it and I totally think I'm a part of it, but I don't think we're helping you get closer to what you need. And um, I'm really concerned that if you don't have adequate time to work on a plan, um, we're not gonna have the time to implement it. And I know it's not just you. I don't think any superintendent, I might be mistaken, has agreed on anything yet. And that's the position that the state has put us in. And that's the position this horrendous virus has put us in. So um, the amount of knowledge that you have in your head and your responses to these questions for me builds up an incredible amount of trust that you have thought this through and that you and your team can come back to us with a recommended plan and um, and we could hopefully ask questions, well, I guess ask questions about that plan, but hopefully my, my vision would be that we can vote on that plan and you can begin to implement it. And then as necessary, we're likely gonna have to change it because we're gonna get new information, but this does not set, feel fair to me. Uh, fair To me, it does not feel fair to you. And um, we have five more hands raised and it's 10, 15, and um, Member Gold brought up before, how do we move forward? This is my response to his question. I don't know if people like it, but I just think we need to be conscious of how we're gonna help Dr. Provost. Um, that's where I sit. And I don't know if you wanna respond, Dr. Provost, and then we have five other hands, Dr. Uh, Member Voss, oh, Member, Fallon, have, Member Gold, have, Member Levy, Member, Member Gold. I have one idea. Yep. Last time we met, we, we knocked off one. We figured out what the fully remote plan was gonna be like. Tonight, it seems like most of the questions come around what the hybrid model could be like. I think 
the all-in model if we if we presume and really the only the only constraint that, that stands for the all-in model is that it, we need to maintain six feet um, because all the rest of the constraints are already taken care of by saying that every student has to be in five days a week then maybe we could come to agreement tonight on what the all-in model looks like and then next time we could just figure out the hybrid so I think if, if you want to maintain six feet this is the only way to do fully in person and I know that people have concerns about doing fully in person but it's one of the models we have to present so that that's a requirement from the from the department right we have to we have no choice even if we don't implement it we have to come up with a plan that's correct we have to submit three plans yeah and when is that due mid-august Okay, I mean, I just, I just want to say that I, I, as much as I believe that you, that you, be, <laughs> I, I don't necessarily agree that we've come up with a plan for in for um, fully remote and fully in person. So, for example, with fully remote, um, you you probably have these answers in your head, Dr. Provost, but I don't know if we've been presented with the idea of when the professional development would take place how many teachers we would expect to participate and how we would get them to participate. Um, do all students have access to technology? Would they be required to attend? What do we do if they don't attend? These are tweaks. I'm not asking you to answer those now, but it just seems like if I can rattle off five or six questions that there's probably more. And in terms of kids returning to school full-time, um, I think there's gonna be a lot of other questions. So your, your, your work is, you have an abundance of work moving forward. So I say this with good intentions that we really need to solidify on three plans and give you the opportunity to develop those and for us to give you feedback. Um, that said, I love Member Bozanski's idea that maybe at least to help with some of the anxiety that parents are going through, maybe we can post up some non-negotiables like, like the example she brought up, no child will attend, no, no instruction, if in person, no instruction will be um, in a classroom that doesn't meet our standards for ventilation. Um, face masks will be available to each and every student under, you know, I mean, just things to alleviate some of the concern above and beyond that. Um, I'd, I'd even offer to help you develop that. I just feel like that would, that would be helpful. Um, so that all said, let's move up to did you want to respond, Dr. Voss, Dr. Provost? Um, no, you're you're right that that all those details need to be worked out. I don't think all those details are going to be need to be submitted for the the state plan, which is why I say that I think there's enough on pot. There's, I feel like I'm confident there's enough on remote learning for us to submit our plan to the state. I'm feeling like there may be enough for a fully in person to submit to the state. If if we say the committee has set the standard that we, we're maintaining six feet of distance, then this is this is pretty much how, how it has to be done. Um, there, within that, there are a myriad of questions, but I, I don't think our plan to the state is gonna have to have that level of detail. Yeah. So, but the big question still remains on the, the hybrid model of how much in-person versus remote learning would take place at the different grade levels. Sure, thank you. And just to clarify, you know, what we have to present from the state was frankly the furthest thing from my mind. I just feel, feel like teachers want to know what's up, parents want to know what's up, kids want to know what's up, we want to know what's up. We, we, you need time to develop something. Six weeks is barely enough time. I, I'm glad the state will, re, will endorse something as broad as that, but teachers want to know, you know, they're sick. They might have diabetes like I do. They want to know, can they return? They don't want to return. And so this is, they're living through this every day and that has tremendous impact on, on all three scenarios. And I just wanna give you the time to develop those. So um, anyway, thank you for thinking this through in the, in the level that you have. And I'll call on, um, next up is member Voss. Thanks. Um, so I'm gonna maybe disagree a little bit um, respectfully here and I, I think we really need to have more direction on a hybrid plan right now. Um, people need to know and it needs to be planned. I'm a lot less worried about the other two because I think the most realistic is a hybrid plan. And um, 
I'm just going to run through the list that I didn't get before. Um, we met about two weeks ago, and since then, a lot has changed. And this is where I think we need to be a lot more realistic about this virus. And it really concerns me when I hear things like, it just sounds like we're trying to stuff as many people in spaces as we possibly can. And the cost of that, as others have pointed out, we can't afford it. Um, and, and I think it, to me, it's not even the affording, it's more the safety issue, but there's both issues online. So I think from my perspective, and I'm gonna keep saying this, we need to step back, simplify, start slow. I'm going to just put out there, let's get 25% of our kids back each day, four days a week, and let's have that fifth day for the kids who are most risk. And Dr. Provost knows I've suggested that to him privately a while ago. I don't know exactly what it looks like, but if we can have a simple hybrid plan and we can stay healthy for two or three weeks, then maybe we can make it 50% by putting two groups together. But right now, I'll just read down my little list I made as we're talking here. All the things since 10 days ago that we that have happened is this virus has exploded in a lot of our country. And we are in a little bubble here in Western Massachusetts. Our not has gone from 0.7 to over one in our state, our state, which is doing really well. In Israel, it's exploded in the schools. In the UK, it's exploded in the schools. It's exploding in daycares across Texas. YMCA camps for kids ages 17, seven to 15 are closing in Georgia. And I hope it doesn't explode here, but we're gonna be welcoming college students back. And we need to be respectful of, of what this is going on. So this idea of fitting as many kids as possible in the first few weeks of September just doesn't make sense to me. I want kids to have time with their teachers. I want teachers to have time with their kids. I'm not trying to say they need to stay home, but when tents were first suggested, I didn't necessarily see all this learning going on under them. I agree with what people are saying. I feel like the thing that a lot of kids really missed out was socialization. And that's a place where maybe in second grade, you show up and you play kickball under the tent or in the yard with your teachers and don't and keep your distance. And maybe in high school, you sit around and have your forum. And the teachers talk to you about, this is the work you're gonna do on your own when you go home where we're separated more. And I just would really encourage a scenario where kids are in school, fewer hours, fewer kids. Um, I don't see how the teachers can possibly pull off um, some of what we're asking them to do. So I'm just really encouraging us to take a step back. We can always ramp the school year up, but let's keep our community healthy um, to start it. And um, I guess I'll just leave it by saying, I think the teachers need to give more input into what this looks like. Um, and I really think we need to ramp it, to slow it down and not try to fit as many kids as we think we can possibly fit each day in our spaces. Thank you, Member Voss. Um, Member Fallon? Thanks. Um, I do want to, so I just do want to say that I, <laughs> I actually agree that our all-in model, um, the, at the point at which we're comfortable enough at moving to an all-in model, um, I actually do think that, you know, having the six-foot distance um, I would feel comfortable with. I understand this desire for full day kindergarten, but I do want to say that it's half day, but it's with really, really small class sizes. And so I feel like that does balance it out. And if it's kindergartners who are also then wearing face masks, like I do wonder if um, the small class sizes um, would in fact make up for it. So I would like to hear from kindergartners uh, families and from the teachers, I, I think the half day model may be appropriate based on such small class sizes when we're talking about the all in model. So I actually am fairly comfortable with if we are told we have to all get back to school, um, that that model is as close, that's as good as it's going to get. So I do concur with that. I want to express my concern with the um, the hybrid model, the, the one thing we haven't talked about, and I just, I really want, so two things we haven't talked about. One is, and this is partly on me, um, I remember from the very first time we talked about it was 
really pushing to have the sixth graders um, be part of the not be all remote. Um, and since then, I know we've heard from a lot of sixth grade teachers saying, please put us with our colleagues when you're doing the planning to with seventh and eighth graders, rather than putting us on the K through five model. And so I do, I do want to recognize that depending on which model we go to, that there's clearly a very strong preference for them to remain with their colleagues and that that was important to them. I think that um, when I initially voiced the objection to having the sixth graders be, it was because we were considering scenario two and it was seventh through 12th was all remote. And I was really reluctant to have the sixth grade start out all remote. I think as long as there is some in-person time um, for sixth grade, that, that that is actually okay. And I really want to defer to the sixth grade teachers if they feel like that is a valuable resource to be in the building with their colleagues, because I do wonder if by having the sixth graders in only two days a week, that that would reduce the number of tents that we'd need to use um, in the way that Dr. Provost was saying um, he'd like to do. So, so that was one thing. And then I, it's very much weighing upon me when we look at the model that you've presented that we're talking about having the high schoolers in um, so many days a week. And I just, the fact that we're not providing transportation to seventh through 12th grade at all, I'm not sure that the community understands that is weighing very heavily on me. And so when we initially made that decision, I think we were really leaning heavily towards that seventh through 12th grade was going to be remote. And so transportation wasn't going to be an issue. Um, I think that um, I would really like to say if we're going to, and we, we've said we really want them to have some in-person instruction um, at the seventh through 12th grade level. Um, but I think that maybe one or two days, and I would really like the district to help facilitate car, carpooling whether it's through the PTOs setting up uh, like a, some sort of a bulletin board where you could you know, post that you need rides in the morning or the afternoon. But I really think it's important that we um, don't cause even more inequities by um, having students going in every day, but you know, good luck trying to get to and from, especially when the people that you normally carpool with are in a different group than you are. You know, They're in group A, you're in group B, and so, um, I just want to say that I am very cognizant of the hardship that we're going to be causing a lot of families if we go to a model where they're in every day with no transportation and we've divided them into various groups. So I really would have a stronger preference for a remote model that only goes in um, one or two days a week for the middle and high school. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Member Gold. Um, I just want to um, to share that in regards to Member Biscansky brought up uh, the double session that potentially I might have discussed in, at the last meeting. And I just want to clarify that it wasn't having Group A come in the morning and Group B come in the afternoon. Um, it was Group A come in the morning and then Group B is remote in the afternoon. So the teacher actually interacts with them online. So I just wanted to clarify what that that plan was and sort of along the lines of what member Voss was saying, like in terms of starting slow, I think um, if I'm not mistaken, um, at one point early on, we had the capacity for 50% of the students, like, right? Like we could do 10 feet, sorry, six, we had 10 students, six feet apart. We can get 50% of our students in. So I kind of think we should just simplify things and to, as a suggestion and just do an A and a B and just start there and whatever we can scale up we can scale up but if we just split it into an a and a b and and there's some sort of rotation where it's two a's in a row um and then two b's in a row or if it's even two a's in a row i'll tell you um something that was presented to me at my school in springfield is they're looking at two a's in a row day off for students but teachers come in for professional development on wednesday while the room is being cleaned and then two b's in a row um, and those are full day events. So um, I just think it makes it so the kid, you know, it, it just cuts everything in half and it simplifies it. And so I'd really encourage us looking at something like that. Um, and um, hopefully we can uh, get somewhere tonight. 
Thank you, Member Gold. Uh, Member Levy. Thanks. Member Busanski actually said a lot of what I was thinking. So thank you. Um, I agree with a lot of what my colleagues have said. I guess, um, Superintendent, just to keep this brief, um, I too was confused about that, that scenario where the high schoolers would be there four days a week. And so my ask would be if we could see something in writing that spells out what that looks like, what that scenario looks like. Um, how many students are we talking about? What are the, again, like, is it really at six feet? If so, what does that look like? So if we could get that in writing, that, that would be my ask for us to be able to move forward. And I agree that um, perhaps that's sort of our, that's one option for hybrid if it, if it pans out. And then the other option may be uh, um, sort of simplifying a little bit more um, as, as my colleagues have, have said. Thank you, Member Levy. Did you wanna say anything, Dr. Prevost? We, I wanna call on uh, Member Goldman in a second, but. Uh, no, I, I think that's clear. Okay, thank you. Um, Member Goldman. Thank you. Um, many of my questions have been asked by my colleagues. Um, couple things I want to highlight is um, I also would appreciate um, creating a wit, creating schedules that um, sort of work together a little bit if possible um, in an effort to prioritize being flexible so that we when we sh when we're shifting from hybrid to all in uh oh now we're all remote now back to hybrid when we're moving throughout the next many months from one model to the next based on the behavior of the virus and our community's health, um, that we're able to do that with some ease so that, um, and so that would be something like keeping pre-K through five in the elementary schools and the junior high and JFK and the high school students in the high school. I don't know if that's possible, but just sort of so that the students have some continuity with like, this is my teacher and this is my school and this is my guidance you know, these are the people I'm seeing when I'm in school with the hybrid or the full person. Um, and so when I'm going remote, I'm seeing those same people because there's some consistency as we're shifting from one model to the next as needed in the next many, many months throughout the fall and winter maybe. And the other thing uh, I'm very concerned about is the new meeting the nutritional needs of our students, um, looking at the in-person, which seems seems good uh, just you know looking at the socially the when, when lunch the timing for the lunches and I'm also wondering about um, breakfast for all the students that's been provided before would that be like a bagged breakfast that they go home with for the next morning or something like this but I just want to really make sure with everyone with so much change so much new just starting a new school year never mind under these conditions I just want to make sure that our kids are are supplied with the energy they need um, to remain calm and focused as, as much as one can expect. Thank you. Thank you. That, that is a shared concern for me as well. One of the big challenges around nutrition right now is we know we can't feed students in the cafeteria. That's been clear from every, every bit of communication we've gotten from the state. And so trying to find a way that addresses the, the need for providing students with nutrition and the fact that you can't use the cafeteria to do that is what put us to some, what I would consider to be suboptimal -op options like bag lunch. Um, we are also considering lunch and breakfast in the classroom, but then that, that creates another set of issues as well. But we may end up there. Okay. so. Um... All the school committee members, I don't see any school committee members' hands. I, again, see um, some community members, and I just want to apologize and say that the rules prohibit us from recognizing members of the public. So um, please share your thoughts and opinions to us uh, beginning tomorrow via email or phone or what have you. But um, the time during school committee meetings to recognize members of the public is during public session or to get on the agenda. 
Um, so Dr. Provost, I would ask you, um, I see that member Bizanski is here, but let me at least ask my question. Um, is, can, you know, hypothetically, would it, would it be helpful and within open meeting law for you to maybe come back to us with some of these questions and concerns folks raise into a new model that you can share with us and we could respond individually via email um, in ahead of our next meeting, which may, I'm assuming would be, have to be scheduled before August. I'm just wondering how to continue the conversation um, and give you the feedback that you need from us uh, above and beyond just scheduling a meeting. Can we do that? And do you think that would be helpful? In other words, we correspond to individual members via email. Uh, there is a, there is somewhat of a danger of serial deliberation in that in that model. Um, so I, I would I would be a little bit leery of that. I would feel more comfortable working with a group of less than um, less than a quorum um, between now and the next meeting. Okay, I, mean, I, I guess I would suggest that you think this through and come back to us with something that you feel in terms of a process would work well for you given the deadlines that you have and what, what else. Um, but as I said, I think twice already in the next meeting is April 13th. And at some point before we end tonight, we probably need to discuss whether we're gonna add an, another meeting. Um, but if you can, Dr. Provost, if you could maybe sleep on this and think about how we could get to a point where you can meet all of your um, legal requirements with the state, but more so get us to a, um, a point that you're getting as much information as you can. Um, I, I personally would appreciate that. Well, I, I do think we're gonna need another meeting because yeah. this is an issue that I think is squarely within the purview of the school committee. You know, there, there's, there's a question about whether it's the Department of Education or whether it's the school committee that's going to implement the actual model but i don't think there's any question that the school committee needs to approve the three models that that we are potentially in play for the district so i think we do need an affirmative vote on that um so i think i think get, getting another meeting in august would be imperative and we could do something you know i can think about a way to do a process of having communication that doesn't violate open meeting law prior to that Okay, um, two more members, hands are raised. Member Buzaski. All right, well, I was just wondering if um, maybe we're, it does kind of feel like we're hearing some uh, themes emerge among all the different schools. I, I feel like we're in more agreement than we've been in uh, in general, than we maybe, we've been a little bit more all over the map. Um, so maybe that's the good news of this, right? That you gave us this more extreme model. And I feel like what we're hearing is everybody wants to go back to kind of that middle place for seven through 12, especially, um, and fewer kids in the elementary school that maybe what I, I, that's what I feel like I'm hearing is that four days a week is probably enough for pre-K through five with a hope for full day kindergarten, but maybe that's not realistic, I, but I hear there's a little, uh, disagreement and then six through 12, uh, trying to get kids in, I would say two days a week. Um, and maybe that model of splitting the school. So some kids are in on Monday, Tuesday, some Thursday, Friday, and Wednesday is used for other things. Um, so I don't that's know, what I'm do you feel like I'm hearing? Do you feel like that's what you're hearing, Dr. Provost? Yeah, I'm hearing backtrack a little bit to some of the previous models and simplify as much as possible. Yeah. So maybe this will just get us to that hybrid model faster is what I'm hopeful about. Finally, maybe, maybe we're in the home stretch. Okay, that's all, thank you. Thank you, and uh, Member Voss? Yeah, I'd just like to support that and say, I think we absolutely need another meeting. Um, this is the most important thing our committee is taking up and um, it's not an easy time to be a superintendent or on a school committee and it's, we're going to all have to give a little extra. This is talking it through, finding the best we can find soon. Um, I feel pretty strongly, and I don't know how others feel, that it would be really smart 
to have a hybrid model that grows. And so the first week or two of school start slow. The teachers are being asked to do things they've never done before. And if you made four groups, let's call them A, B, C, D, guidance at the high school has four groups. You can easily combine them into 50% each, but I would like to propose if others disagree, please say so. I don't wanna be the one to send them down the wrong path, but the first couple of weeks, we go back in smaller groups and let parents know this is part of the transition. Um, and if the virus doesn't take off, you know, it's kind of like the reopening in Massachusetts. You start slow. If the virus doesn't take off, then maybe we can go to these groups combining and having more like 50% of the kids in each space at a given time. But I don't see us just starting on day one with a, with a plan that is so different and making it easy. Another thing I saw suggested is once we do have a plan, ask um, the superintendent and some teachers to pretend they're students and walk it through for a day and make sure that we haven't forgotten anything. So that's kind of an aside, but just in giving advice for moving forward, I really feel like we need to see another plan. What I'm hearing is let's simplify it and make it doable and Personally, I think it should be one that grows if the virus stays away in the first couple of weeks. Member Fallon. Um, thanks. It just, I, I hadn't, I, I, I don't know that this is feasible, but kind of in line with what um, Member Voss was just saying, um, I do wonder if in that same vein, um, there is some, there's some sense in, you know, kind of planning to have certain classes at particularly it works for the high school. I don't know that it would work at the middle school, but just planning on having certain classes being offered remotely and certain classes being offered online, rather than saying kids go in, you know, two days per week or whatever, like it, you know, we're not providing busing. So they don't have to necessarily go in for the entire day. They could go in for two classes or they could go in for one class and then do the rest of their classes remotely. I don't know if it would work, but I feel like it would offer more flexibility both to those families who are not comfortable sending their children into school and, and to those families who really think their kids need to be into school all day. Um, and for those teachers who say, I really am not comfortable stepping foot in the school. But I understand that when we're in school normally, that whiteboard that you keep in the principal's office to figure out class schedules and who's teaching what where is a nightmare. And so I don't know if this is remotely feasible, but I wish that it were so that there was some sort of um, option for essentially like kind of like what Member Voss was saying, people to sort of dip their toe in a little bit at a time uh, to their comfort level, both, both students and teachers. Um, but I don't know, I don't know if that's remotely feasible, but that's, those are my thoughts. Thank you, member Go. Um, so Dr. Provost, when would be the next feasible time that you could present a, a plan based on what you're hearing now? Like what's the soonest that would be available for you and can we make it work for the school committee? So I think the earliest I could do is to get you something in a packet next Friday for a meeting the following week. Okay, so then it would be like Monday or Tuesday uh, the following week, which would be um, the 20th, July 20th or 21st. Yeah. Okay, so could we just, could we, can I make a motion to, to have us see if we can do a meeting on the 20th, 21st and move on from this item? Anybody second that motion? Second. I'm not sure that. Who is that? Laura. Okay. Um, Want to repeat that motion? I, I think there was a question within the motion, Ronnie. Um, um, the motion is to um, move from this agenda item by scheduling a meeting early in the week on of the twentieth that fits with the superintendent's schedule and our schedule our schedules so we could have a quorum. I'm going to have to ask um, maybe member Serafi Cox, maybe you can help me here. Can we end? Is this the way that we could end an agenda item? 
Is this okay? If it, I don't know if it's going to. Yes, pass. it can. Uh, it can be tabled until our next meeting, and we can direct our city clerk. Uh, sorry, our school committee clerk to schedule another meeting. Is is that is that language okay with you, Member Gold? Uh, yeah. Yes, whichever language makes this happen. This so time. it sounds like the motion is to table this discussion until the next meeting and have the clerk schedule that next meeting. Yes. And. That's the motion now, just to clarify, that was seconded by somebody? Yes, Member Fallon. Member Fallon, and can I have a vote, please? We don't get to discuss. We do. I believe we do, yeah, sorry. Yes, it ha uh, <laughs> unless there's a vote to shut down discussion. Okay. There's this discussion. discussion, thank you, thank you, okay. So this discussion is strictly about the motion, not about, right? We're discussing Correct. the motion. The motion on the floor is to table. Yeah. Member Levy. Okay, well that makes me wonder whether I'm allowed to say what I wanna say which is that I am in favor of the motion as long as it's clear. I, I, the conversation about let's start slowly and then build, I think I just wanna make sure it's clear that we still need to have a plan in mind that we're building towards. And so I just wanna make sure the superintendent has what you need in order to build that plan. Like, I feel like we're going in lots of directions now with lots of different ideas and I want to I, I do think there was some consensus on what what we are hoping I think what we want to see in that next plan and even if we build up to that next plan slowly we still need that plan so just want to make sure there's clarity on that Dr. Provost do you want to respond to that question that was my understanding but maybe it would be good to just check to make sure that that's everyone else's understanding Member Brzezanski? Yeah, I had this similar concern to Member Levy. I just want to be sure that, that Dr. Provost has some clear instruction from us. Otherwise, I think we're just going to be back to, I, and I completely agree with tabling this to the to a meeting in a week and a half or whatever, two weeks. Um, but it does seem like we kind of, a couple ideas were just thrown out at the last moment, sort of this idea of, you know, kids coming in for one class at the high school and leaving for another, or uh, which I don't know that that's really realistic. So I just kind of want to make sure we haven't like kind of muddied the waters. Um, and I think uh, I agree with member Levy, if we just have, if we need to come up with a hybrid plan, we could talk about then scaling up to that hybrid plan, like what member Voss said. Um, so, but I guess that's sort of a question for you, Dr. Provost, if you if you feel clear on what's come out of this discussion. I think I think there's enough clarity. I think it's it's along the lines of what we had discussed earlier about trying to scale back towards some of the earlier models, trying to simplify as much as possible. We can, it, as I mentioned last time, there is there is a a. a theory of ramping up that's kind of implicit in some of what I was sharing last week that I could just make more explicit. Um, but And also I think I have some guidelines around what we're looking for for elementary and secondary in terms of minimum number of days. So I think I think I can work with that. Okay. Okay, and I think I need to be a little bit of a stickler and get back to the motion. So um, are there any other comments regarding the motion before we take a vote? The motion again being to table this discussion and have a separate meeting and uh, schedule another meeting. Member Goldman. Thank you. Does this mean that or would we vote on both the in person and the hybrid meeting at the next special meeting or were we going to vote about the in person now and the hybrid later? The, as a as the amendment, uh, or sorry, as the motion currently stands, we would table the entirety of okay. it. Uh, but if you would like to offer a friendly amendment to member gold, then to, to just table part of it and then take a vote on that one that one part, that is something you can do. Um, well, it was suggested earlier we might vote for one and not the other, and that wasn't really discussed. So I just want to have clarity that it was for both. Um, 
And would Dr. Provost be including uh, committee members less than quorum in the preparation of the new yeah. models? Yeah, Dr. Provost, is that something you wanted to entertain? How did you want to handle that? I know that was an idea. Did you get feedback on that? Do you, how do you want to handle I, it? I, I just, I guess I wanted to be clear that I couldn't consult with everyone because I think that would be a pretty clear violation of the open meeting law. Yeah. Could you, um, what I'm hearing is just making sure that you've heard all the feedback. Is it possible? Um, I know you can't provide us with a full plan for a while, but is it possible you can just sketch out, this is what you heard and this is the direction you've you've understood as you develop your next iteration of the plan and then get some feedback that way. I'm just looking for an in-between phase to make sure that, um, that you heard us clearly. This was a very, very detailed discussion with lots of different opinions. So um, is that something you can do? Uh, again, I don't know if I can do it with more than a quorum because- No, I mean, send issue. out like an email. This is what I heard. Oh, I see what you're saying, sorry, okay. Never mind. Member Voss. Member Voss. Um, two th yeah, two things. If Dr. Uh, Provost thinks he needs more feedback, I would actually prefer to just schedule a meeting. And if people don't have time next week to attend it, if, as long as we have a quorum, it's OK. If he wants more feedback, I think that would be a very reasonable thing to do. As I said, this is a huge deal. And the other thing I just wanted to make clear is um, just to be very clear, like you're asking us to be, I really, when we hear the next plan and are asked to vote on it, I want to hear that teachers think it's doable because going back to what member gold was saying, like if you teach in the morning and you're remote in the afternoon, that's a really long day and you can't be teaching and being remote and not having any planning time in your day. So I just want, I want to be convinced that whatever we're proposing is reasonable. We're in, this is a marathon, not a sprint, and we need to really support everybody involved. Thank you. Um, Annie, can you take a vote please on the motion? Member Levy? Yes. Member Kaufman? Yes. Member Goldman? Yes. Member Voss? Yes. Member Gold? Yep, yes. Member Busansky? Oh, sorry, yes. <laughs> Member Fallon? Yes. Member Serafi Cox? Yes. And Member Condon. Yes. The vote is nine in favor. Thank you. So um, looking at the big picture here, um, we just finished item, agenda item three or C out of 12, uh, at which point then we are gonna schedule to go to executive session. So it is now seven, according to my clock, it's seven minutes to 11. I think this is, um, there are some items here that probably would be quick, but rather than starting, I would propose that um, we make a decision as to the pleasure of the school committee as to how um, we, we want to um, go past 11, which will require a motion if that's what people want. And then we, uh, in the past, we've prioritized and sent things to the following meeting. Um, I think I would invite and certainly uh, appreciate any specific plans that we can maybe rally around? Member Voss? Um, I would like to propose that we go past 11 and address the resolutions that are on the agenda and then go into executive session unless there's something else that Dr. Provost thinks is urgent for this meeting. But I, I don't wanna lose track of the resolutions. Some of them seem very timely. Member Goldman. Yeah, I'd like to advocate for covering item H to vote on the donation for Valley Masks because we have a guest presenting that item tonight. I'm sorry, because you have, we, I didn't hear that last part. 
because we have a guest presenting that item this evening. Yes, thank you. Dr. Prevos? I'd like to get clarity on the refund of transportation because there are people waiting um, on, on the district for um, personal funds for that. Okay, so what I'm hearing, let me see if I can do this. What I'm hearing is a proposal or maybe a member will also make a motion if it's, I'm hearing this right, to go past 11 and to... Would you like me to make a motion? No, let me just make sure. Um, do, you, do, you have the, the, do you have the things in mind? Yes, please, then thank you. Yeah. Okay, let me just get that window up. Okay, um, I, I'd like to make a motion to cover um, agenda items F, which is a vote on the moratorium on MCAS testing resolution, G, uh, a vote on the resolution banning the use of student resource officers in Northampton Public Schools, and H, the vote on the donation of the Valley masks, and also to, um, I'm not sure where it is, but whatever item goes with offering feedback. I. Which one? I think it's I. Thank you. And I uh, vote for refunding the trans or the transportation refund clarification. And at that point to postpone the rest of the items and to go in to executive session. And if I missed anything, I would welcome a friendly amendment. Can I, can I just ask when you're saying postpone them when you're postponing them too, I just, I do want to point out that the collaborative for educational services is it's a state law that I report five times a year. And I don't think I've reported in since a lot of you were on the committee. Make, um, make a friendly it, amendment. Okay, well, no, I'm fine. I'm fine if it gets pushed off, but I'd like it to be pushed off then till the next meeting. It's a two minute report, but I, I, I you know, I'm a rule follower. Okay. Yes, if, if, if uh, my understanding is that if we, that that's part of member Voss's motion is to delay everything else to the next meeting. Is that your motion member Voss? But the new next meeting, the July meeting or to the August meeting? I can clarify, let's say <laughs> August since we have this very big thing on our plate in July and we're adding a meeting for that. So August, but if this is important and quick, I would, Welcome a friendly amendment if it's really just two minutes. Let's add it. Okay, it really it really is, and it and it's important so, and quick. Let's add that item to the list. Item. Understand it. There's a motion to. Well, the way I understand it, there's a motion to move the uh, school committee meeting past eleven o'clock, to uh, continue to entertain items F, G, H, I, and J. Um, at which point we will um, then move into executive session while the rest of the items will be uh, moved to our August meeting. Is that correct, Member Ross? That's correct. Okay. Um, anybody second that motion? Second, second that motion. Member Serafi Cox, I heard first, correct? And, sure. um, and um, can we please have a vote, uh, Annie? No discussion there. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Did that again. If anybody wants to go down the hall, down the block, and get um, Mayor Narkowitz at this point, I would not object. <laughs> You're doing great. Member doing. Gold. Um, Member Voss, could you speak to if, how realistic do you think it is that we're going to get through those items in a reasonable time this evening still? Um, I, I guess I don't know, but why don't I just say if it turns into not reasonable, why don't you make a motion to um, move them to August? Let's try. I'm hoping they're all not that long. Member Gold, did you have our, uh, anything you wanted to add? Um, no, I was. I was I just the discussion part there. I don't, yeah. Just want okay. to those. Um, any other comments regarding the motion? Thank you. Um, 
Annie? Member Kaufman? Yes. Member Goldman? Yes. Member Voss? Yes. Member Gold? Uh, no. Member Busansky? Yes. Member Fallon? Yes. Member Serafie Cox? Yes. Yeah. Member Condon? Yes. And Member Levy? Yes. The vote is eight in favor, one against. Okay. So it's 11 o'clock now. We have um, received enough votes to move forward and I will call on uh, Member Fallon to discuss item F, a vote on a mem mem moratorium on, MC on MCAS testing resolution. Yeah, so I'm not even gonna read the resolution. Um, most of you, you should all have it and have read it. I will just frame it for you in that um, this resolution um, is sort of a hybrid. It, uh, the res uh, there was a resolution brought to us on the MASC resolution committee. Um, it also got passed last night at the board of directors meeting. So we'll come to you at the delegate assembly, um, whoever we elect to vote for us. Um, and that will cut off um, right before the last paragraph asking that um, the students of the class of 2022 who missed their 10th grade MCAS testing um, not be required to make it up this year or ever, um, and that they be held harmless for not taking the MCAS and that their graduation requirements be determined by locally controlled voices of the school committee um, within the requirements of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, and additionally, uh, it calls upon the Commissioner of Elementary and Secondary Education to submit to the US Department of Education a request that this um, MCAS be um, assessment, accountability, and reporting requirements um, under the ES. EA be waived for the 2021 school year at a bare minimum. So that language is included because I was hoping to get the sense of the committee and not have to come back to you in October. Um, and then additionally, um, uh, we had constituents ask that we um, pass a resolution in support of uh, Senate Bill 2986, which was filed by Senator Comerford. Um, and House Bill 5139, um, which is identical. The difference is that um, the House Bill calls for a three-year moratorium on the administration of all MCAS tests um, and forbids the use of any standardized tests to make high stakes decisions. Um, and the Senate bill calls for a four-year moratorium. Otherwise, they're almost identical. They call for a special commission um, and um, and, and uh, ask for, 20, uh, for 25 different districts uh, to um, examine, essentially examine ways um, that we could improve assessments. Um, and so the House bill has currently been referred to the House, the Committee on House Rules, that's where it is right now, um, as of June 30th. Today, the Senate bill was referred to the Committee on Education. The reason we would bring this to as a resolution is for advocacy. So to get the House, the Ed Committee on Education to take this up, to schedule hearings for it, we would want to send them a letter saying that the Northampton School Committee's Committee supports this legislation. I'll be completely honest. I know that some of you are not gonna support this and that's okay. We don't have to all agree, but I will move uh, to, I 100% support it. So I would move to, um, support uh, the resolution relative to MCAS and high stakes testing. I'll second it. Okay, thank you, Member Fallon made the motion. Member Voss seconded it. Uh, any discussion on this item? Member Gold? Okay. Um, all right, so I greatly appreciate this resolution has been brought before us um, as it provides the opportunity for a vital discussion about what MCAS is and what are the valuable aspects about MCAS and where MCAS is falling short. Uh, from my point of view, this resolution and the associated bills would be a step backwards for our community and state. And I would be voting no on this resolution for the following three reasons. Um, one, uh, MCAS is a vital tool for the state and our local communities to ensure all students 
have an equitable opportunity to learn. Um, MCASH ensures that regardless of a student's zip code, their school will be held to a minimum expectation of instruction. And parents and schools can know how the instruction students are receiving compares to all other districts. Two, MCAS is the only statewide tool we have now to assess the impact of this pandemic and that has had on students with learning disabilities, students with lower socioeconomic status, ELL students, and students who have been historically marginalized. It's the only tool we have for that statewide assessment um, of, the, of those students' abilities at this current stage. Um, MCAS clearly needs reform and improvements and has undergone many reform improvements over the years, but uh, the reform and improvements can be made without a moratorium. Um, for example, a couple of years ago, uh, there was a park assessment for those of you who might know, it was a different test they were moving away from MCAS and they didn't get rid of the park assessment, they just made it so that schools weren't held liable for it. And um, if that's the correct word or not. Um, but it basically made it so that the school's rating wouldn't change and um, it was a sort of like a neutral year, but we were still using the assessment. And so um, I encourage my fellow school committee members to ensure that they fully understand the state accountability system and what role MCAS plays in this system and what the data this system provides tells us about the Northampton Public Schools, its progress, its successes, and its areas of needed improvement prior to voting on a resolution that could have such a huge impact on our students, schools, and on the essential goal of ensuring all students receive an equitable education. Um, um, Annie emailed out a document um, that I put together to share with all of you that shows the accountability data for each of our schools. Um, there are some vitally important numbers in there that have a, give us a lot of information about the progress in Northampton. And a yes vote would mean resolution and associated bills. Specifically, I'd like to make a motion to postpone this discussion until after our, our October student success meeting. That meeting usually focuses on MCAS results from the previous year, which this year there won't be any since MCAS wasn't taken due to the pandemic. And so we could use this meeting to better understand the accountability system and the bill's implications, and then vote on this bill in a school committee meeting following our October meeting. I'll second that motion. Thank you. So that was a motion by Member Gold and seconded by um, Member Condon. And I would like to open the floor to discussion on the motion. Member Sarah Cox. I just want to say that I'm opposed to the motion and I'm in favor of the resolution. Okay, um, here we go. Member Fallon, sorry. Member Fallon. I don't think she has her hand up. Oh, sorry. Um, I just is it, I just want to say I I still very much support this resolution. I I think that particularly in light of the pandemic, when uh, resources, very valuable resources within the building would be used for testing in the spring. I, I can't really wrap my head around the time and money that we would spend on testing um, when students need services now more than ever. Um, doesn't make sense to me to hold our students responsible for passing the MCAS to graduate when they have had to deal with um, remote learning. And we've already heard about um, from one of our public comments tonight about um, how the COVID-19 is affecting, um, disproportionately affecting students um, who have been historically marginalized. Um, I, I just, I can't, I can't fathom how, how we think that it's appropriate to require students to pass the MCAS to graduate during a pandemic. I don't understand why we would spend money and divert resources to standardized testing during a pandemic. And I don't understand when we're making statements committing to be anti-racist. Um, and we know, I mean, even just last year with the um, you know, question that was thrown out from 2019 asking students to personify an openly racist character um, in the Underground Railroad novel or um, 
even just culturally biased quest questions, asking students to describe a memorable snow day, um, which really was problematic for students who had recently, um, who are recent immigrants from Caribbean nations, um, or even just the fact that tests often depend on those questions, which assume background knowledge that's often held by my, white middle-class students in order to create a wide range of scores. Um, I think we all agree that there's racial bias in standardized testing, and I think there are better ways, the use of portfolios or capstone projects um, that perhaps could foster a positive exploration of identity and encourage a growth mindset rather than reinforcing a racial achievement gap. Um, I think the question of direct and immediate feedback to achieve proficiency rather than waiting six months to get results is important. Um, and then research that's shown the stereotype threat and demonstrated that the fear of confirming a stereotype of inferiority creates stress and anxiety that contribute to poor test performance. Um, so I support that, but I also hear what you're saying. I'm happy to advocate for this resolution on my own as an individual. Um, and I'm also happy to discuss the MCAS data and results um, and educate, every, you know, learn with everyone more about the accountability system. I certainly attended plenty of professional development when they introduced the new accountability system. I understand that it's valuable information we received, but I also think that there is a better way forward for our students and for our schools. And I think now would be a great time to, um, to explore that way. So I, um, I'm a little uh, concerned that we're dealing, we're discussing the motion as opposed, uh, we're discussing the original motion as opposed to the motion that uh, member Gold brought up. Once again, I would ask for your help here, member Serafi Cox, of which you've been a tremendous help tonight. Can you give me any guidance on this? I mean, the discussion is about the motion on the floor, which is to table and discussion about whether or not this is something that we want to do now is germane. Um, that's, I guess, all I would say. So your, in your opinion, it's okay to discuss both motions simultaneously? Is that what you mean? Or is it no, no, it's whether or not we want to delay the motion and you could talk about the important, how important or timely of, uh, sorry, the resolution. You could talk about how important or timely the resolution is, et cetera, which I heard member Fallon doing. So, do we have any other comments on Member Gold's motion? And is that the order we do things, Member Serafi Cox? I'm sorry, ask we your vote, question again? <laughs> we vote on Member Gold's motion first, is that right? Correct. Thank you. Um, Member Gold. Um, I would just ask my colleagues um, what mechanism will we have statewide to ensure at the end of this year of the pandemic, the, the, the first year back since this pandemic, to assess how districts are dealing with the instructional needs of students statewide. If we don't have an MCAS test, there's zero data that's going to be available for us to provide uniformly a standardized way to say, certain districts have higher needs right now than other districts, right? Like that there's certain situations that we won't be able to discuss because we could say hypothetically what it is, but without actual data, how can we do that? We can make, an, we can come up with after October, a revised resolution or minimum that says, you know, that just high school kids won't be um, held accountable or there's so many things that we can do once we understand the data, but when we look at the data and we see what it says, and then we understand that we're going to probably need that if we want to advocate for equitable resources from the state. Um, I would just wonder what what other re what other tool or mechanism would we have as a school committee to advocate for that? And so, I mean, if someone could help me understand that, that'd be appreciated. Member Voss? Um, i just like to say, I we're in a pandemic and I'm at the point where I would like to vote on this, on the, what, um, so, so I don't have an answer for you, but I also think 
there's so much our teachers are going to need to assess for our kids and I'm not worried about right now in the pandemic. Um, I, I, I support what member Fallon already said I think she said it better than I can say it right now, but I'd like to vote on this amendment. Okay, um, you see this, these two these two motions in my mind are getting blurred so I'll, I'll call on myself. Um, sorry, I see member Fallon might have beaten me to the punch. Do you want to speak first, member Fallon? No, I was just, I just wanted clarification if it was the entire resolution that was problematic for member Gold. Um, so let me open it up. Uh, certainly the four-year moratorium, uh, part, the bill, the final the legislation 2986, um, that that part is certainly problematic, um, and um, the before I guess before yeah I guess that for me it's it's too challenging to um, think about changes to the graduation requirement without understanding um, fully what the implications would be. So I, I feel like yes, I mean throughout it. Um, I mean, I'd be open to adjustments to it, to the resolution, I can't, you know, but I don't see where, you know, the amount of work it would take to make it worth uh, something that I would be able to, to vote for. Um, I don't know if we have the time now for that, but I'm open if anyone has a direct suggestion. Did I answer the, your question, Ms. Fallon? I forget, Member Fallon, I'm not sure. Yeah, I was, I was just wondering if there was okay. a way to get this through in a modified way. Not hearing any further conversation and without any hands up, I'll call on myself. Um, I respectfully disagree with the approach contained in both the resolution put forth by Member Fallon and Senator Comerford's bill. This is just as a side, this is probably the first time I've disagreed with Senator Comerford. As I've stated multiple times, how fortunate I feel our community is to have both Senator Comerford and Representative Sabadosa working on our behalf. Admittedly, I've not seen the House bill, so I can't comment on that. Um, and most of my quick comments, they're not lengthy here, have to do with the bill itself, as opposed to Member Fallon's um, um, additional comments, additional uh, pieces of the resolution. But ironically, I do support some aspects of the bill itself, um, including reassessing whether achieving competency on the MCAS should be required as a condition of high school graduation. I also am not sure if it's necessary or even makes any sense for the MCAS to be used as part of an educator's evaluation. Um, these may certainly not be necessary and may not be, um, and may in fact be doing more harm than good. But I do certainly believe that the positive benefits and value of the MCAS of, of mass ed reform has brought to our system, that has brought to our system um, far outweighs the negatives. And one component of mass ed reform is the MCAS. I don't think you can take the MCAS away and not have mass ed reform. It makes, it makes no sense to me. Uh, I am deeply concerned that ending the MCAS even for four years runs way too high a risk of leading to children being educated in a dual system of expectations because that's exactly what we had before the MCAS. And that's exactly what we had in the three other states that I worked in, New York, California um, and Vermont. I'm sure they don't do that now, but the MCAS more than anything has evolved into having high expectations for all kids. Um, I am concerned about kids graduating now with lower skills without the MCAS, graduating with lower skills than their older peers did. And frankly, I'm most concerned with the kids just being ignored. Um, I mentioned this and I'm off track here, but I've mentioned this to various people in my career of visiting and working in schools for over 30 years now. Um, it's like night and day to what I used to see with kids with disabilities predominantly, but also low income kids, kids in gangs in San Diego, um, kids that were troublemakers per se. These kids had very low quality teachers, often not certified, often um, brand new teachers, often with the most troubled and the principal would strictly assign those kids that needed us the most, the worst teachers. 
that does not happen anymore. The quality of education has improved greatly. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that schools are accountable. I know there's a great downside to that, but there's nothing that thrills me more than going into the Boston schools where I just came out of, or the Quincy schools that I just came out of, or, um, um, uh, well, some, a couple of local schools, I don't want to mention them, to go into every single classroom and observe the high level of quality and the dedication of the teachers to all kids. I am unbelievably afraid if we take away the MCAS and the accountability system and we don't make sure that, ki that, that teachers and principals are focused on every kid, we're going to return to a dual or triple or quadruple tracked system of expectations. I can't support that. Um, I will say since the MCAS, since mass ed reform began and since the MCAS has been in place, I think many positive outcomes without question have been achieved, including thousands of more students graduating from high school than before from all subgroups, period. Um, especially those groups of the most vulnerable populations. I looked at the data today, it's very, very clear. Graduation rates are up dropout rates are down, and I don't think anybody can dispute that the high school diploma the kids receive today are at a standard much higher than they were before mass ed reform. Um, we now know that the diploma is so meaningful that students that achieve the competency de determination and the local requirements, we know that that means they've received, a they have accomplished the same level of academic rigor as required to pass the NPASS for students in Weston and Wellesley and Concord and every other district in the state. Um, so I do believe all of our students, in particular low-income students, our students on IEPs, our students who are now learning the English language, are all receiving much better quality of education than before the MCAS. And I believe um, this is because I've seen it. It's all I can say. I've been in hundreds of classrooms. I've, I've been a teacher, I've been a counselor. I've worked in schools, I've worked with kids with special needs, I've worked with the poorest, most vulnerable kids you can imagine. I have visited their families. Um, there's nothing that, that I value more than hearing from folks that finally my kid is being uh, attended to. And I think that's because of this system. Um, so I cannot support the, support the bill, not while I'm seeing vastly improved teaching and learning and outcomes for so many students. I do encourage Senator Comfort, Summer, Senator Comerford, though, to seek another path, one that ensures that students are given the extra instructional time and resources to make up for the classroom time they lost when our schools closed last spring. If we can't work out ways to ensure all of our students are taught the curriculum that they missed out on, uh, we should all be mostly disturbed by that. And uh, I do believe that eliminating the MCAS would certainly give schools permission to not to move in that direction. So that's my biggest concern with member of Fallon's idea is I, I'd rather put out time and effort towards find, figuring out ways that kids are taught the skills and knowledge that they missed, as opposed to um, giving, I, I hate to say it, giving, giving districts an out that they don't have to worry about that. So I would prefer if, I, if our legislative leadership gave us the money and funds and strategies to do that. Thank you. And member, Gold's hand is up. Um, thank you for your comments, uh, Member Kaufman. Um, I guess I just want to ask um, the new members of our com committee um, if you feel like, um, I guess what I'm trying to understand is, do you feel like you understand and the MCAS data and the valuable information we get from it well enough to vote tonight? I do feel like you have a, a, str a strong enough understanding to, to know what the impact would be if we lost that data um, to our new members. Because um, I know it, you know, we're, we're just a couple months in here. We haven't had a, a cycle of looking at MCAS data yet with the superintendent on a deep level. And so um, I, would, I would ask that question of uh, my fellow new members. Um. So member Condon had his hand raised, but I think member Condon, did you want to respond to that question or should I call on member Serafi Cox who I'm thinking had a response to that question, but I'm not sure. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll pass for the moment. 
Okay, and am I right, Member uh, Seraphie Cox? Did you want to respond to Member Gold's question, or should I go back to Member Condon first? No, I just wanted to encourage us to move to a vote. Okay, Member Condon. Thank you. Uh, so, as an educator for 18 years, I've long railed against MCAS and criticized it, uh, how it's been employed. That being said, uh, as Member Gold mentioned, it does provide data, important data that we would not otherwise have, uh, data that does hold schools accountable. Uh, and it's, it's not the perfect system. I, I live it every year. I have, I, I have questions about it every year, but simply doing away with it without something to replace it, I think is, is not the, the best step. I, I fully support eliminating the graduation requirements. I fully support uh, creating some sort of panel or committee looking at how to reform it or other options. But the idea of completely doing away with it without something to take its place, uh, it, it bothers me a bit. Um, member Seraphie Cox, is your hand still up? Or did, uh, no, normally the mayor lowers our hands for us. Apologies, I, I, I forgot to lower my own hand. Me too, I'm sorry, I thought I did. <laughs> um, okay, I thought, member go. Uh, last thing I'll add is, um, I don't know exactly what the legislative process is with the state, but if it is helpful to move um, a meeting on the MCAS up to September or early October, um, because there won't be any data coming, I just am realizing that it was always at the end of October because that's when the state's MCAS data came. That's why the meeting was the end of October. If we could have a special meeting in September or early October, I'm okay with that amendment um, to my motion. So you're amending your own motion? I'm, I'm amending my motion to, to, as I'm thinking about it, that doesn't need to be at, at the end of October. It can be even in September. Okay. Um, can you can you possibly just repeat your motion and then we can yep. vote on that before voting on the first motion? Sure. My motion is to postpone um, deliberation and debate about this resolution until September or early October for a special meeting where we can uh, review the MCAS data um, and then either at, at that meeting even then vote on this resolution. Thank you. Um, without any hands up, let's vote on that. Member Fallon? Don't be mad. I just want to say, like, I honestly, I don't want to force, you guys have been in office for less than, what, six months? If you need the time, I hope that you'll speak up. We haven't heard from Member Levy. We haven't heard from uh, Member Goldman. So I wish I knew if you wanted the time before you voted on this. Like, I don't know how to vote without knowing what your thoughts are. Um, I don't want to say that you don't deserve the opportunity to learn more about this before we force you to vote on whether they should be abolished or not. That's all I wanted to say. Well, M Member Fallon, that's what we're voting on right now is whether or not to postpone the vote. Right. But I don't know if they vote before me or after me and they haven't said anything. <laughs> I see. Okay, so I do think it's fair for Member Fallon to re to ask if I know. I, I do think that her statement is fair to this resolution, and therefore, um, I'm going to call on Member Buzanski. Thank you. I guess um, I just want a little clarification. Maybe Member Fallon, you can provide us with um, isn't this resolution kind of is time of the essence? If we waited till September, or October, I mean, it sounds like the legislation's moving forward and this would be an advocacy tool. Um, so that's the problem is the end of the sessions coming up. If it doesn't get taken up very soon, um, then it wouldn't get taken up until January. Um, and so the way to get something taken up quickly is to advocate for it. So there's that. Um, and part two of it is we will see this. You guys will have to weigh in on it to whoever your delegate is to the delegate assembly at the October school committee meeting 
because the delegate assembly is in November and this is a resolution. So you're gonna have to give a decision by the October school committee one way or the other. Unfortunately, you, you, know, you may have the opportunity to also do advocacy around this if it doesn't get taken up by the education committee in the next few weeks because the session's ending. So, so yeah, there is urgency per se, um, but once again, if I don't wanna force the committee into it, if they're not comfortable, I, I can advocate as an individual and we can talk about it more if we need to. Okay, hey, thank you, Member. Fa uh, sorry, Member Levy. <clears throat> Thanks for the question. I do not feel like I need more time to vote. Member Goldman. Thank you. Um, I am absolutely interested in learning more about the MCAS. Um, a lot of the information I have is from conversations I had um, while campaigning, and um, I am concerned about the graduation requirement for the MCAS um, and some of the other issues that have been mentioned. Um, I don't. I don't want to table the committee's vote on this resolution. So, well, and certainly not until September, October, even until our next meeting. Might be okay, but much, but many months I don't think is helpful if the committee decides to move forward with the resolution. Um, Dr. Provost, is your, I, I, I don't see your hand raised, but your visual came up. Did you have something to add? Uh, no, I don't. I think that my phone just made a noise. Okay. <laughs> um, so without any hands up, I would ask um, um, the clerk to take a vote on member Gold's motion. Member Goldman. No. Member Voss. No. Member Gold. Yes. <laughs> Member Busansky. No. Member Fallon. No. Member Seraphie Cox. No. Member Condon. Yes. Member Levy. And Member Kaufman. Yes. The vote is seven yes, three no. I'm sorry, it's six yes, three no. I have that backwards, it's very late, I'm sorry. That's late, no problem. It's six no, three yes. Thank you for correcting that. So, uh, so the motion fails. Um, we now are back to the original motion, um, which feels like we spent a lot of time talking about it already, but um, I would ask if there's any other uh, discussion items on the original motion, which is to vote on the moratorium of, vote on the resolution uh, that member uh, Fallon shared with us. I see some hands coming up, so I'll call in order. Member Gold. Uh, yeah, I'd like to make an amendment to remove um, the last item of the resolution uh, regarding the bill, um, the the bill number two nine eight six or what have you. Okay, I'll second that. Uh, motion was made by Member Gold, seconded by Member Kaufman. Um, discussion on that? Member Buzanski? Sure. Uh, I guess I'm just curious, Member Gold, about your motion. I, I could see changing, I could see um, changing it to that we support uh, 
moratorium, uh, kind of a one, personally, I kind of feel like I could support a one year moratorium, not doing MCAS next year. I agree that, um, you know, just using all our resources in that direction in the spring where we just have so much time to make up. Um, and also the idea of, um, what are they calling it? The special commission. I really do support the special commission. I wonder if you really do want to get rid of that too, but maybe you do. Um, yeah, I mean, I thought if I understood what member Fallon submitted that it does, um, it does call for a one year, um, moratorium or pausing of MCAS, but the four years is, uh, is part of the bill. And so that's what I'm, I mean, I'm, I could support um, having the commission, but not the moratorium of part. If we can amend, I, I don't know if can we amend that final paragraph to say we support the more the commission, but not the moratorium. Um, I could support that. Okay, and you're right. It did say earlier the one year moratorium. Sorry. Right. Yeah, so that's where I was thinking. <laughs> you know what? Honestly, if it'll get us through this, if if rather than doing it, and I mean, you can we can still rather than specifically support legislation, if you can say for the last paragraph. Additionally, uh, we call for uh, the termination or that we we forbid the we. I'm, I can't think of a word. But the end um, of um, what uh, the termination, I don't, I can't think of another word of, uh, of the prohibition of, of uh, standardized tests to make high stakes decisions, et cetera, and, and all of that. And so that would get rid of the graduation requirement. Um, it would be a one year moratorium and it would be the graduation requirement would be gone and um, it would still give you the information and it would also still have the commission going forward to um, come up with better ways of, of improving assessment. I'm not sure I understand exactly. I'm sorry, I'm trying to, I'm I looking feel at feel like you're, because it sounds to me like your biggest issue is with having a four year moratorium because you believe that data is really gonna be valuable during um, particularly in light of the pandemic. And I'm saying, I think that it's crazy talk to even consider testing students next year or requiring them to take the test to graduate. But if you were to say, and so those two, those two paragraphs in the first of the resolutions, the therefore be it resolved, would give you a one-year waiver next year and the um, not would hold harmless the class of 2022. Um, and then you could also say, additionally, uh, we support legislation calling for um, the abolishment of the use of standardized tests to make high stakes decisions because it's the high stakes nature that's problematic. Um, and say that and require and asking that a special commission on the school and district evaluation system, et cetera, be formed because I feel like that's removing the parts that you have issues with, or am I mistaken? Um, so, I mean, it's a longer discussion, but I mean, for me, um, thinking that we have a minimum standard set for getting a diploma in the state of Massachusetts, I'm okay with. So, you know, maybe for one year because of the pandemic, I could see that, but although kids do have three years to pass the MCAS and there are alternative methods that districts and schools can use in case the kids still can't pass the MCAS. So there's a whole lot built in to accommodate that. That's the only high stakes portion of the MCAS test in case people didn't know that, that there's no, it's not used for teacher evaluations. It's not used um, for, um, for a promotion in any other grade. So, I mean, I guess for me, like the high stakes piece is, um, you know, I guess I, that's where, yeah, I would need a more better understanding of what we mean by high, what is the concern around high stakes there. Um, but it's really, you know, just the, the four, yeah, to not have anything at the end of this year. Uh, I mean, the state did it for those of you who don't know, the state did it about, I, uh, Dr. Provost, I don't know if you could help me out here. I, I think it was about three or four years ago where they gave the park test and they said to districts, you 
are going to be held harmless for this. Graduation is going to be, you know, like you're not going to, because we're switching tests, we're going to just use the data to inform instruction, to inform um, schools and how they're doing, but it's not going to be um, held against you as a, as a school in terms of moving your levels. Yes, I, I, you're right. I believe that was three years ago. So I'd be okay with something like that. But that, but when they were held harmless, was it still a graduation requirement? Um, I, I Dr. Graders, I'm cast. Right, yeah, so that's right, that's right. So if you, you couldn't, uh, they had to use the MCAS because the other schools were using the park, exactly. I believe um, member Voss's hand was raised next. I want to say I can appre I can appreciate both sides of this. Thank you for people who have a different perspective than what I'm bringing right now. What I'm bringing right now is we have a major pandemic going on. There's a lot of problems with offering kids support and learning, and it's not going to be fixed over one year. And I just am astonished at how much time goes into taking these tests. And if they were taken a couple times, it would be one thing. But at this point, thinking about time in school and what we're losing and the cost of these tests, it makes these other things to me, for me, that's what outweighs it. I, I don't disagree with some of the perspectives people have shared, but I'm ready to move on. So I'm going to ask if we can vote on this. I don't think we're going to resolve it by rewording it. If we could, that would be lovely. But I guess I'm going to officially call the question, which means we vote to see if we're going to vote on this. And we might decide to keep discussing it. That's fine. Um, Member Serafi Cox, I'm really sorry, but I need to know what call the question means. <laughs> it means that she wants to go to a vote. And I don't see any other hands up. So I think you could probably just move to a vote. Is okay. that an official? But calling to question, is that just her, her opinion or is that an official rule? <laughs> it, it's, it's an official rule. <laughs> um, and it, usually what it means is that it's a vote to stop discussion. But as I said, be, because I don't see any other hands up, I think you can move to a vote without needing a vote to stop discussion. I see. I so agree. I'm going to, hearing that, I'm going to call on myself because it'll probably be quicker. Um, I, did, I did hear some exciting things tonight, uh, including a lot of enthusiasm for coming up with an alternative assessment, an alternative way of uh, measuring our kids' success. Um, I just want to say that if we want to do that, I'd be the first person to sign up. And there is absolutely nothing prohibiting us from doing that. All the state does is require a minimal standard of passing. Everything else is local. So if some of the ideas that Member Fallon brought up to do a portfolio or a presentation or a uh, internship, or uh, something completely out of the box. In fact, we're already moving in that direction with a graduate with a new uh, transcript based on standards. Um, I'd be the first person to volunteer for that. So I, I don't want to wait for the state. The state's not going to require that. There have been many, many groups that have looked at alternatives to MCAS. I was one, one of them myself. Uh, I wish there was, but none of them are are doable. None of them are efficient. None of them are cost effective. Um, so I have no expectation, but I'd love for us to do it. We have every permission to do so, and I would question why we haven't given all these ideas. So with that said, oops. with that said, I'm going to call on men, Member Goldman, and um, hopefully we can have a vote. Thank you, Member Goldman. Um, is is what we're talking about right now whether or not to continue this discussion? Because I. It felt like Member Gold and Member Fallon and Member Buskansky were Buskansky or Busansky, sorry, it's really late, were uh, figuring out how to adjust it. And then the motion Member that's Foster on the you're saying stop talking about this and let's just vote on whether we support the resolution or not. Thank you, uh, Member uh, Sarafi Cox. I think you were going to clarify for us. Yes, I what I had said before was if there's no other discussion, then we can move to a, a vote. Uh, I do see Member Busansky's hand up, but after M Member Busansky speaks, if there's no other hands up, then we can move to a vote. So, move to a vote. I think Member Goldman's and put, move to a vote on what? Move to a vote on the resolution itself. 
the call to question, uh, uh, Member Kaufman, you didn't recognize and ask for a vote. You just, you, you spoke. So right. that moved it back. <laughs> True. Um, I took that. Okay. Uh, Member Buzaski? I, I just wonder what happened to Member Gold's motion on that fifth paragraph. I guess we're not voting on that. I don't know if you withdrew it or wasn't second. Sense of that motion before you can get back to the main motion. Was that motion seconded? Yes. Okay. It's not clear to me that there was clarity on the wording of exactly what you were moving to do, Member Gold. You um, wanted to strike the whole paragraph. Um. That was um, initially what I was saying. And then I believe Member Vysansky and potentially also Member Fallon were talking about adjustments to it, um, which uh, some of those I could definitely support if we just, if we said we support the um, commission component of 2986, um, I'd be comfortable with that. Amending the final paragraph to say, we support the commission to study MCAS um, as described in 2986 and only that part portion of the bill. So I don't recall, was there, is there a second to that? You were the second. Okay, I'm the second, thank you. <laughs> Any discussion on the amendment, on the motion? Member Goldman? Yeah, what about, um... I can throw my hand. And then what about the part, uh, Member Fallon, you also made an amendment to the adjustment to the language about the <clears throat> high stakes part that seemed yeah, important for you to true. hold, but letting go right, of that the was three the to four time. year piece. That, that's the part you sounded like you were releasing. Yeah, that was the, I think that was the suggestion. And I don't think that Member Gold and I are going to reach a common ground on that. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So let's um, go. Well, just to clarify, Member Fallon, I was comfortable with uh, the one year on that, uh, but not the four year part of the bill. Was, if that makes sense. But you were not comfortable with the high stakes portion of it. Um, the looking at, I'm comfortable with the uh, you mean of the of the bill or the resolution? The, the, the last paragraph. Of the last of paragraph. The resolution. Um, yeah, I'm not comfortable with uh, forbidding. I'm not comfortable with the line that says forbidding the use of standardized tests to make high stakes decisions about students. Um, I'm assuming that's for four years. Yeah, so I would not be comfortable with that part for four years. I would be comfortable with the three par two paragraphs above it that says for one year. Yeah, I don't think we're gonna, and I, I think we're gonna agree to disagree. That's fine. Okay, so I'm ready to take this to a vote. Um, member, I will call on Member Voss. I just wanna add that on June 24th, uh, I think that was a day, um, the Mass Teachers Association came out strongly in favor of um, Senator Comerford's bill. Member Goldman? Um, I would like to make a motion to amend the resolution removing the uh, spec specifying the that we support legislation calling for a three to four year moratorium, the three to four year moratorium as that. You know, I'm, for some reason, I'm, I'm having trouble hearing you. I don't know if others are. Can you just repeat that? Um, I am making a motion to modify the resolution, amend the resolution to remove just that one section that Member Gold and Member Fallon seem to be comfortable uh, compromising on. Just the three to four year moratorium part. Can, can I ask a parliamentary question of our Please. parliamentarian? Yes, yeah. also. Member Goldman, 
Are you making that as a, as a friendly amendment to Member Gold's motion, or is that a separate motion which would have to be dealt with separately, I believe, if uh, Member Serfie Cox agrees that that would be the proper way? Thank you. Member, Member Serfie Cox. Cox, I think that question was to you. Yes. Well, I, I also heard though a question for member Goldman, which was, are you trying to offer it as a friendly amendment? And, but yes, if she's not trying to offer it as a friendly amendment or if it's not accepted as a friendly amendment, then we vote on it. And it's an amendment to the amendment. Okay. Right, I am. Member Goldman, I'm proposing. Amendment. Yeah. It, it could be a friendly amendment. Uh, friendly amendment to the amendment saying that we're just changing that one um, aspect. Okay. So then the question is to member gold. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, if it, if, so basically it would say we support legislation, we support, um, how would it, how is that? We, um, we support forbidding the use of any standardized test to make high stakes decisions. So essentially delete from the word legislation up until MCAS tests right there. Like just, we support, no. it would just I'm, for, read. I'm just looking for the common ground and it sounds like that yeah. three to four year, taking that three to four year out if, would, but if we, But that would change the, if I'm not mistaken, someone better than knows the laws better than me. If we take that out, the legislation- Well, we wouldn't be supporting the legislation. That's right. But we yeah. would be supporting the, the direction the legislation is going in. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm comfortable with removing that. Uh, that if I understand, can you read that paragraph? Do you have if you have that paragraph in front? Could you read what you're uh, what you're thinking it would say? Yeah, I believe Member Fallon already made the suggestion, but I'm sorry if I missed it. Yeah, that's okay. Finally, we would support legislation calling for. Um, a one-year moratorium on the administration of all MCAS tests for being the use of standardized tests to make high state decisions and requiring a special commission on the school and district evaluation system to the end. I, I mean, I could have said that from the amendment for sure. That sounds like a nice compromise. It's the only point the two of you Member Fallon seemed comfortable with adjusting, so I, I appreciate was trying you. to bring yeah bring it I together you a little bit. It out. If I'm it's gonna sure. if yeah. we're gonna pass it, then I want Member Buskansky, <laughs> so Buskansky and Member Gold to be closer on board. So I now believe, if I'm right, please somebody correct me that Member Gold's um, motion. Um, including the friendly amendment that member Goldman had brought up is up for vote correct. or on the table. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, seeing no hands, I would ask that um, Annie, can you take a, a vote please? Member Voss? No. Member Gold? Yes. Member Busansky? Yes. Member Fallon? Yes. Member Serafi Cox? No. Member Condon? Yes. Member Levy? No. Member Kaufman? Yes. And Member Goldman? The vote is six yes, three no. Yeah, I believe that ends the discussion on items F. That ends the discussion on the on Member Gold's amendment. Now we have the full resolution to vote on. Thank you. So the motion has been changed to include the language that we just passed. Correct. Thank you very much. Okay. So. Um, 
Seeing no hands raised, I'm going to call on uh, Annie to please take a vote. Um, Member Gold. Yes. Member Busanski. Yes. Member Fallon. Yes. Member Seraphi Cox. Yes. Member Condon. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. Member Kaufman. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. And Member Voss. Yes. The vote is nine yes. Okay, thank you. So um, it's nearing midnight, um, we are um, one more item through, and the next item is a resolution banning the use of the school resource officer, also known as the SRO in the Northampton Public Schools. And that Mr. Member, uh, can I just ask, because I don't know, the me Member Goldman said there was someone here to present on the masks. Is it, if that person's still here, if it, I don't know how long it is, I mean, should they go before this one? Because that was one of the items we were still going to cover, if I'm not mistaken, was the masks thing. If there's someone waiting here, I'd feel bad if they were still waiting here. Also, oh, there we have waiting on the you know, resolution. And, yeah. And she saying that she had to leave. So. Oh, okay. No problem then. Yep. I didn't hear that, but I understand that she's not here. So we're not holding anybody up. Correct. Okay. Um, Member uh, Serafi Cox, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so the uh, draft resolution uh, was uh, was circulated to you all. Um, I really want to thank the committee for the support that um, you that you voiced at our last meeting. Um, I heard a lot of support for uh, the removal of the SRO position from from my fellow committee members. So I, I want to thank you uh, for that so that I could bring uh, this resolution forward to uh, this evening. Um, I bring this resolution actually because my daughter is a person of color whose father has been assaulted by police on numerous occasions. She knows this history. It has caused her to fear for her safety in the presence of police officers. She is nine years old. As she grows up, I want her to be in schools that are free of police so that she can concentrate on her learning. This of course is not just about my own daughter. This is about all of the students in our schools. Okay, now that I've moved past, um, uh, past the emotional part, I will get to some things that I have uh, heard uh, voiced at the, at the last meeting, uh, questions about the resolution. Um, the resolution is non-binding as all resolutions are. It does have language in it that says that we intend not to use an SRO in the future. Um, it Passing this resolution um, states our intention at this time. Um, it, it does not bar us from making some different decision down the road. Um, but I think that it's important to uh, send a powerful message to students and families in our community. Um, as members of the public uh, mentioned before, uh, this resolution is not about Officer Wallace. I'm sure he's a very nice man. I. Um, I want to concentrate on this resolution as being about uh, a strategy for discipline um, and, and that this position, no matter who is in that position, that this position is not a strategy for discipline uh, that the Northampton Public Schools wants to take. Um, with, uh, so, how this resolution uh, came to be how it is, is I basically took the, uh, the resolution that uh, the Amherst uh, School Committee passed, and I also added with the committee's uh, input from, uh, from last meeting, I added the bit at the end about uh, the state law regarding the SRO. 
subsequent to writing the resolution, uh, the state Senate uh, issued their proposal um, about, uh, about um, police officers generally. And one of the things that's included in it is guidance or is uh, direction about uh, school resource officers. So if, um, if we would prefer to reference that law instead of just referencing repealing uh, the current law, um, then uh, I, would, I would accept that as a friendly amendment, most likely. Um, I'm, I know that the student union was, uh, was gathering feedback uh, on, on this issue. Um, I, I did hear from, of course, a lot of students this evening um, and recent graduates. Um, and I, I don't know what the end of that sentence was going to be. <laughs> Um, but th that's, uh, I offer this resolution um, and I would move um, that we pass, let me get the official word here, um, that we pass the resolution banning the use of a student resource of student resource officers in the Northampton public schools. Second. Okay. Um, motion was <clears throat> Motion was made by member Serafi Cox, seconded, I believe, by member Levy. And um, just before we have a discussion, can I ask you, member Serafi Cox, to repeat what you said about the friendly amendment? Like, I was a little confused with that, that you would be open to. It might be important for me. Uh, sure. The state uh, Senate recently came out with, um, with a law uh, it starts with a bunch of R's. I'm sure that member Fallon could, uh, could help me out there um, on with the numbers and so forth. Um, but it, it addresses the SRO issue. And so I was saying that uh, instead of saying that we would repeal this particular um, statute that uh, we could change that to say that we support the state Senate's um, proposal. Gotcha. It's Senate Bill 2800. Thank you, Member Fallon. Always got my back. Member um, Condon. <clears throat> uh, thank you. My, my question actually uh, was along the lines of yours. Uh, not having seen the bill, uh, Member, Member Seraphine Cox, could you um, maybe speak to a little bit? Uh, my concern uh, about the repealing of the bill cited in uh, what we have in front of us uh, was that also eliminated guidance for districts who wanted to keep the SRO position, uh, regardless of whether they were required. So does this new bill lay out uh, expectations and requirements of what that SRO would, you know, what what trainings they would need to get and what they could and could not do in school if a district decided to employ them? Um, I. I will read from, from something that I have about the bill. And then if member Fallon wants to add anything, I would yield my time uh, for her to add as well. Um, a key component of the bill addresses the school to prison pipeline by making school resource officers optional at the discretion of the superintendent and presumably the school committee and preventing school districts from sharing students' personal information uh, with police except for investigation of a crime or to stop imminent harm. So it would make it optional. Um, my, uh, it, it, it sounds like it's not repealing the existing law. So the, um, the guidance that exists in that existing law would remain. Okay, thank you. Member Levy. Thanks. I just want to voice my um, very strong support of this resolution. I think we've heard a number of people tonight and in, in past meetings speak really eloquently about the school to prison pipeline, about the immense inequities in disciplinary rates systemically and within our district. Um, the, the sense that that we as a school committee need to make a stance to, to articulate what, what we value in terms of educating all students 
We know that our students will all make mistakes. That's part of being a kid. It's part of what you need to do to learn and grow. And we need to create spaces where they can learn through their mistakes as opposed to be, being afraid uh, to learn in, in the buildings that, we're, that we, as a, as a school committee, are, um, are tasked with, with creating in terms of a safe environment for all students. Um, I think that we absolutely need safety. We need to support our students. And I think having a, a school resource officer is not the way to do it. I strongly support our, um, our backing restorative practices with, with funding um, and, and moving forward with a conversation in our district about how we best want to support the, the learning and safety of all of our students. Thank you. Um, Member Gold. Sorry, excuse me. A quick follow up and then another, and then a statement. Um, can someone confirm? I mean, Member Sophie Cox, you were reading a synopsis of it. Are you sure that the bill doesn't get rid of the guidance piece? Like, is it like, because I mean, I'm assuming you read a synopsis of it, not necessarily the whole bill. Um, I just want to make sure Member Condon's concern is uh, addressed. Sure. I mean, for one thing, the bill is uh, is open to amendment itself. Um, but uh, you're right. I was reading a synopsis. I wonder, Member Fallon, if you can speak to more details if you know them. Um, I, it is after midnight. Um, I I think I sent you all the information I had. The bill was only filed on Monday. It's very long. Um, I would feel more comfortable. I know that Senator Comerford was part of the working group that did file the bill on behalf of the Senate Ways and Needs Committee. Um, I, I don't know that I would be able to answer all of that clearly right now. Um, but I think yeah. that uh, to Member Condon's point, we could absolutely um, um, follow up with Senator Comerford uh, to encourage, if it's not a part of the bill, to encourage that it be added. Okay. Um, all right. And then I'd like to make a statement regarding this. Um, that's what I originally my hand was for. So I strongly support the efforts of our community to show that we support, respect, and value people of color and to push with a sense of urgency for much needed reforms in policing throughout our country. I think our school committee should make public, should publicly state its support and allegiance with this movement. And I appreciate that we quickly did so at our last meeting when we passed the anti-racism resolution. Um, however, I do not feel that as a school committee, we are in the position to make an informed vote on this SRO resolution for the following three reasons. Um, number one, we have not had the opportunity to hear from all involved constituents. To make an informed vote, I believe we need to not just rely on who has called and emailed us, as likely as like you all, I have seen and heard from both sides as we did tonight as well. But instead, we need to actually look at survey data from students, parents, and teachers. Um, while during the development of the code of conduct, many representatives from the community were included, I was told that this specific SRO issue was not discussed during the code of conduct development. Um, and um, in addition, um, I think that uh, to hearing from students, parents, and teachers prior to voting, we should also hear from the current SRO, the ALT team, and Chief Casper. Um, lastly, on this point, prior to voting, we should look at the specific data about the SRO. The discipline data that's been shared with us to this point um, is not data that is about the SRO. It's a da data about school discipline in regards to the teacher's discipline and, and data relative to that, not data relative to the SRO. Um, my second reason would be that we don't have a plan in place for what will replace the SRO in the future. And we should have a plan prior to banning the SRO indefinitely. Along the lines of this reason, currently, um, as you all know, there's a new code of conduct that's uh, coming out and school councils are voting on. Um, if you, I don't know if you know this, but Previously, it said SRO within the code of conduct. Now the code of conduct that school committees are, school councils are passing, instead of SRO, it says Northampton Police Department. So we don't have a mechanism in place when certain um, items get led to in the code of conduct 
to bring someone in prior to the police. The police department is, is, the, is the step in that stage. And I think that's one of the things we're trying to um, prevent um, from happening in many ways. Um, and uh, by hearing from all constituents, we can identify what roles and functions the SRO is effectively filling and develop a plan to fill those functions prior to banning the SRO indefinitely or possibly come to a place where we feel an SRO is still needed, either as, as in the position as it currently states or in a modified way. The last reason would be that um, as we don't have an SRO in the coming year, we have sufficient time this year to engage in a meaningful conversation with the community, hear from the relevant role players, look at the specific data and develop a plan prior to moving forward on what direction our community is gonna go with the SRO. So with these reasons in mind, I would like to make a motion to postpone this debate until we have a well-rounded community discussion, discuss the specific data, have a plan in place uh, as we transition um, our current uh, agreement with the SRO. Um, for this motion, I would like to see a debate uh, postponed at, to a time that is agreeable to our, um, to our school committee while also making sure that it uh, is completed in time for the district's budget season. Second. Okay, was that Member Fallon? Yes. Okay, and Member Fallon, um, you also have your hands up. Did you want your hand up? Did you want to say something about this topic? Yeah, I, I just, I do want to say that I think that Member Gold made some points that I think that this is a really complicated question that deserves more conversation than at midnight. I think that we need to recognize that even without a school resource officer, police will still be called by the Northampton public school system. Um, and that without a specialist, they'll be working with officers that have no specialized training to work with juveniles, that they do not have foundational relationships with students or administrators, that this move will not eliminate police from the school environment. And we need to think about that. Um, and weigh that carefully. I'm not, I, I honestly, I think it's just a really complicated question. Member Fallon, we got cut off, we, or were you done? Member Fallon, you're on mute. No, no I'm not. Sorry, that's Ms. Member Levy. We got cut off there, at least I did, where you said it's a really complicated question. That I don't think we should be addressing at 1215 without ever hearing from a single administrator from the Northampton Police Department, from Chief Casper, without ever hearing from um, our students to, to give two days notice posting this agenda and not give the opportunity to our students to weigh in. I, I mean, we talk about how important student voice is. I think this is a conversation that they need to be a part of. And so I, we do have time. There won't be an officer in the school in the fall. Um, and I would like to take that time to make, um, to have a community conversation because it is so important. Member <clears throat> Serafie Cox. I just wanted to point out that Officer Wallace was actually on the call earlier this evening during public comment and chose not to make public comment. Member uh, Buzanski. Uh, I guess I just want to point out that we just made a pretty big decision on an MCAS resolution without hearing from any administrators or any all team or hearing from both sides and students. And it wasn't past midnight, but it was certainly past 11, which is past my bedtime. So it was just as hard to focus. I don't really understand what the difference is on making this decision or why we would need to postpone this decision. And in some ways, I think maybe it's a, just a chicken or the egg question, but by passing this resolution, that's really stating where our values are and what we need to do about the code of conduct. Um, I also want to point out that Officer Wallace had covered six schools, plus he would be taken away for police duty at times. So it's not that he was in our high school or are gonna every time there is a disciplinary or every time something rose to the level of needing the police, it was always gonna be Officer Wallace who would be there. So, I, you know, I think in relate whatever the relationship is with the police department, we are a small town and that's an important 
piece of this whole puzzle to figure out, of course, but uh, you know, we're stating our values here and then everything else is gonna have to fall into place. And if the code of conduct replaces the school resource officer with the uh, Northampton Police Department, then we need to um, deal with that as a school committee as we move forward. I just don't see any reason to postpone it. And, um, and I think we've made decisions with this much information on pretty big issues tonight and before. And so I don't understand what would hold us up right now. So um, I'll call on myself, seeing no other hands raised. Um, I, I, I don't agree that we're voting on our values here. Um, I, I have really a hard time with this. And for some of the reasons that people mentioned, I am really not knowledgeable about the SRO. I didn't know we had an SRO. I don't know what schools he worked at. I have not heard from any of the people that work closely with them. I have heard from very few students some, and I really appreciated the students that took the time to speak to us, but um, we just haven't heard from students and I, I'm not comfortable with adults speaking on behalf of kids who have experienced this. So um, I'm really confused because I don't really think it's appropriate to have an SRO officer now. And if we were taking a vote, I, I can't imagine in this environment and to be so tone deaf that I would vote for yes, I can't imagine that. And I also think it's up to local. I, I, don't, I didn't know there was a lot. Uh, I don't think there should be a law and I would be a hurt, certainly 100% behind abolishing the law. I think this is a local decision and that's why I have to vote against it because at a principle, I don't think we can vote on something that doesn't exist with the, with the potential that it might exist in the future. I don't think that's fair to our future school committee members and I don't think it's fair to our community to be left out of a discussion um, like this. I look forward to the day that um, we might have this discussion and I will probably speak out against it uh, unless the environment changes, but I just, I just don't think it's our job. I don't know if a resolution is our values, particularly if we vote up and down on it. It just seems silly to me to present that, unless it's unanimous, I should say, but um, it's complicated. It was very complicated for me and I, I, get the, I guess I, would, I was even entertaining the idea of, of asking to remove the third paragraph, and I know that is silly because that's the heart of it for many of you. So um, I appreciate the thinking here. I went back and forth a number of times, but as my role as a school committee member, I get back to what I said last time, which is that um, this needs to be discussed further, as some of my colleagues said, and it needs to be discussed by the school committee members that are in place at the time that uh, a real SRO is gonna be placed in our schools. If this was to come out again next week or the week after, then that's the time to do it. But I do think we have many other things to discuss and um, I am empathetic, I believe, to people that want this in there. I think I get it, but I also need to be, in my mind, pure to what I feel my role is as a school committee member. And I don't wanna take this away from the future ones, even though it's been stated, it's not, it's just a resolution, it's not binding, but uh, I just don't have enough information to make a case on it, so that's, that's where I stand. And I see Member Voss's hand followed by Member Gold. Member Voss? Yeah, thanks. So I wanna thank Member Serafie Cox for bringing this forward. I am fully in support of it. I look around what's happening in our country, what's happening in our community. And this is a piece of what we can do to help move us in the right direction. And it's, it's a small piece, but I don't, I, I've had a really different experience. I've had numerous people reach out to me and explain things to me. And I've had parents call me, multiple parents, people I don't know, explaining how their children who have darker skin feel in our schools with a police officer there. And we heard a lot of public comment today about this. And um, we had record numbers of people speaking at city council throughout June of our community talking about how they feel about all sorts of things that included SROs. And I just am left with the conclusion that it is not healthy for some of our students, many of them, um, to have an SRO in our, in our buildings. I've had high school students call me. We heard from some high school students tonight. I feel like I've had more outreach on this topic than almost any other topic during my time on the school committee. And 
to send a statement that we um, want to work toward uh, better, more inclusive policies where everyone feels comfortable, I think is super important in the time we're in right now. So I'm ready to go ahead and very much support this. Thank you. Um, Member Go. Um, two things, hopefully briefly. One, um, just in response to Member Wysanski <laughs> and um, the uh, comment about how we just did this with MCAS. I mean, I was, I really tried hard during the MCAS conversation to uh, share that we need to have informed conversations prior to voting. And that's sort of the thinking with this one as well, that um, at some point, I hope as a school committee, we get to a place where we ensure that we have all the information before we vote on something and don't just keep doing this, you know, 12th hour, whatever it would be voting. Um, and then I totally understand that this is a symbolic gesture and allegiance. And in a way, um, that's kind of what concerns me. And which is why I'm really pushing to postpone and have this community conversation. Because while symbols are nice, symbolic actions are nice, we need to do more. Um, I met with real, uh, one of the real leaders and representatives um, recently on Sunday. And we had a long conversation about how these symbols you know, it's symbolic, but really it's not the really most important part. The most important part is to have a conversation as a community and to really understand what's going on in our community. Um, one example that we discussed was how, um, you know, we might show that we stand in allegiance with this movement. Yet, if you look at the uh, women's marches that take place in Northampton, there's been, I think there's now three of them, two of them, thousands of people in downtown Northampton, thousands. And then the one year that it went to Springfield, it was a couple hundred. Where were where was our community in supporting people of color when a women's march went to their town? If you look at so many events, whether it's musical events that go on in this area, people spend tens and hundreds of dollars to go to music events in our area. You go, there's a free jazz and roots festival every year in Springfield. Northampton doesn't show up. And we really need to have a conversation. And I hope that this is an opportunity for us to have a conversation. If we pass the bill, great. You know, it, it is what it is. It's a symbolic action. But more important than this is to have this community conversation. And maybe this SRO conversation is a step into it. Because again, that data was not about the SRO. That data was about discipline referrals within the school buildings made by teachers, not the SRO. And so if we're concerned about our discipline data in our schools, we shouldn't be concerned about what's going on with our SRO. We really need to look at our school community and identify what's going on in that situation. Um, and so I really hope that we can have an important conversation on, on this issue um, as a community. And that's why I, I presented this as a postponement in hopes that we can have that conversation because there is no time limit. I'll just add, end on this one. The MCAS issue, I get it, the bill was coming up but now we don't have an SRO for the year, right? So we're good, we're done. There's no SRO this year. Let's have a conversation. And so then we move into next year, we're prepared and we're with a plan. Okay, um, so just retracing, I believe there's a motion and then there's a motion, uh, there's a motion made by um, member Serafi Cox on the resolution. And then there was a, another motion by member Gold and um, we have four hands up, so I think we need to continue the discussion. Member, Member Voss, is your hand up or is that something I forgot to take down from earlier? It's very quick because I just need to respond to because I, I don't want to be misunderstood. I was not suggesting that this was just, um, I'm so late I'm losing track of my <laughs> words, um, a gesture or a symbolic resolution. It's a resolution and it's a step in a direction to recognize what's going on and the experiences people have and to fix some of it so that it is better. And I think we absolutely need more conversation, but right now um, this resolution is saying that what we heard tonight in public comment, what we've been emailed, people have sent us articles that SROs are not making our schools safer. They are not making students feel included um, some students might have different experiences in schools with SROs than others. And I've heard so much about this from our community that I feel very comfortable that this is an important resolution for us to pass. So it's not just about the symbolism. I think we definitely need more conversation, but I also feel very ready to support this resolution. 
Thank you, uh, Ms. Uh, Member Levy. Uh, that's a lot of what I was going to say. I guess what I will add is that I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. I don't think that passing this resolution means we're done. We've checked off this box and we don't need to do the real work. The real work is still very much ahead of us. And I'm glad to hear, Member Gold, that you sound really committed to doing it. And I think there are a lot of people on this committee who are also really committed. And I'm, for one, very much looking forward to doing that work together with our community, who also seems very much in support of this. I think as a part of our district improvement plan, as a part of our code of conduct, as a part of our future budget setting um, uh, opportunities that there's a lot, there are a number of paths forward for us to really make a, a true commitment to doing this work and doing this work well. And this is one step in it that says, we hear you, there are inequities and there are real issues involved with having armed police officers in our schools. So yes, there are issues with our discipline that, that aren't related to the SRO, but there are also issues with our discipline that are and they need to be addressed. And so for me, making this statement is a way of saying that I recognize that and there's more work to be done. And um, I'll just add, I, I, am, I, I agree with a lot of what you said, Member Levy, but just as an example, when you said that there are some issues that are related, I don't have that information. I don't know what the numbers of 250 people are talking about. Nobody, not a single person has mentioned to me a negative experience with Officer Wallace outside of one comment from a student today. I counter that with some very honest statements from some students who have. So I'm just ignorant for lack of a better term. I don't know how I can vote on something um, that I just don't know about, but I do appreciate everything you've said. And uh, I'll add to that list, the district review, which clearly gave us some really strong uh, challenges that we're doing in terms of you know, meeting kids' needs and equity and um, ideas and suggestions for improving that. So certainly we are heading in the right direction, but I just, I don't know how I can vote on something that I don't know what's happening in the Northampton schools. That's my issue. Member Bizanski. I, I just kind of, I wanted to just uh, add as a reminder what we went through with High Five Fridays and number Friday, I don't know if that was about three years ago, especially. And though I realize, recognize that it's a little different than a school resource officer, but I do, but we did hear from a lot of parents about this issue in uh, what went on in the elementary schools, and then we and then we changed course, right? We stopped it. But uh, so I, I feel like in different ways um, we we have keep hearing the same message that you know of what police officers having a police presence um, means to students of color, and um, and so I you know I, I bring that experience with me when I say that I support this resolution and not having a school resource officer in it. And I think we have heard from lots of folks um, from then and from now. So I just kind of want to throw out that as a sort of reminder. Member Fallon? I can tell you with all certainty, certainty I would never have brought up High Five Friday, but since you have, <laughs> I will say that Part of the problem with that was that we never involved the community in the conversation. And I feel like had we just had an open conversation with the community from the beginning, that wouldn't have turned into such a divisive issue. Um, so that I feel like we didn't necessarily learn our lesson from that. Um, I do want to be clear, I support the Senate Bill 2800. And, and I, I, you know, I think it's fine that we um, are not going to have the SRO in the building this year, but I also don't feel okay with um, making a statement that we can, can't commit to. Like, I, it, you know, I can't commit beyond my own term. I can't, um, I can't bind future school committees or future superintendents to action. And so I don't feel comfortable making those promises that I can't keep. I also repealing the law repeals the protections. So the way it's written now is problematic for me. But most importantly, um, from having worked with um, Officer Wallace and Chief Casper, what concerns um, on a policy issue a few years back, I, I really do want to be sure 
you know, we, we keep re referencing the people we hear from. I really need everyone to remember that we don't hear from a representative sample of the community. Like we, there are so many people that they have no idea who the school committee is, what their job is. They, it's, there are people who are not plugged into politics that have no idea who's making the decisions regarding schools. And so we are not hearing from everyone and I would like to try and hear from more people. Um, and the second part of it is from having spent time talking to them about the policies on the rules and policy committee. It was my understanding that Officer Wallace, when students were in fact accused of a crime would often have to go to court on their behalf to try and get their charges dropped or diminished. And so rather than feeding into that school to prison pipeline, it was my impression that he was actually trying to keep children or students out of trouble, trying to plead their cases because he knew them um, and tried to get community service and tried to find you know, some sort of restorative justice options. And so I just, I, I want, I want them to have the opportunity to tell us what's really happening in the schools. Um, I don't want to make this decision in a hurry when we don't have to. Um, it's, it's not the end of the world either way, but I don't want to make an empty gesture. That's all. I think that, I think that we deserve, that our students deserve for us to make a well-informed decision, especially considering the students that um, this most impacts. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think, um, unless I missed something here, I think we should entertain uh, the motion first that was brought up by Member Gold, um, which maybe you can read that back or you can repeat. I, that was about delaying putting yeah, off the vote until a later date after we have a more thorough opportunity to discuss. Yes, to postpone, to postpone the vote until um, we have a community meeting and, a, and further discussion and meaningful looking at the data and hearing from everybody um, um, and doing it, having that, having that meeting prior to the next budgetary decision making timeline. So whether it's, uh, I don't know exactly when prior we have- Prior to January? Yeah, but prior to January, exactly. Yeah, definitely prior to January. But it's a commit, it, it, the, the motion is to postpone with a commitment to have the community meeting. Um, okay. So this is the first vote we're taking on this item and I would ask the clerk to do a roll call vote, please. Member Gold. Yes. Member Busansky. No. Member Fallon. Yes. Member Seraphie Cox. No. Member Condon. Yes. Member Levy. No. Member Kaufman. Yes. Member Goldman. No. That was a no. Correct. Uh, and Member Voss. No. There are five no's, four yeses. Okay, the motion fails. Um, I think we have back to the original motion now, which is the, res um, the resolution banning the use of SRO in the NPS schools. Um, I see member Condon's hand is up. Uh, yes, uh, I just wanna clarify, uh, member Seraphie Cox uh, in her introduction said she'd entertain uh, the friendly motion of changing that last paragraph. So are we on that last paragraph being uh, uh, amended or the version with that last paragraph being amended? So you, you cut out a little bit, uh, Member Condon. Uh, are you saying that you want to change the last paragraph? I, I guess my question is, now that we're returning to the vote about accepting the resolution, mm -hmm. uh, is are we accepting a version with that last section changed based on your offer of a friendly? Uh, well, nobody made a friendly amendment, but uh, if if uh, somebody wants to, then we can add it in. And I am ready to type. Uh, I, I, is that something you'd like to do? 
I, I will make the friendly amendment to amend that last paragraph to uh, reference the new Senate law. I, I forget the number, I apologize. Okay. I'll, I'll Senate, second. Senate Bill 2800, is that right? That sounds right. Oh, it's a friendly. So there's, uh, do, you, do you accept that friendly amendment? I no, do. Cox. Okay. And are we ready to vote on the motion now, everyone? Okay, so the vote is on the motion with the friendly amendment, amendment accepted to reflect the updated bill. And I would ask the clerk to take a vote, please. Member Dusansky. Yes. Member Fallon. I'm sorry, am I voting on the amendment or the whole motion? The whole motion. The whole motion that was um, with the friendly amendment to reflect the updated bill to make it optional. The whole amendment. You need further clarity? Well, I, I'm just looking it up and I think the bill already passed. So I think the whole thing is completely irrelevant. Um, I, I'm going to abstain, I'm sorry. I, I can't figure this out right now. Okay. Member Serafie Cox? Yes. Member Condon? Yes. Member Levy? Yes. Member Kaufman? No. Member Goldman? Yes. Member Voss? Yes. Member Gold? No. The vote is six yes, two no, and one abstention. Thank you, Annie. Um, so we have two more items. I do, I'm anticipating them to be quick. So unless anybody objects, I think we can move forward with the next two. Thank you. Um, next item is a vote on a donation um, from Valley Masks and if Principal Wenz is still with us, she can have the floor. She's not with us anymore, so I could jump in there for her. Okay, thank you. So this is a request to accept a, uh, a quantity of masks to be donated to Leeds Elementary School students. Um, it is below the $10,000 threshold of estimated market value requiring a city council vote, but likely to be over $1,000 um, so that it would require school committee approval. So moved. Second. Um, discussion? Uh, Member Voss? I have a, I have a question. Do, are these cloth masks or what kind of masks are these? Cloth masks, yes. It's a sewing club that's putting them together. So um, with our knowledge today, I, I, I'm gonna vote to accept it and very much appreciate the people who are making them and I wear a cloth mask too, but I just wanna put out there that being inside, um, there are better masks than cloth masks and I think the district has ordered some surgical masks, which are three layers. And again, I don't know that we have enough information to say one is that much better than the other, but there are people who think the surgical masks are potentially quite a bit better than the cloth ones. And I'd just like us to keep an open mind about that and continue that conversation as more information comes along over the next several weeks. And that doesn't mean that I'm at all not grateful for the people that are trying to help because I think we're gonna need all the masks we can get, so thank you. Okay, not seeing any other hands. I'm happy to ask uh, Annie to take the roll call vote, please. Member Busanski. Yes. Member Fallon. Yes. Member Serafie Cox. Yes. Member Condon. Yes. Member Levy. Yes. Member Kaufman. Yes. Member Goldman. Yes. Member Voss. 
Yes. Member Gold. Yes. The vote is nine yeses. Thank you, and thank you to the, um, if the name of the organization is Valley Mask or so, I, I'm not sure, but thank you for your donation, much appreciated. Um, actually, there's two more items. Um, next one is we have a vote on the transportation refund clarification. I don't know if uh, uh, business manager uh, Lamica is still here. I'm here. Well, greetings. Um, please have the floor. <laughs> sure. So last month's meeting, we had talked and you had voted on refunding um, transportation um, fees. We had clarified and I mentioned during that, that the recommendation was to refund the third trimester payments. Um, those are people that paid for the last semester going from March 17th through the end of June and they just paid the week before we closed. So they didn't receive any service for the money they paid that week. Um, the transportation has, office has received some phone inquiries from some people wanting to know if they paid their full year, were they gonna get any portion of their full year payment back? Um, I wanted to bring it to the committee because that would be an entirely different situation um, knowing that we have almost 400 paid, full paid um, payments that would need to be processed and researched. And it'd be another $31,000 in lost revenue. Um, I know when the full paid bus passes are sold, they are sold as non-refundable. So I wanted to bring it back to the committee um, and if it's something that the committee wants to do that, it's ranging from $1.15 a day to $1.72 a day is what people would be refunded, depending on what amount they paid for a bus pass to begin with, which we would have to research. Um, it's also gonna cost us some extra labor because I'm, I'm gonna have to have somebody come in and help us do this. Um, right now our transportation office is getting pretty bogged down with trying to do transportation models and starting to get summer school and September geared up. Um, so to process over 500 refunds is gonna take quite a effort right now. Okay, so um, I think you're asking, you're asking for a vote. Is there a motion? I mean, I guess we can discuss this first, especially if there's issues of clarity. Um, why, don't I, why don't I open up for some discussion first and we'll move to a motion if, uh, as soon as we can. Sure. Because I'm a little, I, I think there might be some questions for clarity here. Thank sure. you. Sure. Member uh, Levy. Thanks. Um, where, where if, if we do refund roughly $31,000, where will that money come from? Is it money that since, since we weren't using it, for this purpose, did it get used for a different purpose or what, what would that money come out of? It comes out of the transportation revolving account, which pays for part of our bus contract and takes care of maintenance costs out of our own bus fleet and some other miscellaneous transportation costs is what that, all the fees that we do collect help pay for and support. Is that it, Member Levy? Um, I guess I guess it's a question of like, thank you. That helps to a certain extent. Where I guess so. Just to clarify, that money would be spent on on it, that it's it's basically money that we will no longer be able to spend on all of those areas that you just described that we were planning on. Correct. Thanks. And member Serafi Cox. I was just gonna ask Ms. Lamica if you have a recommendation. It sounds to me like you would recommend that we not uh, refund the third quarter. I, I recommended at last month's meeting to vote and I, the committee had approved refunding the third trimester people because they had not received any service. 
we had not discussed the full year paid people whatsoever about refunding any of that. And I would not recommend it would be my recommendation. Okay, uh, member Boss. Thank you. You might have said this, um, but I didn't quite follow. If we look at what's left in the transportation budget from last fiscal year, and you may or may not know the exact amount, um, but if your best guess, is there enough money left in that account um, to refund it? Or by buying the pass for the whole year, was that money used for paying for the bus services? I guess the question is how much is left in that account? Well, the bus cost, the, the contracted service gets paid out of our budget, a portion of it. And there's a portion that's charged to the revolving account. And that's where the fees go in the revolving account and pay for part of the bus service and the other transportation supplies, maintenance, those kind of items. Um, so so what, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to say is if um, there's money that goes for busing. If there's money left in the busing pot, combining all these things, I think we should refund people for serv services that they didn't get because we closed schools for a pandemic. I don't think we should use extra money in that transportation budget to buy other supplies. If the transportation budget is gone, and we would have to transfer money from other places into it to pay people back, I probably feel differently. So that's what I'm trying to understand. So when we build the budget, we rely on about $100,000 in fees coming in to pay about $90,000 of the bus contract and other expenses. So just about breaks even of what we collect is what we're gonna pay out. And we have a piece in there that over in three or four years, we are able to replace one of our buses over a period of time as well. So by refunding probably close to $40,000 in fees, what we're doing is we're putting off a bus replacement in the next year or two instead. And is that a reasonable thing to do? I, I tend to think if we refunded people in the third trimester um, who might have bought it every time and not these other people, can we, can we afford to put a bus off? I mean, is, it, is there any reason to not just have a slightly older bus driving around during a pandemic so we can pay people back? It, it generally just becomes higher maintenance costs as the buses get older. Member Voss, will you? I think um, I think Tammy wants to talk, but you're muted, Tammy. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Done. Hi. Um, I just have one thing also to add to with going through with the state mandated law right now, the two miles or more, there will be no fees coming in this year. Right. So there'll be no income at all coming into the transportation budget. This is why it's forty thousand dollars out of the budget is going to really hurt, not just this year, but the following year. So that's a huge, huge little chunk that you, you need to be aware of. Yeah, because it's the whole $100,000 that won't be going in next year for bus fees. All right, mem member Gold. Uh, yeah, uh, Ms. Lemica, you mentioned um, that when, you first, when parents first sign on, for the full year, they're told that there won't be any refunds. Um, when people signed on for the third trimester, were they also told that there won't be any refunds? All the, all the bus passes have that they're non-refundable. The committee at last month's meeting waived that refundable part in the policy. 
so we could refund the third trimester. Gotcha. So, yeah, I guess I'm I'm struggling to understand. Like, if if both people, if both groups of parents and families knew that that wasn't going to be refundable, mm -hmm. and we're saying yes to one of them but no to the other, for me that's a little challenging to swallow. I totally get the additional expense, but in terms of fairness, yeah, um, I I feel like I. Think that we should refund it um but i and also the, totally get not i mean i, I hear what i yeah and the only thing i can say that the difference that i see between the two different bus passes is the people that bought the full year pass did get a majority of their service for their money the people who paid their third trimester did not even get one day's worth and i guess then what is it do we need do we need to have full year bus passes like does the does our budget depend on full years because i could imagine if i was a parent like is it cheaper if you do full year i don't even know that one is it <laughs> go ahead tammy i can help you out with that um what we offered last year for the first time was if you paid in full before the i think it was the fifth of july there was a discount and it was close to be um depending on if you had elementary or high school kids it was anywhere from 30 to 40 dollars off for the full year with that being said we had our full bus counts we knew exactly who we were going to be transporting and it was easier to root when you start getting into the trimesters um one trimester you could have you know 200 something kids the next trimester you only have 105 and then all of a sudden it goes back up um, it's a little harder to keep the counts uh, steady, but a lot of people took advantage of the discount that we offered and it was a great thing to do when they paid early. It helped us get rooting done early. It helped me let the um, contractors know exactly where the kids were gonna be and what our numbers were. Um, probably by the 1st of August, I had just about 90% of everybody rooted. So it helped out immensely with that. Um, so our contractors, especially Vanpool, if we need to use a lot, utilize that and Durham. Which then, uh, as I said that before, which then makes me think I, I, I would caution us to not refund it because in a way, if I was a parent and, you know, the risk reward of not getting the money, you know, that, that there's a precedent that we're not going to get you your money back in a situation as extreme like this, it's, it's better for the parent to do it, you know, trimester to trimester, it seems like, you know, to say, you know, to know at least you're going to get your money back if you can't use the bus. So I, I caution us on that one, but I hear what you're saying. Yeah. But don't forget this year, there's not going to be any fee whatsoever. So nobody's paying anything. Yeah, no, I just mean moving forward, but I totally get it. It's a tough situation. Yeah. Yep. Member Levy. Uh, I fully agree with Member Gold. And I wonder if we could take the approach that we did with something spring sports maybe where we offered um we offered to refund people the portion that they did not use but ask them if they would like to donate it knowing that since they've already it's already out of their pockets maybe they would be willing to to not see it back We could do that. It's just going to take a little bit more legwork for somebody to reach out to those families and ask which option they do. So I'm going to call on Member Voss, Member Goldman, and then I'm going to ask if anybody has a motion, unless Member Voss or Member Goldman do. Uh, I'm just thinking this through. Yeah. yeah, I've been just thinking through what I've heard, and I am leaning toward. Um, wanting to refund what people didn't use. And part of it is this idea that it's being saved for a bus. Um, these buses did not drive, as far as I know, from March until uh, September. So they're not gonna wear out quite as quick. And next year, maybe I'm wrong, next year they're gonna drive less too. So um, I just feel like people are struggling and when it, it's, it just feels to me like that's what we should do. But Tammy has something to say. 
So, so just that you know, my buses have been doing the food service program. We've been out two and three days a week. In the beginning, we were out every day. Right now, my buses are all doing summer school. We're doing out of districts. So my drivers have been working and those buses have been out on the roads. Um, so, and we will be probably with the scenarios that we're looking at a five tier. And even though some of the kids are not um, gonna be going into the schools and some will be remote, most of the SPED kids that we transport will be going to school just about every day from the programs that I've looked at. So my, my buses will be on the road every day and they have been. Okay. So the wear and tear is there. I have a bus right now that's got 125,000 miles on it and that's the one that needs to get replaced. So okay. um, we're looking at two years and they're roughly around $92,000. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. I, I also see that kids whose bus passes who paid for them probably are not riding the bus as much. So it's a complicated situation, mm -hmm. but thanks. Okay, and Member Goldman. Thank you. Um, I wonder if it would be possible to um, refund the portion that wasn't used, but prorating it at the rate that the non-full year used, so at the non-discounted rate. So if it was, um, so you would say, well, they used it for this long and non-full year passes cost that much. And so then it would actually be even a smaller refund than those who already got their refund got. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, everybody would just get a flat number of a refund per day rather than depending on what they paid. Right, and so they paid a certain amount and they got a discount, but instead of spreading that discount across the whole year, you yep. move it all the way to the end of the year. So they're paying full price for each month that they've already done it, but then the ending part would consider the discount. So they wouldn't be refunded the discount at all. So it'd be like they bought a pass mm -hmm. for exactly the amount of time they used at the regular bus rate, not the discount bus rate. We save a little bit of money there. I just had a couple of quick questions, um, and I apologize if you answered this already. Um, how many parents have, have asked for a request so far? On the parents that I've gotten emails from that have paid for full year, I've had four or five. Okay, out of about how many? Um, full year, we're about 260 roughly, okay. maybe a little more. Yeah, I think it's more like 360 with the online ones. Yeah, so yeah, it could be up. It, it probably around 350, 360. Right. And um, my other question is why, why do we know we're not going to charge next year? With the state mandated law, K through six, two miles or more are free. And that's, we always follow that policy, anyways. We always charged here the 1.5 miles or more. Gotcha. Thank you. In grades seven to 12. Seven to 12. So um, is there a motion that a uh, committee member could make? Thank you, uh, Member Voss. I will make a motion that we refund the bus for the third tri trimester with um, Member Goldman's suggestion of how to prorate it. Okay. okay. Can I clar clarify? There's a difference between the third trimester and the full year. I just want to clarify. Does that change your motion, Member Voss? Was you were you clear on that? I'll try again. Maybe somebody can help me. Are you eating breakfast? I am eating a snack. Mm -hmm. Um, sorry. Um. I wish we were together so I could share it with you all. Um, how do I want to word this? Um, Cami or Tammy, I think you know what I'm trying to say. If you have a better way of wording it, feel free to offer it. So do you want to refund the third trimester in full and the full year 
payments prorated to the days not serviced at the full year rate without the discount? I, I can, I actually can simplify this. Okay. I would like to propose that we um, refund the bus taker, the people who bought the full year pass at the same amount we refunded um, the people we agreed to last month. Or maybe that's too much. Is that too much? Is that what you're going to tell me? It's a different okay. rate. <laughs> Somebody else want to try? I think I'm too tired. <laughs> Member Levy, do you want to say something before I... Well, I was going to make a friendly amendment to whatever member Voss's amendment, <laughs> which hasn't been fully articulated yet, which is just to add the piece about it being um, optional that we ask them if they would like to donate that money back. But I wonder if what we're asking is that they, that we, what we're saying is that we're, we're refunding them. Uh, so they put, they paid a discounted rate. So we're, we're pro we're refunding them at the prorated usage. I don't know. Superintendent has a hand up. Maybe you can fix it. I, I like the, the idea of providing the option to donate towards the new bus that's going to need to be um, purchased. I, I want, I just wanted to throw this question out to Cami to simplify it. Is there a reasonable daily rate that we could just put into the motion so that we could simplify the research and, and um, come pretty close to, to giving everyone a fair refund based on what they had actually paid for? I would say that the K to five get reimbursed a dollar fifteen, and the grade six to twelve get a dollar fifty four because that's what their bus pass rates are without the discount. That would be the lower amount that they paid. Well, I don't know. Member Goma. Thank you. Um, are we interested in in making that the low the lower number? So if they had paid a full, if you take the amount they paid and subtract the first, are there three trimesters? I'm guessing. L let me give you an example. So if you bought a bus pass in your grade six to twelve, and you paid a full bus pass. Mm -hmm your refund's gonna be $1.72 a day. If you, pay the if you pay the discounted rate, it's $1.54. So we would pay the $1.54. I'm not gonna pay $1.72 because that's gonna cause me to do the research because then I've gotta see if you only paid the discounted rate, why am I paying you back the higher rate? I'm saying you would pay a lower rate yeah. because you would say their first trimester they pay the full rate, not the discount rate. The second trimester, they pay the full rate, not the discounted rate. And then you figure out how much is left. It's not gonna be the same as the one trimester. It's gonna be lower per so. day. Maybe, it's, maybe this is too complicated, but I think it would save a chunk. So is there a motion? I, yes. I, I, I can make my motion if 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 the, <laughs> if they um say if if it really is a trimester that they missed out on busing, and it's twenty cents a day cheaper each of those than it was forty cents a day, um, cheaper perhaps. So I think it's not that far off. What if we pay them back a dollar twenty five for uh per day and a dollar per day. And if my numbers are way off, um, maybe we could just vote to allow Cami and Tammy to adjust them um, with that spirit in mind. So I guess here's the motion. The motion is to offer about about a dollar twenty-five a day back for was it seven through twelve and six about to 12. six to twelve and about a dollar a day back for K through five. And if that's far out of line with what 
member Goldman was suggesting, we trust you to adjust it um, slightly. It won't be more than 10 cents a day. And to also offer people a chance to donate the final amount if they don't want it back. That's my motion. Second. Does that work, uh, Cammy and Cammy? Sorry, Member Gold, I, I was muted. Um, yeah, we we had we heard the motion and we heard a second from uh, Member Goldman and um, Member Gold has a sand rest. Yeah, uh, to simplify, because Cammy was talking about how much work it's going to be, can we just do a flat thing and just say this is the best we can offer? I mean, I don't know what like what is a what is one trimester cost, Cammy, like for busing average, like what's the average cost? And can we just drop it by like? 10 bucks, I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, so, let's just make it simple. So the average cost for the trimester is 103, 103, but you pay more per trimester because it's, it's right. so they actually paid less than the 103. It, it ended up being, like I said, it, depending on if they got the discount or not, it ended up being the $1.72 a day, $1.54 a day, $1.34 a day, or $1.15 a day, depending on the grade and whether or not they got the discount, so. Is there a way for you guys, like whether it's 50 bucks, whether, you know, like do the whole thing to say, what we can do is give everybody 50 bucks back um, who prepaid, you know, because, you know, I think that'd be fair for the community to say this, you know, we could do this much because of how overworked our department is right now. This is our best offer and uh, do what member Levy said about, if you'd like to donate it, go for it. It'd so at a I'm sorry. At a dollar fifteen a day, it's it's seventy four seventy five. Okay, so can we say fifty bucks? <laughs> can we just say you know just to make your whole workload easier and everybody's workload easier? And just go with a flat fee and, and it'd not be easier not having to do calculations for everything. If you yeah. wanted to have one rate for the K to five and one rate for the six to twelve, that's fine. Just whatever flat dollar amount, and then it's yeah. done. Yeah, I think that'd be much easier for you guys, and then people will be very understanding. I hope. All right. It's okay to six. Um, I'm still just hearing a motion and a second. So what are you saying, Member Gold? I'm uh, offering an amendment, I guess, to just do a flat fee instead for one for elementary, what Cammy just said. Okay. Um, Is there a second on that? Well, I'm willing to take it as a friendly amendment if you ask me. Sure. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Sorry, friendly amendment. Whatever is the quickest way to do it. And, friendly amendment. And, and I would like to ask Cammy and Tammy: Is seventy-five more reasonable, or is fifty more reasonable? Well, the dollar would come out to sixty dollars, and the dollar and a quarter okay. would come out to seventy-five. I don't really care what the number is. I'm yeah, you guys, I, I'm I'm comfortable with them figuring out the numbers and just making it, you know, fair and easy for everybody. Yeah. Okay, are you content with that, uh, Member Voss, making the motion? Is that, Member Voss, are you okay with that? Yes, yes, sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, seeing no other hands, I think we can take a vote on the um, friendly amended motion. And um, would ask you to do that, Annie? Member Fallon. Yes. Member Serafi Cox? Yes. Member Condon? Yes. Member Levy? Yes. Member Kaufman? <clears throat> yes. Member Goldman? Yes. Member Voss? Yes. Member Gold? Yes. And Member Busansky? Yes. The vote is nine yeses. Thank you. Sorry, I was muted. The final um, item on the agenda, on the regular agenda, is the Collaborative for Educational Services report. Um, turn this over to Member Fallon. Thanks. I'll make this really brief. Um, so the most important thing to know is that the collaborative was one of only three collaboratives who applied for and received funding um, from the Small Business Administration um, 
payroll protection plan loan program. Um, we received um, a loan um, of $5.825 million. Um, it is, um, it was aimed towards small businesses and small nonprofits. Uh, we have it on the books currently as a loan. Um, it would um, it would be a two year loan with 1% interest. Uh, there is a possibility that, that it may be eligible for forgiveness until the time that we know it was impossible for us to approve a budget. Um, and so what we decided to do was to approve a 112th budget for July and August, 2020. Uh, normally the collaborative does not meet over the summer, but we decided that we needed to be in August uh, so that we can make budget um, decisions based on whether or not that loan um, is forgiven and is converted into revenue or uh, it, it is a loan that we need to pay back. Um, but based on that, because of that loan, we did not have to lay anyone off, um, make any layoffs for July 1st. 85% um, of the collaborative's budget is supported by grants and contracts, uh, which makes it a little bit tricky um, during the pandemic. DESE has been very flexible as have um, our federal grants, um, but we did have a few, uh, we had one grant, uh, the United Way, who did have to stop their monthly con contributions uh, during uh, the months of April, May, and June. So it's been really tricky for the collaborative with uh, the budget and they've been doing an amazing job. Um, the second, the most, uh, the only other thing I really think you guys need to be in the loop on is um, Bill Deal, the executive director of the collaborative announced his retirement. Um, he will be retiring in December. And so we spent a lot of our last meeting discussing the search process. Um, and we have decided to do an internal, um, have an internal um, member lead the search. Um, we went through the entire process and the, it will begin this month. I have been appointed to the initial interview committee, um, which hopefully will meet at the end of August. Um, and then eventually candidates will be presented to the entire board of directors. Um, and so that's kind of a big decision for us. Um, I, it's, you know, there's 38 members now of the collaborative and Bill Deal's been an exceptional leader. Um, so uh, stay tuned on, on that decision because I think it really will have a big impact on Western Massachusetts. Um, that's my report. Thank you, Member Fallon. So with that item uh, finished, I think that's it for tonight's regular agenda. We have um, various items that we agreed would be moved up to the August meeting and um, our clerk will decide and send out a doodle poll or somehow arrange for us to have a, another meeting that um, I believe is going to be focused uh, more so on school reopening. So we do have executive session. I would ask that someone make a motion um, for us to move into executive session, and then I'll explain how we're going to do that. Can someone make a motion to? Um, I can make the motion. Thank um, you. So I'm getting it up. Sorry. Okay. Um, Item six. Yep. I request that we go into executive session to enter executive session under Massachusetts general law. Open meeting chapter 30A, section 21A3 to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body and the chair so declares. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Member Condon. Can we take a vote, please? Member Serafie Cox? Yes. Member Condon? Yes. Member Levy? Yes. Member Kaufman? Yes. Member Goldman? Yes. Member Voss? Yes. Member Gold? Yes. Member Busansky? Yes. And Member Fallon? Yes. Vote is nine yeses. Thank you. So at this point, our regular session will be ending.